hello everyone nice to be having this medicine one shot session so i'm going to try my best to do it in one shot otherwise i think it will go into two shots most likely i think 18th uh, we are going to have an off uh, there no class on 18th maybe 18th so good evening everybody and nice to see all of you here so i'm sure you all have your first love as medicine and that's why to special to you know to celebrate this valentines all of you are here and nice to see dr rajat also so yes medicine is a special gift <laughs> and um, i'm sure it will be your first love um, once you start understanding the concepts unfortunately in this one shot we we don't have time to discuss concepts but surely um, we should be able to cover good amount of medicine and uh, let's not waste time and let's start so as far as uh, endocrinology is concerned i'm going to start with endocrine <coughs> as far as uh, antidiuretic hormone this is the posterior pituitary we're starting with endocrine first so as far as posterior pituitary is concerned we should understand the concept of antidiuretic hormone so what is this concept of antidiuretic hormone let me just explain in a very simple way so that you you will be should you should be able to answer all questions just after understanding this basic concept when looking at a person who is drinking water and you're looking at the urine output okay this is the urine output in the urine output we look at two things one is the volume we look at the urine osmolality and the urine sodium okay urine osmolality urine sodium okay is the video unclear actually i can um, send it at a higher rate higher bit rate right okay Actu actually i can uh, send it at a higher bit rate but your internet should be able to support it so i was telling you ki when you looking at a patient who's got polydipsia and a person is drinking water person is passing urine looking at polydipsia and looking at polyuria we'll come to the polyuria point a little later but just to understand the basic concept that when looking at the serum sodium serum sodium is nothing but sodium to water ratio let's understand the concept of antidiuretic hormone as you understand the name antidiuretic hormone means it is going to retain water right antidiuretic hormone reabsorbs water that's a primary action of antidiuretic hormone diuretic opposite of that is antidiuretic hormone so what happens over here is ki when you are looking at a patient who's got very high antidiuretic hormone it will retain the water first let's look at this condition we are looking at a scenario where antidiuretic hormone is high it will retain the water when it retains the water it the, the excess water that is there is definitely going to dilute the serum sodium so you can easily see water is retained back the serum sodium will decrease second thing you'll notice is the volume of urine will come down and this is interesting that when questions are coming in the exam and the question is talking about polyuria and some students are answering sidh when you are looking at a question of polyuria now that is that just means that you are answering questions on spinal level you are not thinking at all okay in medicine questions you cannot answer without thinking you just think for a sec and it becomes very easy when you say sidh antidiuretic hormone will retain water that water when it retains the volume will come down in the urine you can't have polyuria when you are looking at a sidh case if you reabsorb water naturally urine osmolality will increase and the urine sodium will increase okay because urine sodium is nothing but urine sodium to water ratio so obviously when you reabsorb the water the urine sodium concentration has to increase so these are the things that you see when you are looking at a case of sidh so sidh to repeat once again what happens retained water serum sodium got diluted what happens to volume of urine decreases what happens to urine osmolality will increase you reabsorb the water naturally it will concentrate the urine sodium so urine sodium concentration should increase so if they give you the lab values this basic idea if you understand then sidh questions will be very easy to follow let's look at the other extreme when looking at a antidiuretic hormone is decreased antidiuretic hormone decreased let's finish off once and for all antidiuretic hormones so antidiuretic hormone is decreased we're talking about diabetes insipidus in a patient with diabetes insipidus the patient is going on losing water he is unable to concentrate definitely the volume of urine will increase that results in polyuria the urine will get diluted and the urine sodium will get diluted 
okay there is polyuria and there is dilute urine this is urine sodium is going to get diluted and urine osmolality is going to be decreased at this point you just have one important number in your mind and that is the urine sodium and that urine sodium although it's highly variable depending on how much water we take and it roughly varies between 20 to 40 milli equivalent in a normal person who's adequately hydrated okay so obviously anybody drinks too much water the urine osmolality the urine uh, sodium can be diluted if you if i also keep drinking too much water my urine sodium can be diluted but you just remember this number that in a normally hydrated person 20 to 40 milli equivalent per liter that's a normal urine sodium this number they'll use they'll give in the table then i'll show you how how it becomes very important so when you have a patient who is losing water, obviously he'll compensate by drinking water. That's the patient who's got polydipsia. Now, whenever you see a scenario of polydipsia and diabetes insipidus, just one simple idea you should understand that when a person is drinking excessive water, this is primary polydipsia, drinking too much water, this too much water intake will expand the volume first. It will spill out and the urine findings will be almost similar. He is going to dilute his urine. The polyuria is going to be there. But one major difference is he is also increasing water content in the system. So you are going to see the serum sodium will get diluted. Right? This serum sodium concentration will be decreased. So if the problem is primarily patient is drinking too much water, definitely one of the clues you will get is serum sodium will be low. But if the patient is not having primary polydipsia and the patient is not able to concentrate his urine, this is diabetes insipidus, let us say, then in diabetes insipidus, no reabsorption water is occurring. Water from the body just lost in the urine, or most of the water is lost. How much of he drinks obviously in the night particularly when he sleeps you do realize key most of the times the drinking is not able to catch up to amount of water loss the serum sodium concentration is not increasing so one basic difference between primary polydipsia and diabetes insipidus is serum sodium in primary polydipsia serum sodium will be low diabetes insipidus serum sodium tend to be high keep these things in mind we we'll look at some of the concepts then we'll come back to this if you have any doubt okay we'll come back to that concept once again when you have a doubt so let's look at this Antidiuretic hormone is increased. We're talking about SIDH. So in a patient with SIDH, antidiuretic hormone acting on the V2 receptors. This is going to open the aquaporin 2 channels. It causes water retention. This water retention is going to expand the plasma volume. So as I told you, when you retain water, you expand the plasma volume, you dilute the serum sodium. On top of that, volume compensation happens in the body. It causes release of natriuretic peptide. Stretching of the atria causes natriuretic peptide. And natriuretic peptide loses sodium and water. Natriuretic peptide, as the name is suggesting, will cause natriuresis. Effectively, you will see this patient ending up with eulemia. So to summarize then, what are the questions they ask in an exam? Okay, what are the questions they ask in SIDH? Most important point to understand is there is hyponatremia, which is very easy. You retain the water, you diluted the sodium, and also natriuretic peptide is leaking sodium in the urine. There is hyponatremia. There is eulemia. And the eulemic hyponatremia, when they give you, think about SIDH is one of the top causes. But the most repeated questions, you know, you see so many your papers. I think this has been a long time that I've been teaching, you know. So one of the repeat questions you'll see in the exam is, okay, all are true about SIDH and you just have to scan through the choices and search for this choice because that's what they usually give in the exam and they'll give you urine sodium less than 20, that will be the answer, which is not correct. As I told you, antidiuretic hormone, it will reabsorb the water back. When it reabsorbs the water back, what does it do to the urine volume? Decreases. What happens to urine osmolality and urine sodium? It will increase. Okay, if it reabsorbs the water back, naturally the volume of the the volume of the urine will decrease, antidiuretic hormone is high, urine osmolality will increase and urine sodium will increase. So even if the person drinks water in an SIADH case, he cannot dilute his sodium because the water is getting reabsorbed back in the body. So this is the reason why you, one of the things you will understand, this is repeatedly asked in the exam, can a person dilute his urine sodium by drinking water also? It's difficult because antidiuretic hormone will retain the water back. So I hope you understand then that of all the things that they ask in an exam in SIDH, this is the most repeated concept that they test in our exam, that the urine sodium will be more than 20 milliequivalent per liter. Now I need to tell you one very important thing. See, the whole purpose of having these kind of classes is, ki most of you might be knowing the medicine, uh, most, of my, most of you might be aware of the concepts also. My purpose here today is to tell you what are they asking, okay, based on my 20-23 years experience. Just want to tell you what are they really asking, because there's no end to how much you can read. But if you just know what they are focusing on, I think it's like laser guided, you know, um, thing. Ki that's what you just need to know. At least don't forget that. Okay, obviously there's no end. They can ask anything. But the most important thing I'm going to point out for you. And if you can just focus on that, I think that sh that should be able to help uh, help you in many of the, you know, questions. As I told you already, urinosmolality will be concentrated. <coughs> These patients will have hypouricemia. 
okay and one of the things that we do is we give water loading test when you drink water you give water 5% dextrose normal person adh should get suppressed doesn't get suppressed confirming that this is inappropriate secretion not appropriate okay adh remains high the treatment one of the things that you should understand is they'll ask you about what is the first step in the management of sid the answer is fluid restriction if particularly the sodium is not very low and the patient is asymptomatic or mild symptoms are there then your answer should better be fluid restriction if the patient is significantly symptomatic or sodium is going quite low meaning the normal sodium is 135 to 145 to 1 uh, 135 to 145 sorry so if the sodium is low let's say it's going below 130 then definitely you have to go for correction of sodium v2 receptor blockers are also another thing that you can do these are waptans and most importantly you need to find the underlying cause and correct it sidh can be infection can be tumors it can be trauma there are many causes of sidh and there's it's pointless to go on memorizing the big list of uh, you know things but the main concepts that if you remember that that should be able to help you in the exam so to summarize then these are the things that the last year as far as sidh is concerned let's finish our polyuria and i'll show you a question then you'll see how you are able to answer when looking at a patient with polyuria this is a patient who is passing more than 3 liters of urine output per day or more than 40 ml per kg per day urine output okay more than 40 ml per kg per day or more than 3 liters per day this has been asked in the past so you should remember these numbers when a patient is passing too much urine there are two reasons why he is passing too much urine especially if the urine osmolality is dilute he is either forcibly drinking too much water or he's got diabetes insipidus in both the conditions the urine will be dilute and it will be excess means there will be polyuria one scenario is forcibly drinking too much water typically in our exams one clue they'll give you is this is a schizophrenic patient or this is a patient who has got some psychiatric problem or this patient is going on drinking too much beer this beer potamenemia we talk about so in this condition when the patient drinks too much water as i told you he is going to dilute his serum sodium and the serum sodium will start coming low it will start going below 135 although we say 135 i am telling you in questions one trick is the exact midpoint 140 if it goes below 140 it's going to suggest more to you that this is primary polydipsia even if it's normal if it's going below 140 it's most likely pointing towards primary polydipsia now 135 to 145 is the normal sodium if it goes above the midpoint that is above 140 chances are the answer will go towards diabetes insipidus so keep that thing in mind if the serum sodium is normal then you have to go for water deprivation test don't do water deprivation test in a person whose uh, serum sodium is already abnormal but if the serum sodium is normal then we do water deprivation test in the water deprivation test if the urine osmolality increases by 50% every hour then you're looking at a patient who's got primary polydipsia when you take away the water bottles and the urine osmolality fails to increase appropriately 50% then you're looking at a patient who's got diabetes insipidus If it's a primary polydipsia, you're looking at a psychiatric cause most likely, and the patient should be referred to psychiatry. But if it's a patient who's got diabetes insipidus, you still have a job to do. You have to find out whether it's central or nephrogenic, and the way we dis differentiate between them is we do desmopressin test. If you do the desmopressin, if you give desmopressin and the urine is getting concentrated, going above three hundred, three hundred is the cutoff that we talk about. If by giving desmopressin urine osmolality is increasing by three hundred, why three hundred? I'm telling you is because serum osmolality is three hundred. If it goes above three hundred, that means your answer is central. If you give desmopressin and it's not able to concentrate urine by you know more than three hundred, that means you're looking at a nephrogenic and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The treatment is thiazide. So to repeat once again, when you have a patient who has got water loss two clues one the serum sodium will be high if the serum sodium is already high above 140 or above 145 you're looking at diabetes insipidus one possibility second thing is if the serum sodium is normal you do water deprivation test after you do water deprivation test sometimes in a big table they'll give you they'll give you urine osmolality it does not increase by 50% per hour number one number two the serum sodium will continue to rise because if you take the water away the patient continues to lose water in the urine the serum sodium starts going above 145 this is also a major clue for you to stop the test because this patient has got diabetes insipidus okay water went away he is not you are not allowing him to drink water you done water deprivation test his serum sodium will start concentrating if it is central and nephrogenic give desmopressin and see if it concentrates the urine above 300 it's central if it does not then it is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so this is a very simple way how you approach these kind of questions now one of the techniques that we look at is when you seeing a question of polyuria sometimes they have given this urine osmolar excretion rate now if they if they don't give you urine volume this is urine output if the urine output is not given then you just see is it more than 300 or less than 300 okay they just giving you urine osmolality is it more than 300 less than 300 but if they give you volume and they are giving you urine osmolality then 24 hour urine you calculate the urine osmolality or you check the urine osmolality 
multiplied by 0 output if it's more than 1000 he's got osmotic diuresis remember if they're not giving you volume of urine then just see if it's more than 300 milli osmoles urine osmolality it's osmotic diuretic osmotic diuresis means the glucose that is going is pulling water along with it and the urine will be highly osmotic so glucose mannitol if you're giving saline in the to the patient iv saline naturally sodium will be thrown out in the urine but if the patient's urine osmolality is less than 1000 milli osmoles per day or it is less than 300 at any one time then that is going more likely to a water diuresis now water diuresis again as i told you earlier if the serum sodium is going above 140 he's losing water he's concentrating his sodium is diabetes insipidus this midpoint for us 140 less than 140 is going towards primary polydipsia now i have seen only once they have asked about osmolar excretion rate most of the time they just um, you know give you 300 so if they give you 300, that's urine osmolality. Why 300? I told you because we're comparing it to the plasma. Okay, if the urine is more constant than plasma or more diluted than plasma, gives us an idea about is the patient having osmotic diuresis or water diuresis. Okay, primary polydipsia will hypo or hyponatremia, he'll have hyponatremia. Obviously, if somebody is drinking water, they'll dilute the urine sodium. They'll dilute the serum sodium as well as the urine sodium. That means the patient is going to have hyponatremia. Now, we've discussed a lot. Let's see whether you're able to apply this in answer. Okay, see if you can answer this question. First, read the question. I'll show you the choices. Okay, great to see my all-time favorite Dr. Ashwini also here. So, um, please see if you can answer this. So, basically, this is a patient who's got serum sodium low. They've given you a patient who's got schizophrenia. He's on respiridone. He's got some seizure history. The serum osmolality is 252. Remember, 285 is the normal serum osmolality. Means the serum is dilute. Urine sodium is... 20 it's dilute as i told you 20 to 40 is the rough range 20 is going towards the lower limit urine osmolality is quite low compared to the serum also it's very low so look at the question here which of the following yeah which of the following is the best treatment for this patient three percent saline so they are not just asking you what's your diagnosis you must have understood what the diagnosis is what is the treatment is the question so absolutely most of you have got it correct. It is primary polydipsia. There's no denying that. But what is the treatment? Just don't see hyponatremia and start, you know, 3% saline. The answer is simply fluid restriction. You cut away the problem. He's drinking too much water. Stop the water intake. All these problems, all his sodium will get corrected. So absolutely right. Your, your answer is correct. It is it is water fluid restriction. Okay, that's correct answer. It is fluid restriction. Okay, next if you look at uh, anterior pituitary problem, if you're looking at prolactinoma, now prolactinoma is the most common functional adenoma. So you should understand that the majority of adenomas in the pituitary are non-functional. The most common functional adenoma in the anterior pituitary is prolactinoma. Okay, most of them are non-functional adenomas. They are incidentally seen in the patient, but the most common functional adenoma they ask you to answer is prolactinoma. The normal prolactin is less than 30. I would not recommend you to try to memorize all the you know hormone levels, although you should remember the TSH value and some important ones as I go along, I'll tell you. But the prolactin levels normally are less than 30. Now, you should understand that there are many things that can cause the same prolactin to go above 30. Top in this is pregnancy, hypothyroidism and dopamine blockers. Because prolactin is under inhibitory control, any dopamine blocker, metaclopramide, antipsychotics, okay, so antipsychotics are dopamine blockers. Naturally, the prolactin levels will be high. When they give you a question of a patient, particularly if it's a female coming with amenorrhea and all that, with high prolactin, they'll ask you what's the next step. In the next step, the most important and most repeated question I can tell you in so many years I've seen is basically the beta HCG. Now, the next step should be rule out pregnancy. Okay, whatever symptom they give you, they'll give you fatigue. The patient has got some galactoria. The patient has got amenorrhea. Whatever they're giving, you know, female, if the question is coming with hyperlactin, make sure you answer beta HCG in the answer. In one exam, I remember in, in I think it was um, the AIMS exam. Those days, it was not called INICT. In that, what I had done, that the patient had come with amenorrhea. Patient had come with fatigue. The prolactin level was high and somebody had done a CT and the CT showed an adenoma in the pituitary. And they asked, what's the next step? Now, obviously, the mistake has been done by somebody because they have done CT in a pregnant person, but better to avoid using, you know, radiation exposure, but they've already done a CT and they asked, what's the next step? In that also, again, the answer was to rule out pregnancy, beta HCG in the urine. Now, some students after the exam argued that if the MCQ is saying CT has been done to the patient, somebody who would have done CT would have ruled out pregnancy. Now, you can't assume like that. This is what we see in practice is how they'll ask in the exam also. Okay, some idiot got a CT done. We should not continue on the same road now. Rule out pregnancy first. 
Then next is hypothyroidism. Obviously, drug history also becomes very important. So one of the most repeated questions on prolactinoma is when they give you hyperlactin, next step, pregnancy, rule out pregnancy. I'm repeating it again so that it, it's, it registers in your mind. Okay, that's one of the most repeated questions. So the triad of prolactin we talk about is amenorrhea, galactorrhea, and infertility of female. In a male, it will be erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction uh, um, and galactorrhea is quite rare in males simply because the male breast uh, does not contain glands. So typically, they come with sexual dysfunction in males. But females, you have this triad of amenorrhea, galactorrhea, and infertility. Now, what they ask in our exam is, Ki, what do you do for the treatment? The drug of choice generally is cabergolin. Even if it's a microadenoma or a macroadenoma, the treatment of choice, remember, always starts with cabergolin. Be careful in young females. We don't want to give cabergolin. It is teratogenic. Young females who are not on contraceptives, then you have to give bromocriptin because cabergolin is teratogenic. That's one problem with cabergolin. It is teratogenic. Drugs will cause value below 40, uh, below 100, yes, that's one thing that generally you will see the levels around 80, 90. Possibility you should consider is drugs. If it's going above 100, possibility of adenoma becomes more. But I'm telling you one important idea over here that in one exam they said that the patient has got an adenoma of around 2.5 centimeter in size and they give the prolactin of 80. Now, if you see a patient who's got an adenoma size, MRI is showing MRI in a pituitary adenoma, the size was 2.5 centimeter, means it's a macroadenoma right it's a quite a, quite a large tumor but the prolactin level they had given was 80 so they had asked uh, what's the diagnosis and some students fell for the trap and answered prolactinoma the rough guide i'm telling you here that we follow is that if you find that one centimeter uh, adenoma is there the prolactin level should roughly be more than 100 if it's a 2 centimeter, it should be more than 200. If it's 2.5 centimeter, it should be more than 250. That's a basic rule that we follow. Now, it is possible that you can have a, say, 0.8 centimeter or a microadenoma and the level of prolactin is 250, 200 possible. I'm not saying the lower limit. You can, I hope you understand. Let's say you have 1 centimeter and the patient has got a prolactin of 150. Is it possible? Very much. My point is, it can't be less than 100. If it's a 1 centimeter adenoma, prolactin should be above 100. 2 centimeter adenoma, 200. 2.5, roughly, we say 250. 3 centimeter adenoma should be more than 300. So roughly, that's how a prolactinoma will be. But the fact that they've given 80 prolactin level in a 2.5 centimeter adenoma is going against the prolactinoma. It was a non-functioning adenoma. And what this non-functioning adenoma was doing was, it was blocking the inhibitory pathway. So if you've got an adenoma, large adenoma, blocking the inhibitory pathway, it'll release the prolactin. And the prolactins will spike up. Okay, so large adenoma blocking the stock of the pituitary, inhibitory control of dopamine from above is gone. That's why the prolactin was increasing. Ultimately, the answer in that question was a non-functioning adenoma because there's a mismatch between the MRI size and the prolactin level. Okay, so we, we don't see so much complicated questions at your post-MBBS level. That's why I don't generally discuss these things in the class. But the rough idea is each centimeter adenoma prolactin levels are 100. 2 centimeter, 200, rough, roughly match the size. If they're giving you size, then the size and the prolactin levels have a correlation for us. So if you have a patient with macroadenoma, then that, that patient typically will be having visual symptoms. Either they tell you the patient is going to have, see, once the tumor starts expanding from below, it will compress the chiasma from below. So when it hits the chiasma from below, it will cause superior quadrantinopia. Okay, bitemporal superior quadrantinopia will occur because the lower retina sees upper part. So you see bitemporal superior quadrantinopia. Or if it becomes more bigger, the tumor will cause bitemporal hemianopia. So hemianopia or superior quadrantinopia is what you see in a patient in a tumor that is going from below. And in such cases also, what Harrison is saying, start cabergoline Wait for a few months, although improvement can happen within weeks, but wait for four months is what the Harrison uh, algorithm is giving. If the patient is responding, the tumor is shrinking, prolactin levels are coming down, just continue drug. Even if it's a macrodenoma, cabergolin is enough. But if the visual symptoms are not persisting and the prolactin levels are not coming down, then that is a candidate for surgery. And the surgery that we try to do in these patients is a transphenoidal resection. So in general idea, that means prolactinoma, the drug that you want to go for is cabergoline. Unless it's a young female and you're worried about a potential teratogenic effect, then the answer is going to be bromocriptine. Micro or macroadenoma, make sure you're answering drugs first for prolactinoma. When looking at acromegaly, the word acro means ends become large. Ends will become large means the hands, the skull, the feet become large. So they'll give you some clues about the hands becoming large or the feet becoming large or the skull becoming large. And one of the clues particularly they'll mention in the exam is the squaring of mandible. Okay, it's a very classical finding you see in patients with acromegaly. Okay, skull becomes large and you do see the jaw changing shape and particularly you'll see, you do see prognathism also 
but you will see the squaring of mandible nicely mentioned now although it's the um, you know acromegaly acro means ends become large but also you will see viscera many organs become large particularly macroglossia is something they'll tell you uh, the consequences of the hands become large they'll tell you carpal tunnel syndrome um, the heel pad thickness will be given high sometimes in the question they do have soft tissue proliferation and that can result in laryngeal muscles pharyngeal muscle changes resulting in a deep vo voice hypertension can occur diabetes can occur cardiomegaly and all these increase the risk of cardiac death in patients with acromegaly that's the main problem the most common cause of death is ischemic heart disease arthralgia arthritis can occur there is increased risk of polyps and particularly colon carcinoma risk is high and you'll see these patients can have spinal problems and when you shake hands with them because of the large bulky hands you get this uh, soft tissue proliferation that is there that results in this dovey feel so it's called moist dovey handshake so these are some of the things and i don't think you'll have so many problems in making the diagnosis of acromegaly based on the clinical picture the trap in the question is not about the diagnosis the trap is what is the initial screening test that you do be careful never answer growth hormone level the answer is igf1 Okay, make sure you don't answer growth hormone. That's a trap. The initial investigation always IGF-1. Now, once the IGF-1 levels are high, then you go for the confirmatory test. IGF-1 normal rule out acromegaly. It's out. But once the IGF-1 levels are high, the confirmatory test is done, and you give glucose and see and is the growth hormone getting suppressed below 0.4 microgram per deciliter or not. That's the that's the way how we confirm. Now you don't have to remember the values that I'm telling you here, but just know the name of the test. That is, you give 75 gram glucose and see is the growth hormone getting suppressed or not. Don't forget, growth hormone and glucose are in feedback to each other. If you give glucose in a normal person, you expect growth hormone to should get suppressed. If you're giving glucose and growth hormone fails to get suppressed, that confirms the patient has got acromegaly. So to repeat once again, you will not have a problem in diagnosing the clinical picture. Your trap will be what should you do for diagnosis? Do not answer growth hormone. It's highly fluctuating. And somebody is fasting, the growth hormone will be very high. In a normal person also, it has no value. Look at IGF-1 as the initial test. IGF-1 normal, rule out acromegaly. IGF-1 increase, go for OGST or OGTT test. That's how you confirm. Once you confirm, your primary thing is surgery um, and compared to a prolactinoma surgery does quite well over here and if you can do a resection then resection is the best thing and actually MRI will tell you whether it's resectable or not if it's resectable in order to get better clear margins and do not want the recurrence of the tumor you try to shrink the tumor adequately and then go for a transferal resection so this is the best treatment actually if you can do it but if you cannot it's non-resectable then radiotherapy other focused uh, you know te uh, techniques are there that you can debulk the tumor but what they are asking in the exam is about the drugs. You can shrink the tumor by using octreotide, but growth hormone receptor blockers was asked last NEET and this is Pegvisomant. Okay, so Pegvisomant, I think last year NEET only they have asked. Chances sometimes, you know, these questions repeat. So you should know Pegvisomant is growth hormone receptor blocker. Anti-estrogenic drugs have partial growth hormone receptor blocking activity. They also can be considered. Okay, sometimes in any pituitary adenoma, we always give a trial of cabergoline because... Um, you know, we have seen sometimes cabergoline does shrink the tumor to some extent, even if it's a, not a prolactinoma. So cabergoline is always given a trial. But if they ask you growth hormone receptor blocker, remember pegvisomant is important. So next important uh, problem is Cushing syndrome. The most common cause of Cushing syndrome is iatrogenic but after that the most common after iatrogenic is actually pituitary adenoma when pituitary adenoma causing Cushing's is called Cushing's disease okay pituitary adenoma causing release of uh, ACTH causing Cushing's that is Cushing's disease so PDF already posted in the DBMCI premier group uh, I think it will be shared in other areas also later I think you can just go to DBMCI premier group and get the PDF of this Which one drug to choose if both in option? See, if the MCQ is talking about a problem of the large tumor, compressing surrounding structures, go for drug that will shrink the tumor. If they're not mentioning that, and generally if it's a microadenoma particularly, or if the patient is refusing surgery, then generally best answer is pegvisomant. Okay, if, if at all I have, I have a choice, generally I would have been tilted more towards pegvisomant, but if there is compression of surrounding structures, my first priority is shrink the tumor, and that's why octotide becomes important there. So coming back to Cushing syndrome, Cushing syndrome, um, see obesity is something that you will see a um, lot in in practice that doesn't mean every obese person is Cushing and you do need to work up. There are some clues that will be there. One is you will see that these patients will have drunkal obesity and thin extremities. It is one of the ways how you differentiate obesity of hypothyroid with say Cushing's. Okay, this thin extremities is the major clue. Then you're seeing this peculiar things, buffalo hump, 
supra clavicular supra scapular fat abdominal skin stray major clue for us but remember normal people also can have abdominal skin stray they should be wide they should be more than 1 cm in width then only it counts hypertension menstrual abnormalities can occur particularly amenorrhea is a clue sometimes in mcq because if they say amenorrhea with obesity think more about hypothyroidism if you see amenorrhea with the obesity possibility more about a patient with cushings okay amenorrhea cushings menorrhea i'm be careful not that cushings can't come with menorrhea it can more likely i'm telling you amenorrhea is more likely to go with cushings and menorrhea more likely to go with obesity plus menorrhea more likely to go towards hypothyroidism another broad idea if you want to tell if i have to tell you in the exam to differentiate between hypothyroid obesity and cushings is one major difference between the two is hypothyroid has got a much more faster gain in weight whereas cushings most important cause of cushings apart from atogenic it will use pituitary adenoma pituitary adenoma is too slow growing too slow symptoms onset are very slow so most patients with cushings the weight gain happens over a long period of time whereas in hypothyroid rapid gain of weight will occur so that's one major difference that you should focus on to tell clinically this is important although i don't think mcqs can come on this but clinically as you listen to the history somebody says they have got weight gain over 2 years 3 years possibility of cushings more than hypothyroid that's the general idea okay atogenic and exposure same atogenic is basically you're giving steroids because the patient has got you know um some kidney transplant or the patient has got some connective tissue disease you're giving the steroid that is what i have meant by atogenic is the most common cause for cushings okay after that is pituitary adenoma third after that is ectopic and fourth is adrenal tumors so anyway coming back to cushings again you'll not have a problem in recognizing cushings again the problem in cushings is okay again you can see here you do see the buffalo hump you can see the moon facies the easy bruisability abdominal skin stray but the skin stray as i told you they should be wide okay narrow skin stray don't count wide skin stray thin extremities patient can have proximal myopathy so these are some of the thing they'll give you as far as the clues are there to tell you the answer is cushings but once you have cushings what they ask in the exam is how do you work up the patient with cushings now what you should not do is don't answer serum cortisol later we'll see when we talking about work up of addison's disease serum cortisol is done in the initial work up but when you're looking at cushings don't answer serum cortisol because any kind of stress the cortisol levels will shoot up so what you should do then one of these three will be th there either is 24 hour urine cortisol or it's night midnight salivary cortisol remember cortisol has got a diurnal variation it's highest in the mornings 5 am 6 am highest lowest in the night around 12 uh, 12 midnight 1 1 am between that time is the lowest normally in the mid of the night saliva cortisol should be absent so we're just seeing is it present or not in the saliva in the in the mid of the night if it's present it's having a loss of diurnal variation a loss of diurnal variation is a clue for that that patient might be having cushings okay normally diurnal variation is high cortisol in the mornings and low in the midnight midnight cortisol if it's present in saliva should be absent if it's present it is a distinct possibility of cushings so you can do 24 hour urine cortisol you can do late night salivary cortisol but generally what is convenient for the patient to do is take 1 mg dexamethasone at 11 pm in the night and come next day morning and check atm cortisol convenience wise this is generally the preferred investigation low dose dexa where the patient takes a tablet of dexa at 11 pm in the night next time morning we check the atm cortisol if the cortisol is suppressed after taking dexa then that is going against cushings if the cortisol levels are high after doing dexa then that is cushings confirmed once cushing is confirmed look at the acth if it's high then either is pituitary adenoma or ectopic or if it's acth is low it's coming from the adrenal okay this becomes an adrenal problem adrenal pathology now if it's a pituitary adenoma it will produce acth ectopic tumor from the lung also produces acth remember ectopic lung tumor does not produce cortisol it produces acth so once you have got that the way to differentiate among them is high dose dexa suppression or uh, imaging or crh stimulation test but generally in our exam if they ask you the most important answer here is going to be the high dose dexa suppression test now there was one question that um, inict had asked once between high dose dexa suppression and mri and some some platforms and some people are giving mri as the answer but if you read williams endocrinology in detail they are putting forward the idea see when you're doing mri don't forget pituitary typically has non functioning adenomas so you'll never really be sure that's the reason why it's got lower significance most important for us is high dose dexa suppression okay the 6 hourly we give 2 mg dexa for 48 hours and see is the patient's cortisol getting suppressed or not so don't have to know the process of the test is done but you should know high dose dexa is more important than mri in the workup of these patients once you have the diagnosis fine if the diagnosis is still not done 
then you should go for bilateral inferior petrosal sinus sampling. You're now doing inferior petrosal sinus sampling and you're seeing is the patient's ACTH levels, is the patient's, uh, either you can do cortisol or ACTH. If you do the inferior petrosal sinus, basically what we're trying to do over here is we're looking at the ACTH concentration in the petrous sinus and we are doing the ACTH concentration in the peripheral vein, like a cubital vein, let's say, and we see the ratio. The petrous to peripheral ratio, if it's more than 2 is to 1, then that is suggesting that it's a pituitary problem. Less than 2 is to 1 goes to one ectopic problem. Now, I don't think they'll go into so much detail, but just general idea I'm telling you, first of all, is most questions are focusing in this area. Ki when you are suspecting a patient with Cushing's, what's your initial test? Don't fall for the trap. Do not answer serum cortisol. It's useless. You can do one of these tests. But generally, the preferred investigation is low-dose DEXA suppression. The most accurate, accuracy means sensitivity, specificity, both high. The answer is 24-hour urine cortisol. Both these are very good tests. The next workup is basically ACTH. Low ACTH adrenal problem, high ACTH either pituitary or ectopic. Differentiating among them, next investigation is high-dose DEXA suppression. If it's still not clear, then only go for inferior petrosal sinus sampling and you check the petrous to peripheral ACTH concentration ratio. If it's more than 2 is to 1, it's pituitary. If it's less than 2 is to 1, it is coming from ectopic ACTH. It's ectopic problem, lung tumor. So this is how the, the workup of Cushing's is. Most of the questions on Cushing's that I've seen till now are mainly on workup. There are some random here where question like, for example, Cushing's from the proximal myopathy, what happens to creatinine kinase level? They asked in one exam. The answer is it will be normal. Most endocrine causes, when you get myopathy, CK levels are normal. Exception is hypothyroid. Okay, except for hypothyroid, most patients with Cushing's, the proximal myopathy, you'll see CK levels are normal. Okay, in, in endocrine problems. So when, when you come to thyroid, uh, much of the questions in thyroid are about the evaluation of the thyroid function test. But thyroid function test, I don't think you should have a problem because the major focus that we do is based on the TSH. Okay, always we start looking at the TSH. So when you look at the TSH, if the TSH is there, either you're looking at the TSH is increased or the TSH is normal or the TSH is decreased. And you're supposed to know the normal TSH level, it is between 0.5 to 5 international units. Okay, you're supposed to know the normal TSH level, it is 0.5 to 5 international units. Now the TSH can be given high, normal or low. Now if the TSH levels are high, so if I just put the diagram and show you, this is the pituitary and this is the thyroid. Okay, this is the T4 that we're looking at and this is the feedback. Now if you find that the TSH levels are the TSH levels are high and the T4 levels are low. Now it's very easy whenever they go in the opposite direction, you know the lesion has to be in between. So it's very easy for us to tell that the lesion must be in the thyroid. A TSH is working hard, but thyroid is unable to secrete the thyroxine. Clearly it puts the lesion in the thyroid. So one of the questions they'll ask you is, where do you put the lesion? Is the lesion in the thyroid, in the pituitary or in the hypothalamus? Clearly thyroid means you're talking about primary hypothyroidism. If you see the lesion in the pituitary, it's called secondary hypothyroidism. If the lesion is in the hypothalamus, it's a tertiary hypothyroidism. Now this is easy part and I don't think that any of you will have a problem in telling where the lesion is if it's so obvious. Now where the trap will be and I'll tell you this very important concept. And the trap is the body doesn't care about TSH. It, it can move the TSH whatever. It main goal is it wants to maintain thyroxine in the normal range. When the thyroxine is coming down, you better expect the appropriate response by the pituitary and the TSH must be increased, right? This is the basic idea. Whenever thyroxine is low, you have to get a high TSH. Now, one of the repeat questions in our exam is they'll tell you TSH is normal. Okay, thyroxine is low, but the TSH is inappropriate. It's not increasing. Once you say the T4 is low and the TSH is not increasing, many students, you know, they have seen, they see TSH normal and they say, okay, pituitary is normal. The lesion must be in the thyroid. Then they say this primary hypothyroidism. That's where they fall for the trap. So be careful, whenever the thyroxine is low, the normal response of the pituitary should be TSH should have increased. Failure to increase TSH tells the lesion must be in the pituitary. This tells us patient has got secondary hypothyroidism. And this is not just for thyroid. The same thing you'll see, the MCQ is telling you that the patient's testosterone levels are low. And the LH levels are normal. And they'll ask you if the LH is normal and the testosterone is low, then is it a fault of the pituitary or is it a problem of the gonad? 
Is it primary hypogonadism or secondary hypogonadism? The correct answer is obviously, as I told you, the body doesn't care about the LH or the TSH. It can shift them whatever. Its primary goal is to maintain the final hormones in the normal range. If they are low, appropriate pituitary response B, LH should have increased. If it fails to increase, the pathology is not in the testes. You should start looking in the pituitary. This is a secondary hypogonadism. This pituitary problem. So this concept is something that I've seen repeatedly tested in the exam. So you should know that when you see normal TSH, don't fall for the trap. Okay, TSH normal, pituitary is fine. Don't say that. This is not appropriate pituitary response. So that's one area that I've seen commonly tested in the exam. Rest, if you look at thyroiditis, remember the three major thyroiditis they give in our exams are, and you should know now that iodine deficiency as a cause of hypothyroidism is gone in India. In India now, the most common cause of hypothyroidism is thyroiditis. It is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So when looking at Hashimoto's thyroiditis, this is now become the most common cause because we have iodized salt everywhere. It is an autoimmune condition and the antibody you will see in this patient Okay, the antibody that you see in this patient is the anti-TPO antibody. Now you can see antithyroglobulin antibodies, but the main antibody is anti-thyroperoxidase antibody. Sometimes in MCQ, they'll give you clues by telling patient has other autoimmune disease. He might have Addison's disease or vitiligo. So other autoimmune disease is major clue for us that this also must be an autoimmune cause for hypothyroidism. When you say subacute thyroiditis, that's a viral problem. So you will see generally viral prodrome given. He's got upper respiratory tract infection, fever, sore throat. But the most important thing is the patient will come with severe pain in the thyroid. So if you see severe pain and tenderness in thyroid, that's a major clue for us that there's subacute thyroiditis. Of all these three, one of the best prognosis is subacute. It lasts for a few weeks and the patient becomes normal and you don't have to do anything most of the time in the treatment. But patients don't come because of the thyroid problem, or, you know, hyper or hypothyroid. They, they mainly come for the pain, okay? They don't come for thyrotoxicosis or hypothyroid, they come for the pain. And all you need to do in most of these patients, just give NSAIDs. It's generally good prognosis, and in just a matter of few weeks, they're going to recover, and everything will be normal. Now, most of the patients, we don't give steroids, we don't give, um, you know, all these things. These steroids, beta blockers, propyl thyrosyl is only if the patient has got uh, ischemic background, and the patient needs to, we need to protect the heart, then we consider giving beta blocker propyl thyrosyl. Generally, these are not the thing. All they'll ask you in the exam is, in a patient who's got subacute thyroiditis, what do you do? The answer is simply just give NSAIDs for the pain, and it'll go away. Okay, there's a very transient problem, the patient is going to recover. Remember that all thyroiditis, all thyroiditis, radioactive iodine uptake will be low with one exception, and that exception is Hashimoto's. Okay, Hashimoto's, the radioactive iodine uptake is variable, can be normal, can be low, can be high, depends on the TSH. So, remember, apart from Hashimoto's thyroiditis, all thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis is classically they keep asking in the exam. Patient came with pain in the neck, the patient has got some tremors, patient has fever and sore throat history in the past. Radioactive iodine uptake was less than 1%. So, okay, radioactive iodine uptake should be around 33% as normal. If it's very, very low iodine uptake, possibility of thyroiditis should be considered. So, remember this basic idea again. All thyroiditis, iodine uptake is low because thyroid is inflamed. Inflamed thyroid can't pump iodine inside. So, inflamed thyroid, you naturally expect the cells are not working, pumps are not working, iodine uptake should be low. What's the only exception? Exception here, the cells are not initially affected. The enzyme deep inside is affected because this is antibody against thyroperoxidase, not against the cell. And that's the reason why you might see sometimes iodine uptake might come normal in Hashimoto or it can be uh, increased or decreased depends on the TSH. But subacute thyroiditis, iodine uptake will be low. Okay, that's been asked in the exam. So what do you need to do in this patient? Nothing. If the patient does not have pain also, nothing. If they have pain, just give NSAIDs. They're going to be all right in just a matter of few weeks. Now, unlike that, riddle thyroiditis generally is fibrosing. It's destroying the thyroid. This is a fibrosing condition and the patient can have fibroblasts will contract after some time. It will compress the thyroid. So they do come with stridor, dysphagia. Those are clues. And in these patients, they do have sometimes fibrosis outside the thyroid, like in the palms, which is called the Pitrens contracture, retroperitoneal fibrosis, which is called Ormond's disease, penile fibrosis, called Peyronie's disease. So they can have fibrosis diffusely in the body. And in such patients, generally, the, the you know, thyroid disease becomes a minor issue and the diffuse fibrosis other places becomes a major problem. So one of the things we do in these patients because of the hypothyroidism, we just give thyroxine. But uh, we do see ki estrogen seems to be playing some role in the fibrosis. So we try to block that by using tamoxifen and other anti-estrogen drugs have also been tried. So these are some of the things that they'll ask you over about for about riddle thyroiditis. So again, to repeat, riddle thyroiditis is fibrosing thyroid comes with fibrosis other places. 
एम सी क्यू दे आस्ट पेशेंट हैज डुपिट्रेंस कॉन्ट्रैक्चर फ्लिक्स फ्लैक्शन डिफॉर्मिटी ऑफ लिटिल फिंगर एंड रिंग फिंगर हीज ऑल्सो गॉट हाइपोथेराइड वॉट आर यू सस्पेक्टिंग दिस पेशेंट हैज क्लियरली गॉट इडल्स रेडेटिव बिकॉज ऑफ पामार पामार फाइब्रोसिस प्लस हाइपोथेराइड कॉम्बो दैट पैटर्न रिकडिशन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आंसर इज रिडल बट इफ दे टेल यू पेशेंट हैज गॉट विटिली गो and hypothyroidism naturally you're thinking about hashimoto so you do need to recognize the patterns in medicine based on which you'll get a clue ki this is where they are going towards so moving to mixed hematoma i think mixed hematoma was asked recently in one of the exams so it's a extreme form of hypothyroidism typically it's an elderly person in the question as you know thyroid disease generally occurs in females so usually it's an elderly female who will come with uh, hypothermia and they may have a stress and stress needs steroids and thyroxin um any stressful response needs steroids and thyroxin so in a stressful state if there is lack you know lack of thyroxin then the patient will manifest so manifestations are mainly mental mental abnormalities the patient will have delirium lethargy they may tell you the patient may have had menorrhagia or they may tell you patient was a known case of hypothyroid stop taking thyroxin anyway the major clue for us are the patient might be in lethargy may go to coma all the way hypothermia is the major clue for us heart rate is low hypotension hypoxia these things also can occur now what the investigation will show the tsh levels are high i remember one student asked me sir there is something called cqt thyroid syndrome where we don't really bother about the thyroxin levels um in a sick patient how do you look at the thyroxin here and remember in sick you thyroid syndrome tsh never goes up high tsh always relevant for us normal tsh low tsh could be in a sick patient sick thyroid syndrome but high tsh always abnormal remember that so high tsh always indicating that the patient has got primary hypothyroidism is a possibility so the treatment includes thyroxin but most importantly steroids are also given now everybody understands about thyroxin it's a hypothyroid extreme state mixed hematoma you're going to give thyroxin but make sure you giving steroids and i'll tell you the reason why you giving steroids one of the dictums in medicine is ki whatever is dangerous things that will be there should be treated before for example when you have addison's disease and hypothyroidism this these two conditions can occur together and i told you why because hashimoto is quite a common problem it is accompanied by other autoimmune diseases so hashimoto's addison's combination is pretty common in practice when somebody comes in the emergency and in the middle of the night you're seeing a patient you're recognizing possibility of mixed hematoma you don't have time to work up and see is it patient having also having addison's or not you really don't have time to work up and the rule is you never give thyroxin unless steroids have been given already okay you give steroids then you give thyroxin that's the rule when they have, when you have both the you know disease together so that's the reason why we always give steroids and we give thyroxin now i have seen some student ask me sir isn't steroid going to block the conversion of t4 to t3 that's one of the questions and here i want to tell you we don't just give t4 we also give t3 okay don't worry about steroid blocking conversion of t4 to t3 not only t4 is given t3 is also given this is one of the few places where t3 is used in the treatment and yes if the patient has some ischemic heart disease risk or a very elderly person you have to be cautious about using t3 because t3 can activate the beta receptors and precipitate an arrhythmia that possibility is there but in most patients if they ask you this is one of the few places that you give t3 in the treatment okay as a dictum as a rule other than mixed hematoma take a note you will never answer t3 in the treatment treatment is always t4 okay t3 is only in our mcqs at all level mcqs at least it is in mixed hematoma now you can use loading dose and then you can use iv whenever you giving iv make sure you are giving 75% of the oral dose when looking at thyrotoxicosis thyrotoxicosis is patient having graves disease or toxic adenoma these two this is a nodular goiter that is throwing out high thyroxin so either graves or toxic adenoma or sometimes it can be even multi nodular goiter that is throwing out high thyroxin now the basic difference is this is an autonomous nodule whereas this is an autoimmune problem where you seeing antibodies behaving like tsh so the core culprit here is an antibody that looks like tsh is called tsh receptor antibody it's acting on the tsh receptor it's stimulating the thyroid to make it into a goiter and it's causing the iodine pumps to hyperfunction making more thyroxin so unlike a normal tsh the tsh receptor antibodies act such a long the the attachment to the receptor and its action is so pro pronounced that these are also called as long acting thyroid stimulators Okay, they are also referred to as long-acting, prolonged stimulate the thyroid, and the patient develops a goiter and iodine uptake increases. Naturally, pituitary is not at fault. The TSH will get suppressed. That's appropriate pituitary response. It's a primary hyperthyroidism. So this is what you're going to see in this patient. They'll have a goiter. They'll have suppressed TSH. The same thing happens in a toxic adenoma. The MCQs they give you toxic adenoma and Graves together in the choices, and they expect you to know how to differentiate. Now, obviously, the basic difference is iodine uptake. if iodine is taken up in the entire thyroid 
then that is clearly going towards a diffuse problem that is Graves. But if you see the iodine uptake is taken up only inside the nodule, the rest of the thyroid by feedback got suppressed. Nodular uptake, that clearly indicates it's a nodular problem, it's a toxic adenoma. So one difference is radioactive iodine uptake. But in my experience, they don't make it so easy in our exams. But one of the major clues to tell whether it is a Graves or whether it is a toxic adenoma is glycosaminoglycan. This is what they give in our exams. This glycosaminoglycan is exclusively seen only in autoimmune thyroid disease. You don't see it in toxic adenoma. Meaning, if they talk about proptosis or pretibial myxedema or um, clubbing, thyroid acropachy that is. This is all very suggestive of Graves. Now, you don't see the glycosaminoglycan deposition in a non-autoimmune condition. You don't see it in toxic adenoma. So, this becomes a major differentiator for us to tell whether you're looking at Graves or whether it is some other thyroid disease. Maybe it's a, you know, toxic adenoma. So, when looking at the next set of things, so that's that's the important things that I thought is relevant for the, the endocrine thyroid part. If you have any doubt, feel free to ask. But those are the most important things that I'm trying to cover over here. Okay, what is George Bezdo's effect is ki when you give excess iodine, there are two effects that they might ask you about this. When you're giving excess iodine, one is known as the wolf shakoff effect. And the other is known as the George Bezdo's phenomena. Okay, wolf shakoff effect and the George Bezdo's phenomena. Now, what is the difference between the two is in both the conditions we're giving iodine, but if you give iodine, if you give iodine to the patient and the thyroxine formation and release is suppressed, iodine, excess iodine seems to have a blocking effect at multiple levels in the formation of thyroxine. It decreases thyroxine output. If that's happening, that's wolf. You know, wolf khata hai kuch nahi Like it, That's a wolf check off effect. But if you're giving iodine and that iodine is causing the patient to produce more thyroxine, then that is known as jot based dose phenomena. So, if they ask you what's the normal phenomena actually between the two, the answer is Wolf-Shakoff. jot based dose phenomena happens in diseased thyroid or it can happen in people who are previously exposed to iodine deficiency zones like endemic iodine deficiency patients. They can have and this is because when your patient came from an endemic iodine deficiency belt, at that point the thyroid enzymes have adapted for the scenario that the iodine is coming occasionally. They adapted for that so any iodine they don't waste it. They keep forming more and more thyroxine. So, jot based dose, that means is not really a normal phenomena. What is really normal is wolf check off. Jot based dose is kind of seen in diseased thyroid or the patient might have had some iodine deficiency exposure in the past. So, moving to the questions on calcium. So, calcium questions if you see calcium phosphate parathormone. Remember the normal levels. These normal levels are important. These are a few places where you should remember. You should memorize the normal levels. The normal calcium is in the niners, we say. But 8.5 to 10.5 is the range. Okay, 8.5 to 10.5 is the range. Okay, phosphate is 2.5 to 4.5. So normal calcium 8.5 to 10.5. Normal phosphate is 2.5 to 4.5. Don't have to remember the parathormone levels. Alkaline phosphate is, as you all know, anything above 130 is significant for us. Okay, SI units above 130 is significant alkaline phosphate is. So when looking at a patient with hyperparathyroid, remember the most common cause of hypercalcemia is hyperparathyroid and that is usually a parathyroid adenoma. Whenever parathormone increases, whenever parathormone increases, it's got one important action, it increases calcium. But the parathormone may, just the other look at this name itself, PTH, that will help you remember, this is a phosphate thrashing hormone. Phosphate thrashing hormone, it decreases phosphate, it's got a lowering effect on phosphate. Okay, it increases excretion in the kidney. So, parathormone decreases phosphate, increases calcium. When they go in the opposite direction and you have high parathormone, the answer is easy. It is primary hyperparathyroid. Parathormone acts on the bone via on the blast and through the blast it acts on the clast. And that's the reason why any blastic activity, alkaline phosphatase increases. Okay, alkaline phosphatase as you know is a blastic marker. Okay, it's an osteoblastic marker. So whenever you see the calcium phosphate going in opposite direction, high parathormone, high alkaline phosphate is, the answer is easy, it is primary hyperparathyroid. When looking at hypoparathyroid, the opposite will occur, the calcium will be low, the phosphate is high, parathormone is low. And that's the reason why you're seeing this, the answer here is, so remember the idea that generally rule, if calcium phosphate go in opposite direction, you're looking most likely at a parathormone problem. And when you check the parathormone levels and it's matching, because when you expect low calcium high phosphate, you automatically think it's a hypoparathyroid. Now here is the important thing that hypoparathyroid can be because of many reasons. It can be a thyroid surgery, 
okay it can be a thyroid surgery it can be a patient having hypomagnesemia remember magnesium is required in the synthesis of parathormone can be hypomagnesemia or can be autoimmune disease so these are the top conditions that you are going to work up for if you see a patient having hypoparathyroid okay if you got a scar in the neck that thyroid surgery hypomagnesemia definitely have to check it out because magnesium is needed in the synthesis of parathormone and autoimmune disease also is common now all the other things that are there uh, other causes are there infiltrative disease are there uh like hemochromatosis can cause inf infiltration in the parathyroid they're all there but they're not the prominent things they're not the common things we don't really worry much about them in practice also so in mcqs also anyway these three are top when you're seeing a patient who's got rickets osteomalacia this vitamin d deficiency remember when you have vitamin d problems typically calcium phosphate move in the same direction and you'll see calcium in the lower limits of normal phosphate is low so they're moving in the same direction with a high parathormone this is clearly going towards vitamin d deficiency okay in children it's rickets adults it is osteomalacia the opposite happens in sarcoid sarcoid has got granulomas and these granulomas have got one alpha hydroxylase activity okay they have one alpha hydroxylase activity because the granuloma contains one alpha hydroxylase activity it converts inactive vitamin d to active vitamin d so sarcoid actually ends up with a vitamin d toxicity So when you end up with vitamin D toxicity, calcium up, phosphate up, by feedback, parathormone is suppressed. But if you look at a malignancy, if you look at cancer, three major cancers you should know one is lung, breast, and renal carcinoma. These tumors produce a parathormone-related peptide. Okay, they produce something called PTHRP, parathormone-related peptide. This parathormone-related peptide behaves like parathormone. It will increase calcium, it will decrease phosphate, but don't forget, parathormone is not doing it. Some peptide is acting on its receptor so because of this the clue is see one of you see calcium phosphate high and you see low parathormone definitely think that somebody is acting on behalf of parathormone and that is parathormone related peptide okay malignancy becomes very important over there if you look at osteoporosis remember that this is a cytoskeletal structure of the bone is not there bone def osteopenia is you know decrease bone osteoporosis more severe decrease in bone so bone cytoskeletal structure is not there but mineralization calcium phosphate parathormone the feedback circuit is normal the problem is the bone is not there without the bone the calcium can't be deposited inside so this is the issue then you will find that the calcium lab values typically are normal now in mcqs this is what we see in practice remember that one of the cause of osteoporosis is one of the causes chronic osteomalacia can cause osteoporosis so that's there but in typically most of the patients you see in opd they have the dexa scan in their hand you saw the dexa report it is clearly osteoporosis the score is more than minus 2.5 you saw it is osteoporosis but the lab report calcium vitamin d everything normal so this is the typical thing you'll see in osteoporosis the lab reports are generally normal now multiple myeloma the myelo the plasma cell which is malignant it produces osteoclast activating factors something called rank ligands okay it produces something called rank ligands these are direct osteoclast activating factors by activating the osteoclast it breaks the bone calcium phosphate increases by feedback parathormone is suppressed but the most interesting thing about multiple myeloma is a normal alkaline phosphatase and this alkaline phosphatase is usually normal because the blast is bypassed here the clast is directly activated because the plasma cells here remember multiple myeloma although it's a malignancy does not produce parathormone related peptide it produces osteoclast activating factors and there are many osteoclast activating factors you got rank ligands you got interleukin 1 and 6 it's tumor necrosis factor but the most important is rank ligands and what they do is they are going to break the bone the pth by feedback gets suppressed but most important alkaline phosphatase is normal if you see there's something called familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia and this familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is a condition where you find that the parathyroid gland is producing parathormone parathormone is maintaining the calcium the calcium gives feedback via calcium sensing receptors the defect occurs over here in this receptor the calcium sensing receptor is not sensing if the feedback does not come the parathyroid produces more parathormone increases calcium and decreases phosphate this kind of simulates like hyperparathyroid it looks like hyperparathyroid primary hyperparathyroid in the lab but the major clue for you will be that the same receptors are present in the kidney and because they're present in the kidney one of the things you will see in this patient is the urine calcium because they this calcium sensing receptor helps in calcium excretion in the urine so if this calcium sensing receptor is not working in the kidney it will not allow calcium to be thrown out in the urine and the urine calcium will be low so remember primary hyperparathyroid comes with renal stones okay primary hyperparathyroid will come with renal stones you don't get renal stones in this condition 
फेमिलियल हाइपो कैल्सीयूरिक लो कैल्शियम इन द यूरिन हाइपर कैल्सीमिया ओके हाई कैल्शियम इन द ब्लड लो कैल्शियम इन द यूरिन दैट्स द पिक्चर यू विल सी दिस इज अ डिफेक्ट इन द कैल्शियम सेंसिंग रिसेप्टर कैल्शियम इज हाई फॉस्फेट इज लो पैराथार्मोन माइट बी इंक्रीज एज आई टोल्ड यू दिस सिंपली बिकॉज द पैराथायरॉइड इज नॉट गेटिंग फीडबैक इट्स प्रोड्यूसिंग मोर पैराथार्मोन एंड द बिगेस्ट क्लू फॉर यू फॉर यू इज गोन बी दिस एंड दिस इज द पॉइंट समवेयर इन एन कॉर्नर डेल्टा यू यूरिन कैल्शियम इज लो सो रिमेंबर इफ यू सी प्राइमरी हाइपर पैराथायरॉइड एंड दिस द लैब मे लुक सिमिलर टू प्राइमरी हाइपर पैराथायरॉइड ओके यू सी हाई पैराथार्मोन हाई कैल्शियम लो फॉस्फेट नाउ दिस फिट्स इन विद प्राइमरी हाइपर पैरा बट इफ दे टेल यू दैट द पेशेंट हेज गॉट लो यूरिन कैल्शियम or if they tell you the urine calcium clearance ratio is less or they give you that the age is less than 30 family history is there because this autosomal dominant this calcium sensing receptor defect is autosomal dominant all these are clues to tell you that you're dealing with familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia okay hypocalciuric hypercalcemia young people develop it because this can manifest below 30 years family history is a problem because you will see autosomal dominant so father would have undergone some you know evaluation that person also had this issue so that kind of uh, history is clearly telling you this is going towards familial don't forget the name it's familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia okay again to repeat lab looks like primary hyper para but the clue will be low urine calcium family history is another clue if you see these things you're looking at fhh hypocalciuric hypercalcemia so these are some of the things that you should know as far as the calcium is concerned don't forget calcium is one of the hot favorite in iron entrance exams and you need to practice this table that i just discussed with you and if you are clear with this table i think you should be able to get that that one or two questions that they ask in an exam sometimes to you know we seen i think 2013 or 12 i'm forgetting the exact year they chappar phad ke we say you know they had asked five questions on calcium so very astonishing but sometimes they do that uh, and you should be prepared for the calcium is definitely hot topic okay it is a hot topic and the reason why it's hot topic is it's filled through mle books and sometimes you know we pick up questions from the mle in our exams and that's the reason why calcium becomes very important so if you look at the adrenal problem the adrenal disease can be either adrenal problem or it's a pituitary problem right pituitary if it causes low cortisol that secondary adrenal insufficiency if adrenal has got a disease that's a primary adrenal insufficiency so primary adrenal insufficiency is called addison's and secondary adrenal insufficiency is a pituitary problem correct now both the conditions cortisol will be low your differentiation comes in aldosterone because addison's the disease hitting the layers of adrenal all the layers of adrenal gland cortex will be affected means zona glomerulosa fasciculata all are hit aldosterone also has to be low but here what happens acth is low because of that cortisol is low aldosterone is controlled by a different feedback pathway which is the ras pathway the ras pathway is unaffected making the ras system normal aldosterone androgens are okay only the zona you know the fasciculata the layer in between that is affected and that's why cortisol is getting low and this is obviously not an adrenal disease because the problem is acth acth low cortisol low the other hormones of the adrenal are okay because they are controlled by other feedback mechanisms one major clue also is whenever acth is high the pre opium melon cotton levels are high so pigmentation can occur here there will be no pigmentation okay acth is not increase here because when cortisol is coming too much okay when the cortisol is sorry when the cortisol levels are low by feedback the acth levels will increase any increase in acth pomc levels will increase the pomc levels when they increase they are going to cause pigmentation preopiono melano cotton but here the problem is pituitary itself is got a disease acth low so you don't see pigmentation occurring here so that's one clue if you see pigmentation in the palms in the nails in the perioral area think about possibility of adrenal disease now what do they ask in addisons addisons main thing they ask you is they ask you about the all this organ resistance and all is dm level questions don't try to go for those kind of questions and don't answer them in the exam also you're giving a post mbbs level exam remember so pre opio melano cotton okay pomc is pre opio melano cotton don't try to go for all this hormonal resistance at your level they'll not ask okay don't complicate yourself when it comes to addisons how do you work up remember we discussed cushings we never do cortisol but in patients with addisons you start with cortisol because even if it's stress the needle and serine that you're showing to the patient should stress the patient out and the cortisol if it increases that's also fine for us because any cortisol more than 15 is fine it goes against addison but if the patient has got less than 3 or 3 to 15 then we need to work up 
So we start with ATM cortisol. If it's less than 3, we don't need anything. If you find high ACTH with a low cortisol, the answer is confirmed this is Addison's. But if it is between 3 to 15, then we are going to go for the cosyntropin stimulation test. This is nothing but a synthetic ACTH that we give, 250 micrograms of ACTH. And we check the cortisol at 30 minutes and 1 hour. And if the response to the ACTH, you're giving synthetic ACTH, if it responds, the adrenal responds to it, and it produces more than 18, that means that the patient's adrenal gland is okay. But if you're giving ACTH, still adrenal gland is not responding. When you give ACTH, you expect adrenal to respond. You give ACTH, but the adrenal is not responding. Cortisol is still low. That confirms to you that the patient has primary adrenal insufficiency. AI is adrenal insufficiency is confirmed. You measure the ACTH. If the ACTH is elevated, it's primary adrenal insufficiency, that is Addison's. If the ACTH is low, that means it is secondary or tertiary means hypothalamic disease. So basically, pituitary hypothalamus, if the ACTH is low, you're looking now between pituitary hypothalamic problem. If the ACTH is high, you're looking at adrenal pathology. By feedback, ACTH will be increased. To repeat once again, it's very easy. They'll ask you, what do you do for a workup? Look at the cortisol. Okay, do you need to remember the values? I don't think they'll ask you, but the concept, at least you should know, okay, start with serum cortisol. If the cortisol levels are already high, rule it out. If the cortisol levels are very, very low, less than three, that is very, very low. It's going surely towards Addison's, okay? It, obviously, you have to measure the ACT to decide whether it's Addison's or pituitary disease, but it's clearly abnormal. Three to 15, you have to go for ACT stimulation test. Adrenal response, normal, doesn't respond, it is going towards adrenal insufficiency. So again, after that, if it's high ACTH with low cortisol, high ACTH, adrenal problem, low cortisol, low ACTH, it's a pituitary problem. So this is how the workup has to be done. The treatment is hydrocortisone. And in a patient, when you're giving hydrocortisone, you divide the doses in such a way that you tend to give higher doses in the morning and lower doses in the night, around 20 to 25 micro, you know, milligrams of hydrocortisone. 20 to 25 milligram hydrocortisone or doses I have never seen them asking in your exam but the general idea you should know hydrocortisone should be given higher dose in the morning and lower in the evening now apart from that if the patient says I don't want to take so many drugs in a day I've got Addison's diagnosis I don't want to take so many drugs then you can use DEXA now this was asked in one of the exams the problem with DEXA is it's a pure glucocorticoid it does not have any mineral corticoid activity and I told you Addison's hits the layers of adrenal aldosterone also is gone so when you're giving DEXA, make sure you are giving a mineralocorticoid. Okay, fludrocortisone, fludrocort has to be given. Whenever you're giving DEXA, DEXA is pure glucocorticoid, does not have any mineralocorticoid activity. Mineralocorticoid has to be added if you're giving DEXA, but if you're giving hydrocortisone, remember hydrocortisone does have glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid activity. So moving ahead when looking at pheochromocytoma, so pheochromocytoma is a tumor that is producing high catecholamines and generally they ask in the exam, adrenal pheo, extra adrenal pheo, what does it commonly produce? More norepi than epi. Okay, norepinephrine is more than epinephrine. What are the clinical features? Now there's something called a sensitive triad. Most patients will have it, but doesn't mean that somebody has this, they have pheo. Most patients with pheo will have this. The sensitivity is quite high of these three. Headache, palpitation and sweating of which generally headache is the more common of these three but headache palpitation sweating is a common feature that the patients come with in patients with pheochromocytoma they can have uh, you know episodic palpitation they can have headache and generally these patients when you check they might be associated with hypertension when when you when you investigate when you check the uh, you know the examination you might see that this patient might have hypertension now most of the time what we expect in pheo is catecholamines are very short acting hormones the tumor releases the catecholamine. You should get only episodic hypertension and in between it could be normal. Although that's there, but in most endocrine books they describe that sustained hypertension is quite common in these patients. Okay, they might have episodic spikes on top of sustained hypertension, but sustained hypertension is pretty common. One question they keep asking, which is the most common location outside the adrenal, most common extra adrenal pheochromocytoma, this is organ of Zucker candle. And this organ of Zucker candle is bit basically between superior mesenteric artery, bifurcation point of iota in the retroperitoneum, the, the ganglia, that is the peritoneal ganglia, they can convert into pheochromocytoma and this zone is called organ of Zucker candle. So this has been asked in one of the exams, so you should know most common location, external pheo, organ of Zucker candle. Now how do you work up? Now in the work up, 24 hour urine is much better than plasma. Remember that because you're getting a 24 hour picture, plasma, when you take the sample, it will give you that particular scenario. So 24 hour urine is better. Fractionated metanephrine, catecholamine is your answer. Do not answer VMA. VMA lacks sensitivity, is not the investigation anymore. 
It's fractionated metanephrine and catecholamine that we use now. Okay, in plasma we do free metanephrine and catecholamine, but this fractionated metanephrine and catecholamine is supposed to be more accurate. Accuracy, as I told you, is more sensitivity and specificity combined. Once you diagnose the tumor by using fractionated metanephrine and catecholamine, then you have to locate where the tumor is, and the starting investigation generally is MRI. Now, if they ask you investigation of choice for diagnosis, it's urine, I told you. Investigation of choice for localizing, then make sure you go for MR, not PET scan. Now, you can do PET CT or DOPA-PET, the dota -tech scans, so many are there. But I'm telling you, the guidelines that are there is what we need to follow. And as per the guidelines, you start with MRI first. The MRI is unable to find an abdominal MRI. The tumor is not there in the abdomen. Then you do the MIBG as the next step. If the tumor is visible, and most of the time I told you is located in the adrenal, 90% of your, of your chromosomes are located in the adrenal. So you got the MRI, it showed that it's adrenal pathology. What do you do next? Then we still do MIBG. Now we're doing MIBG to find whether metastasis is there or not there. Okay, remember MR does not pick up METs. So to see for METs, you anyway have to do MIBG. But the important point to remember is you can't do MRI, M MIBG directly because it has poor sensitivity to pick up primary tumor. So you have to do MRI followed by MIBG. That's the guideline. Now, obviously, they ask you which is the best or most accurate. The PET scan is supposed to be very good. But but it generally is um, having radiation. It has got high, uh, it's quite expensive. So for all these reasons, pos possibly that's the reason why they are not there in the guidelines. In the guidelines, what you're supposed to do, MRI followed by MIBG. That's the way how to locate the tumor. Now, one repeat question in our exam, ki when you're looking at a patient with pheochromocytoma, don't use beta blockers initially. Some students ask me, um, so what about labetalol? Remember, labetalol also has got 1 is to 7 alpha to beta. Beta blockade is more than alpha. So that's why we don't use labetalol also. But we use phenoxybenzamine first. And once alpha blockade is successful, then we add a beta blocker. Once beta blocker is given, then the patient is considered fit for surgery, provided the heart rate is coming down. So this is how we give it. One thing they repeatedly ask in the exam, in FIO, what you should not do initially is give a beta blocker first. Okay, don't use beta blocker first. What do you do? Alpha block it followed by beta blocker. The exception is if the patient has a hypertensive emergency. If the patient has a hypertensive emergency, this patient has got high pressure along with some organ damage is occurring. Such a patient, you're supposed to give alpha and beta blockers together. Okay, if you give alpha blockade, we don't want reflex tachycardia to, you know, cause cardiac problem. So we protect the heart also. Alpha and beta blocker together we use in a hypertensive emergency. But if the patient is stable, then start with alpha. Once alpha blockade is done, then go for beta blocker, then go for surgery. So this has to be the way how you manage patients with few. When it comes to MEN, okay, saline so infusion test is primary hyperaldosteronism. Absolutely. Primary hyperaldosteronism, I'll just tell you, uh, I think I somehow missed out. So the important points about primary hyperaldosteronism. This is a patient where aldosterone levels are high. It is causing sodium retention. It will cause hypertension. This is associated with hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Okay, and the reason for that is sodium retains the, I mean, aldosterone retains sodium in the kidney and in exchange for potassium and H+. By feedback, what you see is the renin is going to get suppressed. Okay, renin is going to get suppressed. This is primary hyperaldo for you. Whenever the suspicion is there that this patient could be having primary hyperaldo, then one of the things that we do is the aldosterone renin ratio. If the aldosterone renin ratio is more than 20, the next step is go for saline loading test. Okay, the next step confirmatory test is saline loading test. Once you've done the saline loading test, okay, once you've done the saline loading test and you confirm the diagnosis, then comes the important investigation that you look at the abdominal CT. If the patient's having a unilateral adenoma, that is Kahn syndrome. If it's a bilateral problem, then it is bilateral hyperplasia. It is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. If it's a bilateral hyperplasia, then the management is mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, that is spironolactone. Okay, go for spironolactone. But if the patient has a Kahn syndrome and if the patient's age is less than 40 years, remember below 40 years, bilateral hyperplasias are rare, less than 40 years, it is adenoma only 
and you are definitely going to remove the adenoma you can consider removing the adenoma if you do surgery and remove the adenoma normal other adrenal gland is totally normal the patient will have a normal life now and the best part is he's not going to be on drugs for the rest of his life okay the patient is cured the patient is cured he does not have to take the rest of drugs for the rest of his life for hypertension but if the patient's age is above 40 years even though radiologically it might look like the patient has got a unilateral adenoma which is what is called con syndrome it could also be bilateral and you really can't rely on the radiology reporting it could still be bilateral even though one adrenal is large the adrenal by feedback must have got suppressed that's what you think is an adenoma but still it could be bilateral so we don't want to do uh, unnecessary surgery remove one of the vital organs of the body so what we do in this patient is we go for bilateral adrenal vein sampling if both sides aldosterone levels are high bilaterally bilateral vein aldosterone levels are high that means even though it is looking like one adrenal large one is small it's a bilateral problem you cannot do surgery patient goes to spinalactone if it's a unilateral only one adrenal vein okay only one adrenal vein aldosterone levels are high by feedback the other adrenal vein is got suppressed i mean the other adrenal gland is got suppressed then that patient has got adenoma only go for surgery so obviously the advantage is you if you do the surgery if it's a one gland problem one adrenal one adrenal problem the other abnormal adrenal will take care and you are going to declare the patient as cured patient need not be on drugs lifelong the possibility is high bilateral problems patient are going to be on drugs for the rest of their life and they they may end up you know taking these drugs for a pretty long time anyway all these details i have not seen them asked however you should understand the basic questions here primary hyperaldo questions are that sodium retention also causes water retention but it causes ANP and ANP throws away the sodium water typically sodiums are coming back to normal because natriuretic peptide will cause some amount of natriuresis these patients rarely ever have edema and this is again thanks to ANP okay they generally don't have edema it's rare this is because of the ANP what you see in most patients that means is hypertension and hypokalemic alkalosis once you have hypertension hypokalemic alkalosis workup possibility is at uh, their aldosterone renin should be checked ratio more than 20 go for saline loading test confirm if saline loading test does not suppress aldosterone then go for abdominal imaging bilateral problem patient should be a mineral mineral corticoid receptor antagonist if it's a unilateral problem below 40 you don't have to do any more workup it is cons only if it's bilateral problem then you cannot do surgery patient should be on drugs again so this is how the the evaluation is done and the questions that they ask on patients with primary hyperaldosteronism now coming to mn1 mn1 wormer syndrome is 3 p's is what we learned but be careful here this is not really a p because pancreatic is entro pancreatic tumors and because they include the entro part don't forget that most of the gastrinomas are located in the duodenum not in the pancreas So 70% of the gastrinomas are located in the duodenum only 25% are located in the pancreas so not really pancreatic it's entropancreatic tumors okay these are entropancreatic tumors so in patients with parathyroid hypoplasia parathyroid adenoma is common be careful it's not hypoplasia anymore the new things recommend that it's not hypoplasia adenoma is more common than hypoplasia so parathyroid adenoma entropancreatic tumors So most common problem is parathyroid adenoma so high calcium you'll see entropancreatic problem and gastrinoma is more common than insuloma pituitary adenoma obviously high prolactin levels this combination is what you see in patients with MEN1 okay again to repeat you'll see high calcium because of parathyroid adenoma gastrinoma is common so that's why gastrin levels will be high prolactin levels are high pituitary adenoma so these three are common fine combinations you'll see they'll give you two things and ask you what's the third thing okay that's MEN1 now MEN2A and mn 2b mn 2a is again parathyroid i mean it's it's medullary thyroid carcinoma that's most common followed by parathyroid adenoma okay followed by parathyroid adenoma so actually it's medullary thyroid carcinoma pheochromocytoma and then parathyroid adenoma these three things occur in mn 2a mn 2a is also simply called mn 2 sometimes but if you look at mn 2b then mn 2b earlier used to be called mn 3 okay mn 2b used to be called mn 3 MN3 again comes with medullary thyroid carcinoma followed by pheochromocytoma it may have marfanoid habitus and mucosal neuromas in MN2A we see megacolon is also quite common okay MN2A particularly megacolon is quite common so these additional things they have not asked but you know what they asked last this last year neat only ki in MN3 or MN2B what is not there parathyroid is not there 
Okay, that's the important thing. See, you may know the whole thing, but you should know the MCQs. What are they asking? If you know that, then your job is done. To summarize once again, MEN 2A and 2B, the medullary thyroid carcinoma happens in both. Pheochromocytoma happens to occur in both. What's the differentiating feature if they ask you? The answer is parathyroid adenoma. Parathyroid is there in one, is there in two, it's not there in three. Okay, be careful, MEN 3 or MEN 2B, parathyroid involvement does not occur. Now, MEN 4 has come now. And MEN4, if you see, okay, MEN4, it has parathyroid, it has pituitary. The first two things make you feel it's MEN1. Okay, it's got parathyroid, it's got pituitary. But it does not have intropancreatic. What is got? Reproductive organ tumors, uh, gonadal tumors, the genital tumors are there. So lower tract tumors, adrenal renal tumors, lower tract generally you should remember. That's where the problems are in MEN4. So parathyroid, pituitary plus lower tract tumors. That combination, if you're getting, that is MEN4. Okay, MEN1 pheochromocytoma does occur. Okay, Dr. Pravin is absolutely right. It's a rare finding. It's about seen in about 2 to 4 percent. And MEN1 can pheochromocytoma occur? Absolutely, it can occur. Okay, pheochromocytoma occurs in all three. MEN1, 2 and 3, all three it can occur, pheochromocytoma. So these are the things that you should know as far as. So moving to diabetes, fasting glucose uh, more than 126. Postprandial more than 200, HbA1c more than 6.5, generally random glucose we don't consider much but if patient is clearly symptomatic and the glucose more than 200 that also is diabetes for us. Now whenever you're looking at HbA1c be careful in anemia not just some hemoglobin disorders in even iron deficiency anemia the HbA1c can be falsely increased. Okay so you have to be careful if only HbA1c is increased then you got to check whether the patient has got anemia or not. If you look at a metabolic syndrome, out of five, three should be positive. Now this includes abdominal girth. For India, these are relevant numbers. 90-80, triglyceride levels, HDL levels, BP, and fasting glucose. These are the five components. Now what's the question they'll ask you? The question they're asking is, okay, what is not there in this, in metabolic syndrome? LDL is not there. Okay, So you just need to know the main question. What is the question? LDL is not there. Abdominal girth is there, triglyceride, HDL. Hypertension, fasting glucose more than 100, what is not there? LDL is not there. So when you look at the complications of diabetes, you have microvascular, macrovascular and non-vascular. And in the microvascular, you have retinopathy, neuropathy and nephropathy. Macrovascular, you have ischemic heart disease, stroke and peripheral vascular disease. And all these are glaucoma, cataract, skin problems, gastroparis, infections, all these are non-vascular complications. Now, what they're asking about diabetes is, how do you manage patients with diabetes? Type 2 diabetes, if they ask you, the main drug of choice is metformin. Don't forget that. All the other drugs are add-on drugs. For type 2 diabetes, the main drug is metformin. But before that, just one or two points I want to tell you to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The trap in our MCQ is going to be the age. Don't care about the age when you're looking at questions on diabetes. If you find the patient has insulin resistance phenotype, what's the insulin resistance phenotype? If the patient is having obesity, the patient has dyslipidemia, hypertension. Anyway, these three packaged together with obesity. Any obese person will have lipid problems and hypertension. And they talk about acanthos and agricans. All these are features to favor type 2 diabetes. Don't fall for the trap of the age. If they tell you obese child also, child, the answer will still be type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes do not have obesity, rather you will see weight loss over here. These people are more thin individuals. They don't have lipid problems. They don't have hypertension. They don't have acanthosis. And obviously, they'll have presence of antibodies in the blood. So if you see antibody presence, then you're looking at type 1. Okay, in our MCQs particularly and in practice also, age is not the thing to focus on. Focus on the insulin resistance phenotype features are there or not. Based on that, you decide is it type 1 or type 2 diabetes. MODY they have not asked much. MODY basically is a glucose sensor problem because glucose sensing doesn't happen. Insulin release doesn't occur. Okay, those people also, uh, MODY patients also are having features like type 1. They also have weight loss. They don't have insulin resistance phenotype. Remember, MODY is an insulin release problem. It's not releasing insulin because glucose sensing is not occurring. So maturity onset diabetes of the youth, the main features in MCQ are going to be that this is autosomal dominant inheritance. They don't have any insulin resistance phenotype. Okay, these patients are going to have 
three generations family history if you see that means father grandfather son three generations they giving you this is very high penetrance mod y so that kind of history is highly suggestive of maturity onset diabetes in most of the patients the common type of mod y at least the one that we typically diagnose it's type 3 and that is generally seen below 25 age as i told you you have to be careful it's very tricky sometimes the diagnosis can occur late but it could be given below 25 years mod y so what's the main problem here it's a glucose sensing defect without sensing of glucose insulin release is not occurring the treatment is sulfonylurea low dose sulfonylurea and there are no antibodies over here the main way how you differentiate from type 1 is the type 1 does not have three generation family history which you see in mod y to repeat again once again type 1 diabetes does not have the kind of family history that you see in mod y what's the family history is telling you three generations if you see one after another this is a person who has got weight loss this patient has got features of diabetes but his grandfather also had father also had that's going away from type 1 it is mod y if they give you insulin resistance phenotype that is type 2 diabetes the patient does not have that kind of family history weight loss is there antibody presence is there that is type 1 diabetes so this is how you differentiate between these various types of diabetes now the two major complications they'll ask you diabetic ketosis and hyper hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state in one the problem is ki insulin is not there lack of insulin or neoglycogenic hormone is increased in this you get diabetic ketosis in diabetic ketosis the problems are ketones and ketone bodies will cause acidosis the main problem ketone bodies do is they cause acidosis severe acidosis can cause hypotension okay severe as metabolic acidosis will start dropping the blood pressure it's a vasodilator so the core problem here is acidosis that's why the bicarb is low and all these are because of high ketones okay all the problems are because of ketones patients with hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state what's the core problem the core problem is insulin resistance means these are type 2 diabetic patients their major issue is insulin resistance and insulin resistance is not equal everywhere so it's still able to act on the fat it's still not allowing fat to break but it's not allowing the glucose to enter inside the cells and that lack of glucose enter inside the cell is the reason why you're getting this issue now the glucose in the blood is building up any normal person who's young the moment they feel thirsty they'll start drinking water remember elderly people thirst senses are weak and mental people or physically impaired people who cannot go and drink water they are now concentrating the plasma significantly because if you drink water you can flush the glucose out in the urine he is not able to drink water so the glucose level shoots up like anything and the whole problem here is osmotic in nature it is osmotic look at the plasma osmolality is going about 315 actually harrison says most patients will have more than 330 milli osmoles in the plasma so once the so what's the major problem here is acidosis is creating the problem acidosis is causing hypotension here is the osmotic damage that is occurring and osmotic damage is basically sucking water out of the brain and brain injury is what your main issue is so main area that is affected in patients hhs is the brain injury how do you differentiate in mcq 200 to 600 typically dk 600 to 1200 the answer is hhs just the glucose level itself will give you a clue whether it is dk or whether you're looking at hhs the other is the ph obviously because of the acidosis you will see high anion gap acidosis here and typically young people type 1 diabetic people and remember type 2 diabetes also can have dk but generally these are younger people but if you see elderly person or some person has got some physical impairment not, not able to drink water then the glucose levels are going to shoot up osmotic forces high it sucks the water out of the brain cells causing demyelination and osmotic demyelination in causes significant mental problems that's the reason why the mortality rate is quite high over here compared to over here okay 20 to 60 percent mortality over here the mortality is around 50 percent five percent so these are differentiating features between dk and hhs both need fluid and insulin in the treatment okay both you have to give fluids and insulin in the treatment so if you look at um latent autoimmune diabetes is nothing but uh, type 1.5 diabetes not type 3 it is called 1.5 diabetes it's nothing but type 1 diabetes that is manifesting very slowly okay latent autoimmune is nothing but like type 1 diabetes there also you'll see antibodies everything looks like type 1 only thing it's a uh, it's called 1.5 diabetes it is slowly man, you know progressing it's not the full blown disease type 1 diabetes it's got manifested early slowly progressing it is having all the features of type 1 that is lad okay anti gad antibodies are seen in type 1 diabetes obviously okay hhs uh, suck water from the brain means it's osmotic damage remember that very high very high osmotic 
osmotic balance between intracellular and extracellular compartment that will suck water out of the brain cells causing osmotic demyelination that is the reason why they come with delirium. Diabetic ketosis treatment is basically insulin and fluids. Fluids more important, both other conditions, fluids priority, then comes insulin. The only question here is, ki don't give insulin if the hypokalemia is there. In patients, with type 1 in patients with DKA, the only repeat question is, if you see potassium low, insulin pushes potassium inside the cells, it can precipitate rapid hypokalemia and that can cause arrhythmias and kill the patient in a matter of few minutes. Okay, so when you see low potassium, do not give insulin. Stop insulin in decay treatment. We never give insulin when the potassium levels are going below 3.3. That's one of the repeat questions they've been asking in the exam for diabetic ketosis. Okay, don't give insulin if the potassium is low. Give potassium drip. See, during our treatment, it doesn't happen initially. During our treatment, somewhere, sometimes, you know, the potassium starts going down because insulin pushes potassium inside the cells. If the potassium you're not monitored, somebody got a report, it showed potassium 3, stop the insulin immediately. Okay, correct the potassium, then only give insulin. That's the important point. Okay, if you look at nephro, they'll sometimes ask you about these cars. Remember the WBC cars are seen in pyelonephritis, interstitial nephritis. RBC cars are glomephritis. Broad waxy cars, if you see, it is seen in chronic renal failure. Muddy brown cars, of all these, the most important ones for us are these two, RBC cars and muddy brown cars. So muddy brown cars are acute tubular necrosis and hyaline cars, as you know, can happen in normal dehydrated patient. Now, the, the glomerular diseases are covered very nicely in patho and Dr. Praveen has done an excellent job over there. But if you look at the uh, acute kidney injury, then most questions that I've seen on acute kidney injury are basically about the workup. And acute kidney injury, um, this is a patient whose urine output is shutting down or creat going up acutely. You're looking at either pre-renal or intrinsic renal or post-renal. Now, post-renal basically is going to cause uh, back pressure and causing hydronephrosis of the kidney, which is usually picked up by the ultrasound. And on top of that, most of the patients will have pain because any feedback, um, you know, the buildup of pressure in the ureters, hydronephrosis will stretch the capsule of the kidney and that will be accompanied by pain. So if there is decreased urine output with pain in the flanks, the answer is easy, it's post-renal. And it's very nicely picked up by ultrasound. So... The presence of pain with decreased urine output, the, the ultrasound showing hydronephrosis, that makes your job easy, that's post-renal. But where our issue is, it is pre-renal and intrinsic renal that you have to differentiate. Now in that also, if you see a patient having acute interstitial nephritis, most of these are allergic in nature. So you will see the patient having history of a drug or an infection. The patient might develop an allergic rash. They will have eosinophilia mentioned in the question or eosinophiliuria. Okay, they might have a WBC cast, sterile pyuria. So some of these clues will tell you that this is going towards an interstitial nephritis. Okay, usually it's a drug, he developed a rash, there is eosinophilia, eosinophiluria, sterile pyuria, WBC cast, interstitial nephritis. If they give you a patient having RBC cast, hematuria and proteinuria, okay, hematuria and proteinuria with RBC cast, that makes your job easy. The reason why the patient has got acute renal failure now is because of acute kidney injury is because of glomerular nephritis. If it's a vascular problem, it could be because of TTP or HUS or vasculitis. And any of these conditions rather will have a lot of systemic manifestation. It could also be severe hypertension. Okay, hypertensive emergency we call it. Okay, it used to be called malignant hypertension at one time. But none of these are only kidney. They are going to have a lot of systemic features. Intratubular obstruction can be precipitation because of drugs. It can be crystal precipitation. It could be because of protein precipitation. So that's intratubular. Remember, if the ureter get blocked, back pressure will cause hydronephrosis. Inside the tubule, if blockage occurs, then you, that's not going to cause hydronephrosis because the tubules inside are getting blocked. So that's intratubular. But I'm telling you, 80% of our cases that we see in practice when somebody's got acute kidney injury in our hospitals, it's either pre-renal or ATN. This is the reason why in our exams, the focus is between these two. And mainly the constructor question that you saw a patient who's got um, decreased urine output in your hospital. You have to work up and decide, is it pre-renal or is it ATN? And that such a common scenario in practice also. That's the reason why MSQ is also quite common in this zone. So when you're differentiating, the most important points to focus on are these. BU and creat ratio more than 20, less than 20. Remember, they'll not calculate the ratio and give it ready-made for you. They'll give you BUN separate, create separate. You make sure you use the ratio. 
the urine sodium is not very reliable the values differ because it varies based on the water content of the urine so we don't give much importance to urine sodium but yes fena is important this is the formula for calculating fena 1 to 2 is normal remember so less than 1 more than 2% will help you differentiate fractional excretion of urea is another thing that we can use less than 35% more than 35% the others are not that important but yes if you find that the patient has muddy brown cast mention that really makes a big difference and you know that that is going towards acute tubular necrosis now if you see tubules are working and the urine is getting concentrated the more concentrated don't forget the plasma is 300 and the filtrate in the glomerular is also osmotic filtrate also is 300 all the concentration is in the urine is done by the tubules the tubules are normal in prerenal the urine gets nicely concentrated prerenal tubules are normal the urine osmolality will be far away from plasma it will be more than 300 obviously 450 it indicates tubules are working fine but if the tubules are not working fine the urine does not get concentrated it is closer to plasma that's a concept why low urine osmolality suggests the patient has got acute tubular necrosis specific gravity in plasma is 1.010 right plasma is 1.010 so the more concentrated the urine the higher the specific gravity lesser the specific gravity it indicates the urine is matching the plasma the tubules are not working that is also going towards acute tubular necrosis now most of these things i have not seen in the questions in our exams in our exams mainly what you should focus on is fena and bun bio and creat ratio and apart from that yes if they give you the cast that really saves everything muddy brown cast the answer is easy that is acute tubular necrosis so these two or three things is what you definitely need to remember to differentiate between prerenal and atn hepaturenal syndrome does it look like prerenal absolutely hepaturenal syndrome is basically the splanchnic system expanding and as the splanchnic severe cirrhosis splanchnic system will expand it will put all the volume there causing hypotension the hypotension the body counters by throwing sympathetic system and that causes severe vasoconstriction renal vasoconstriction it looks like prerenal so hepaturenal syndrome is nothing but prerenal picture so it is going to have bio and creat ratio more than 20 all these things that you are seeing is what you get in hepaturenal syndrome okay remember hepaturenal syndrome is just like prerenal kidney is normal it simply decrease volume why decrease volume in the body because planchnic system vasodilated okay that is called hepaturenal syndrome so ckd a uh, chronic kidney disease most important investigation for us is the the ultrasound and if they tell you the shrunken kidneys or echogenic kidneys or loss of corticomedullary differentiation all these are going towards ckd urine analysis obviously also helps us in making the diagnosis of ckd but they do ask sometimes ki in what ckd conditions shrunken kidneys will not occur okay normally small kidneys very very important for us that fibrosis occurred in the kidney and they become small so diabetic nephropathy polycystic kidneys multiple myeloma are three exceptions where even though patient has ckd the kidney will not be small okay these kidneys are not going to be shrinking management of ckd uh, main thing is you take care of the proteinuria and the bp together by using ras if ac inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is not able to do you can add a calcium channel blocker to control bp but generally this will take care of both proteinuria as well as bp control smoking remember damages the kidney so we have to avoid in diabetic patient tight glycemic control is the main way microvascular complication so tight glycemic control is the most important thing that you need to look at protein restriction obviously because the more protein passing through the kidney will cause more damage so that's the whole goal we want to reduce the proteinuria in the patient avoid anything that can precipitate acute kidney injury give bicarb but apart from these you know whether questions are coming in ckd they're asking about anemia what do you do in a patient with anemia in ckd and the trap is next step people get trapped and answer um, erythropoietin be careful in a patient with ckd anemia the next step is correct iron once iron stores are depleted then only you have to go for erythropoietin okay do not directly go for erythropoietin without checking iron and correcting it Okay, the other thing they'll ask you is about the hyperkalemia. Obviously, when you have hyperkalemia, potassium binding will cover potassium um, in a minute, and that means we use pathiromer zirconium. So potassium binders are becoming important. So if you have hyperkalemia, potassium binding important. The hyperphosphatemia we take care by using phosphate binders. Again, this is sevalimer. So apart from sevalimer, we have lanthanum, we have ferric citrate, but sevalimer is the main thing. Then we take care of calcium. and the most important thing is we don't want hypercalcemia to occur um this hypercalcemia we can prevent we can prevent hypercalcemia and prevent hyperparathyroid because any low calcium will trigger hyperparathyroid we don't want that hyperparathyroid so to prevent the hyperparathyroid we use a drug called sinacalcet 
This mimics like calcium. It's a calcium mimetic drug. It gives feedback to parathyroid and tells ki you keep quiet, don't come out. So we don't want parathyroid to come out. The parathyroid that comes out actually damages the bone for us. We don't want that to occur. So we give sinacalcet, and we make sure that the patient is getting adequate, uh, you know, uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Okay, we don't want uh, hyperparathyroid to occur in these patients. Sometimes secondary hyperparathyroid, if it's occurring, it can jump to tertiary hyperparathyroid. Parathyroid adenomas can occur. All these can be prevented by using sinacalcet. So this is some of the things, and of all these, you know, the important thing that they ask in an exam is, I think one of the repeat questions is anemia. You have a patient with anemia, what's the next step? Trap, don't answer erythropoietin. Next step is iron. So in the electrolytes, I think um, hyponatremia and hyperkalemia are the repeat questions. Okay, they'll ask you hypokalemia, hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. These two are very important. Now looking at hyponatremia, the serum sodium less than 135, Okay, serum sodium less than 135. First step is check the plasma osmolality. Don't forget, plasma osmolality, the formula is 2 into sodium plus glucose by 18 plus BUN by 2.8. And we're using this simply to convert them into millimoles. Okay, we use milligram per deciliter. If it's already in millimoles, don't have to divide. You use these just to convert them into millimoles again. So this is the plasma osmolality. And don't forget, plasma osmolality mainly depends on sodium. Okay, it's double sodium because once you divide these, they become single digits. So they don't have much value. All the osmotic force is basically because of sodium. Most of it is because of sodium anyway. So when you see a patient having hyponatremia, you expect the osmotic force to be low. If the plasma osmolality is high, then you're looking at either glucose or mannitol that is triggering the patient to develop hyponatremia. Don't have to correct sodium here. You correct the diabetes, you correct the glucose, the sodium gets corrected. Then you have pseudo hyponatremia that occurs in hypertriglyceridemia and the high plasma proteins like multiple myeloma. So myeloma patients, the whenever the sodium is low, we don't bother much about it because we know that is a it's an estimation problem, it's a lab error. Patient sodium in the body actually is normal. When you take a sample, the sample is filled by lipid or protein, and the amount of sodium collected in the sample is low. So when you feed it in the machine, machine is counting low sodium. So it is a lab artifact actually. It's a it's our estimation problem. It's called pseudo hyponatremia. But the plasma osmolality is low, now that's true hyponatremia. It's called hypoosmotic hyponatremia. When you have hypoosmotic hyponatremia, look at the volume status of the person. If you see hypervolemia, you look at heart failure, nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis, euolemia is either SIDH or hypothyroid. And if the patient is not, I mean, if they give you edema, choose this. If they give dehydration, you're losing both water and electrolytes. He may be losing from the kidney, urine sodium more than 20, look for a renal cause. The urine sodium less than 20, he's losing outside the kidney, maybe GI or it could be skin. So these are the places, this is how the workup is done. Now one of the questions I think last year need only they ask you, how do you calculate sodium deficit? Now sodium deficit formula is total body water into 140 minus sodium. In a male sodium is, uh, total body water is calculated as 60% of weight of a male is water, 50% of a weight of a female is water. So this is how we calculate total body water in male and female. Remember the rules in a patient who's got acute hyponatremia, usually this is a marathon runner in the question or somebody who's got a lot of symptoms. Symptoms in a hyponatremia indicate the patient has developed it acutely. Anything chronic, body will adapt. If it's acute, the body will not be able to adapt. So patient will have seizures, they'll have a lot of um, you know delirium and all that. So that clinical history also tell you it's acute or chronic. If the patient has acute hyponatremia, then you unless hypotension is mentioned, where we start with normal saline, if there's no hypotension, start with 3% saline, keep repeating 3% saline until the sodium becomes normal. So in acute hyponatremia, there are no rules to follow. Correct the sodium as fast as you can. In a chronic hyponatremia, body is adapted to the low osmotic force. So the correction should be slow, otherwise it will cause osmotic demyelination. So you have to correct sodium 6 to 8 milliequivalent per day, not more than this. So let's say the patient's sodium was 120. Day 1, you take it to 128 maximum. Day 2, you take it to 136. So you're giving 8, 8 milliequivalents every day. So you're going to slowly correct. You don't correct in a single day. Slow correction is the rule for chronic. But in acute hyponatremia, you can correct as you keep repeating 3% saline 100 ml until the sodium becomes normal. So this is how the... The questions are the, as far as sodium is concerned. Now, when you look at potassium, the potassium normal levels are 3.5 to 5.5. Remember, when you have hyperkalemia, it is going above 5.5. Now, when you're looking at hyperkalemia, don't bother about whether the ECG changes are there or not there. Protect the heart first. We don't want any tamasha. We don't want any arrhythmias. Protect the heart. No arrhythmias for next two hours. That's a peace of mind that you have. So give calcium immediately. 
So calcium can be given either in gluconate or chloride, but do not use chalk powder. Do not answer calcium carbonate in the exam. Okay, use calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Difference is gluconate should be given very slowly. Chloride should be pushed. You can give fast calcium chloride. Remember, calcium will not reduce potassium. It will only protect for arrhythmias. For the next few hours, you'll have peace of mind. There's no arrhythmia risk. You're still going to reduce potassium. And how you reduce potassium is insulin glucose or beta-2 agonists or diuretics. Potassium binders obviously are important. If patient is already a case of dialysis, catheters are there, the patient goes for dialysis. So those are the things that we do. But what you should not answer is do not answer calcium carbonate. Do not answer 50% dextrose without insulin. Okay, don't forget hypertonic fluids pull potassium out of the cells. We don't want hyperkalemia to occur. Already potassium is high. So hypertonic fluids can pull potassium out. So don't want that to occur. Don't give it without insulin. Um, the one problem is sodium polystyrene. We used to use this for many years, you know, k -exalate. The problem with sodium polystyrene, rarely it causes intestinal necrosis. So we've got better drugs now. This is plus or minus choice. Means you can consider if the other options are okay. But preferably now we are trying to avoid using k -exalate. We are going for pathiromer and zirconium. This is better. Okay, zirconium and pathiromer is better. How calcium protects um, potassium? It doesn't protect potassium. It is acting on sodium channels. It stabilizes sodium channels. By stabilizing sodium channels, it does not allow arrhythmias in the heart. Okay, arrhythmia risk in the heart is decreased because calcium stabilizes the sodium. It acts on a different channel. It doesn't act on potassium. It acts on sodium channels and stabilizes the cardiac membrane. By increasing the threshold, calcium does not allow arrhythmogenicity. So that's the benefit of calcium. Okay, so as I said, this is not a class for conceptual discussion. This is just the most important thing that, that I can cover in just a few hours. In an actual class, I'll ex I could have explained the exact mechanism of how calcium working and how it stabilizes the membrane and the physio behind it, but I don't think we have the time to do that now. Okay, so moving ahead, epinephrine, no epinephrine. Um, you would not want to give epinephrine because, see, already the patient is arrhythmogenic. Now, we don't want to use epinephrine. Agreed, epinephrine acts, activates beta-2 receptor and pushes potassium inside the cell. Agreed. But don't forget, one of the major risks for arrhythmias is catecholamine itself. We don't want to give catecholamine. We don't want to increase the risk of arrhythmias. Okay. So, and epinephrine does not act on beta-2 alone. It acts on beta-1 also. We don't want any arrhythmias in our patient. So, these are all the important things when that you should know as far as um, electrolytes are concerned. So moving to neuro, the important things in neuro, a uh, few questions do come on. Bartle gentleman, I think we'll cover if there is time at the end. So do remind me uh, at the end of the session. Definitely I'll discuss Bartle gentleman, Little Gordon, all that I'll cover for you a little, little later. Let's finish these first. Uh, if you're looking at neuro, so I'll see if I really get fatigued out and I can't, then it will not be one shot. We'll do a two shot medicine. Maybe we can do it another half of it again. But we'll see first. So when you're looking at um, Neuro, if you look at the three major types of uh, headache that they give in our exam, you got migraine, you got tension type, and you got cluster headache. Now, the basic difference between these are that if you see a unilateral throbbing type of headache, you're looking at migraine. If you're looking at bilateral band like, remember non throbbing, compressive type of headache, that is tension type headache. And don't forget, tension type is the most common type of headache. I'm sure all of you have experienced it already. So, this is the most common type of headache overall. But what you see in practice, tension type people take medication on their own, they don't come to us. The people who are we are seeing are migraine typically. So, throbbing type, non pulsatile band like compression tension type but cluster headache is something that they've started asking nowadays so cluster is a piercing periorbital type of headache okay it's a deep piercing type of headache around the eye so the pattern is very important just look at the pattern remember cluster word means it is multiple cluster of grapes we say multiple so in a single day patient will have anywhere between so usually in our exams you know they say two attacks or four attacks like that although the range is very vast what harrison is saying is every alternate day headache to up to eight episodes per day that's not the typical. Typical is 2 to 4, 2 to 5. So 2 to 4 episodes in a day if you see, or 2 to 5 episodes in a day. Because once it crosses 5, you know, we think about hemicranial headache. So around 2 to 5 episodes of headache, each lasting for about an hour approximately, that's cluster for you. Okay, that's cluster. The typical headache of cluster is going to be two times in our MCQ, which has been asked in the past. It occurred in the afternoon and one more attack in the evening. They give described like that. That's cluster. Migraine is a single attack, but it lasts for more than four hours, and sometimes it can last for an entire day. 
Now, how do you differentiate? If you see migraine associated features, nausea is there, photophobia, phonophobia, osmophobia. Uh, the more the person moves, the more worse the headache becomes. All this is migraine for us. Okay. Um, so patients with migraine would not want to listen to music or bright light. They want to close their eyes. They want to be quiet in a place. They don't want to travel because all these are going to worsen their headache. And of all these, the nausea is the most common. In fact, so classical is nausea. Somebody says nausea with headache. We think about migraine first. Remember, it's a featureless headache, but at this point, you should know that photophobia, phonophobia, one of these, not both, one of these is possible. Okay, any one may be present, so that doesn't rule out attention type for us. Maybe photophobia, many, maybe phonophobia, one of these are possible, but both should not be there. Definitely, you don't see nausea, osmophobia, movement relation, not their attention type headache. All these features that we saw in migraine can occur in cluster, with one major difference. A migraine, you see, the defense is, if he moves, his headache worsens. But a cluster headache, you will not see sitting quietly. This agitated person, restless, constantly pacing around. Restlessness, if they are mentioning with headache, that's going against migraine. Remember that. Restlessness is cluster for us. Okay, cluster. Now, the major difference is, autonomic features, if you are seeing, red eye, lacrimation, rhinorrhea, nasal condition, this is all going towards cluster. Okay, cluster comes under a category called TAC, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. So autonomic features, if you are seeing, clearly it is cluster. You generally don't see that in the other two types. Now, as far as the treatment is concerned, mild patients, we give NSAIDs. In most significant, moderate to severe intensity, triptans is the first drug. Okay, in most patients, if you're given a choice, go for triptans. Then ergot, caffeine, all these are vasoconstrictors. They also can be given. Status micronosis, somebody's got migraine for more than 72 hours. The only thing they'll ask you, fine, you give steroids, you give ketorolac, you give hydration. The only thing they'll ask you here is what you don't use in status. You generally tend to avoid opioids in status micronosis. Okay, don't go for opioids in the treatment for status micronosis. In patients with um, the treatment for um, tension type is NSAIDs, paracetamol, both work. And in cluster headache, this is important. They've asked this last one or two years back, okay, you can use uh, triptans, you can use 100% oxygen. This is now high flow oxygen that you're giving 12 to 15 liters per minute. Okay, this is high flow oxygen that you're giving 12 to 15 liters per minute. Now, the trick when the MCQ was that given three liters of oxygen per minute, that is not going to work. The home oxygenators cannot generate this kind of high flow oxygen, so the patient can't do buy some equipment and keep it at home and get treated. Not happening. So that's why in that question the answer was triptan. Triptan is the answer because the oxygen they had given was three to five liter. Be careful, oxygen should be high flow, twelve to fifteen, otherwise it will not work. Okay, so twelve to fifteen liters per minute oxygen or triptan, depending on the choice you have to carefully see and then answer. Now, how do you prevent prevention of migraine? The level one drugs meaning the randomized control trials have clearly shown the benefit. Okay, they come under level one. The level one drugs are beta blockers. Okay, the level one drugs are beta blockers, valproate, topiramate, botulinum toxin, and the monoclonal antibodies. All these come under level one. Now, rest of them, tricyclic antidepressants is there, CCB is there, mau B inhibitor, they don't come under level one because they are, they may work in some people, they may not work. And that's the reason why you have to be careful if you are choosing in patients better to choose among the level one drugs where randomized control trials are showing benefit without any doubt okay beta blocker well provide topiramate then monoclonal antibodies nowadays still not widely available in india and then in that also galcinizumab is becoming uh, important and then botulinum toxin only thing is botulinum toxin only works for chronic migraine doesn't work for episodic migraine now when it comes to the cluster headache the only thing that you should remember here is verapamil Okay, I don't think they'll ask you anything else. Here also galcinizumab, that is CGRP antagonists are used. The rest of them, they are not that important. Verapamil is the main drug that we use in, to prevent the cluster headache. Now, somebody is asking, what about lignocaine? Lignocaine is used in a type of headache called sunct. Okay, in sunct, which is piercing type of headache for a few seconds and hundreds of episodes in a day, that's called sunct. Sunct, we use lignocaine in the acute management and prevention, we use anticonvulsants. That is for sunct, okay, not for cluster headache. Cluster prevention is verapamil or CGRP antagonist. So moving to uh, the Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's, if you see, the only one more thing I want to just tell you about uh, primary headaches is when you're looking at um, migraine, remember migraine is more than four hours. Uh, when you look at tension type, the duration is highly variable. Cluster headache, approximately for an hour, Multiple episodes, two to five episodes, that's cluster. 
but if you see a patient having a piercing type of headache around the eye not responding to triptans if they given that in the mcq and they telling you each episode lasts for 20 minutes and more than five episodes in a day you're looking at hemicranial headache okay so only one thing for paroxysmal hemicranial headache okay paroxysmal hemicranial headache is usually in our exams the episodes will be between 5 to 20 in a day okay will be 5 to 20 episodes in a day and they usually last for less than 30 minutes so on an average you'll see around 15 20 minutes in uh, each episode and they sometimes give you a clue by telling triptans are not working for this patient the only drug that will work in this patient is indomethacin okay obviously indomethacin by the time it starts working the current episode which lasts for 15 minutes it will go away it will be useful for the next future episodes that will occur in the day. So endomethacin is the main drug. If they give you endomethacin, sometimes in the question they give endomethacin. Endomethacin responsive drug, headache. The answer is paroxysmal hemicranial headache. Okay, paroxysmal, paroxysmal hemicranial headache. Okay, what are the clue? Looks like cluster. It is also piercing around the eye. It also goes have red eye. Also, you'll have tearing. Same thing. But the episodes are more than five. Number one. Number two, they are shorter duration. They only respond to endomethacin. Autonomic features will occur in all the attacks, including cluster, hemicranial headache. They also have red eye. Here also red eye will occur. Piercing type. Everything is same. We'll look at these to help you differentiate and tell whether it's hemicranial or cluster. Okay, why endomethacin works? We don't know. Okay, but that's the only drug that works for hemicranial headache. So Parkinson's disease, the main features are trap, tremor, rigidity, hypokinesia, and postural reflexes are abnormal. Remember, tremor is not a must in Parkinson. You can have tremorless Parkinson. What is important is rigidity and hypokinesia. Okay, this rigidity hypokinesia together is called Parkinsonism. Okay, rigidity hypokinesia together is called Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is the main feature. The earliest feature of Parkinson's has been asked in the exam. The answer is constipation, not, not anosmia. Constipation is the earliest, followed by IREM behavioral abnormality. Next, after this comes the anosmia and all that, okay, hyposmia and all comes later. So constipation is the earliest feature in Parkinson, followed by IREM behavioral abnormality. Main point in Parkinson is how do you differentiate Parkinson from atypical Parkinson? Atypical Parkinson, atypical Parkinson is progressive supranuclear palsy multiple system atrophy and CBD, corticobasal degeneration. For PSP, the main clue will be ocular problems. The patient can't look down, can't look up. Look down first goes, then up goes. Okay, vertical gaze, particularly down gaze gets affected very early. They also sometimes will describe about square wave jerky movements of the eye. So actually, you know, this is very difficult for us to see visibly, but you can record ocular movement now. And if you see this kind of movement of the eye recorded in this way, this is called square wave jerky movements of the eye. So if you see that also goes towards PSP. Now, the MRI might show hummingbird appearance. This imaging is something that uh, is not seen in all patients, but it might give you a clue. But the main thing is Parkinsonian features with ocular problems, think about PSP. If you see a patient with multiple system atrophy, there are many subtypes in this, but Scheidrager is most important. Scheidrager will have Parkinsonism, which is rigidity and hypokinesia. It will come with early autonomic feature. Remember, Parkinson's will have autonomic problems after 10 years. If it occurs within a year after Parkinsonism, within a year of Parkinsonism, if you're getting autonomic problems, you're looking at Scheidrager syndrome. So early falls, early orthostatic hypotension, within a year, after 10 years is Parkinson. Within a year, you're looking at MSA. CBD, as the name is suggesting, basal ganglia is affected, but cortex also affected. So patient will have dystonia, cortical sensory problems, apraxia, aphasia, behavioral problems, very, very important. And there's something called alien hand, where the patient is moving his hand, but he says he's not controlling. The hand is moving on its own. Okay, that is alien hand phenomena. So to summarize then in our exam, what they'll ask is, ki how do you differentiate Parkinson from atypical Parkinson? Most important is, is it symmetric or asymmetric? Remember, tremor will be asymmetric. Remember, hypokinesia will be asymmetric. If it is asymmetric, one more on one side, less on the other side, you're looking at Parkinson. Most atypical Parkinson, PSP, multiple system atrophy, they are symmetrical. What's the exception? CBD. Now, particularly CBD, AMS has asked, which is the atypical Parkinson that is asymmetric, they had asked. So the answer is corticobasal degeneration. Okay, that's the only exception. CBD is asymmetric. 
remember PSP and MSA are symmetric. But the anchor point for us is, are they responding to dopamine or not? Poor response to dopamine, Parkinson. I mean, good response to dopamine, Parkinson. Poor response to dopamine. I'm not talking about a full-blown disease after 10 years where on-off phenomena occurs. This is at the time of diagnosis of disease we're talking. Dopamine works beautifully in Parkinson initially. Doesn't work in a typical Parkinson. That becomes a major differentiator for us. Remember that tremor, if it is there, more likely to be Parkinson. But be careful, tremorless Parkinson also can occur. And atypical Parkinson also may not have tremor. So absent tremor doesn't help. Presence of tremor, more likely to be Parkinson. Rigidity is more axial, more peripheral, sorry. It is called appendicular rigidity. Rigidity more in the elbow and all that. But rigidity in the neck, rigidity in the trunk, this is called axial rigidity. This is atypical Parkinson. And yes, addition to this, if you see a patient having ocular problems, you're dealing with PSP. Okay, Parkinsonism plus ocular problem, PSP. Parkinsonism plus autonomic dysfunction within a year, that is shared dragger syndrome. Okay, Parkinsonism plus the patient having cortical dysfunction very early, this is also going towards CBD. So look at the total picture in the question and then make a decision whether you're dealing with Parkinson, you're dealing with atypical Parkinson. And in that also, if look whether they're giving asymmetrical or symmetrical, both sides hypokinesia is equal, that is going towards atypical Parkinson. Okay, asymmetricity goes towards Parkinson, remember that. So if you see asymmetric, two possibilities, either it is Parkinson or it is CBD. Parkinson responds to dopamine, CBD does not respond to dopamine. Okay, that's the way how you differentiate. Okay, in MSA, what did I say about orthostatic hypotension? MSA, orthostatic hypotension occurs very early. See, Parkinson also can develop orthostatic hypotension after 10 years. This occurs within a year. Okay, Scheidt-Dracker syndrome, hallmark finding is Parkinsonism that is symmetric. What is Parkinsonism? Rigidity and hypokinesia plus severe orthostatic hypotension very early in the disease. That combination will tell you that you're dealing with Scheidt-Dracker syndrome. They may tell you poor response to dopamine, additional bonus for us. Yes, that is also Scheidt-Dracker syndrome. Okay, Avinash is asking, is um, hemicrania going to respond to endomethacin? Yes. Endomethacin is the one drug that works in this patient. We give a trial of triptan sometimes because we think it's cluster. Cluster is common. If you give triptan, doesn't work. The next drug, we try endomethacin. When you give a trial of endomethacin and the patient's headache comes down, then you can say by the treatment itself, that endomethacin responsive headache itself, we come to know that this patient has paroxysmal hemicrania or hemicranial headache. Okay, so one of the ways to diagnose hemicranial headache is how? Give endomethacin if it responds, it is hemicranial headache. So if you look at Alzheimer's disease, uh, this is now dementia. So if you're looking at the dementia, uh, Alzheimer's is by far the most common irreversible dementia. So the four A's we talk about are amnesia, apraxia, aphasia, and agnosia. Okay, amnesia, apraxia, aphasia, and agnosia. Earliest feature and most important in most patients is amnesia. Dominating picture is memory problem. Episodic memory loss. Remember, their factual memory is intact. You ask them how many grams make on kg, they can tell. Tell me the days of a month or I mean weeks of a, the, the names of the months in a year, he'll tell. His memory in factual stuff is intact. But he cannot remember what, hap what he ate in the morning, who came to visit him yesterday. So it's called episodic memory loss. They have normal motor power, but they cannot perform normal activity. Learned skills are gone. That is apraxia. Okay, aphasia, agnosia. Aphasia is speech problems. Okay, agnosia, actually not that classical, but um, you get visual agnosia here. And what is this visual agnosia is they not only can't recognize people, but they can't recognize objects. And they'll have navigational problems. Okay, so navigational problems are basically controlled by the occipital parietal and occipital temporal circuits. And temporal parietal both are affected in Alzheimer. Anyway, we can't go to the conceptual description now, but just understand if they talk about dementia with memory getting affected, dominantly it is Alzheimer's. If you see a question and you're not able to understand what a picture is, they're describing multiple things, long question, dementia question, you can't figure out really what dementia it is. My advice is take a guess, it's, it's Alzheimer's. By frequency also Alzheimer's is very common and ultimately, you know, it will it will end up with multiple problems will be there in Alzheimer's. Multiple lobes of the brain are affected. So so most of the time if in practice also if you can understand, if you if you think it's Alzheimer's, it'll work up to be Alzheimer only. So as far as Alzheimer's is concerned, um, one of the things they have asked in the exam is ki in the CSF 
what happens to tau protein and what happens to the amyloid okay tau and amyloid and generally people think you know this is an, it's a beta amyloid accumulation so the csf amyloid should be high but the problem is the tau is increased the amyloid is decreased in the csf and this is because the soluble amyloid is what we check in the csf and all the amyloid got precipitated in the brain because pres amyloid got precipitated in the brain the soluble amyloid is going to decrease okay soluble amyloid decrease tau increase that combination if you seeing in the csf that is going towards alzheimer's okay tau increase amyloid decrease it is going towards the diagnosis of alzheimer's sorry now lewy body dementia has got main core features so what are the core features if they ask you you're looking at visual hallucination REM abnormality what is REM abnormality see normally in REM the motor tone should be suppressed but the patient in the night when he sleeps and the motor tone REM motor tone should be suppressed right if the motor tone is not suppressed in his dream whatever he is seeing he is doing it gets enacted in the dream he is walking and running he is, he does it in the sleep because the motor tone is not suppressed that's that's called REM abnormality very classical of lewy body can occur in parkinson's also but very classical of lewy body occurs very early then you have delirium this is not a constant delirium episodic suddenly they are confused where they are who what is happening and then we'll have parkinsonism now these four things are what we call core features in one exam they had asked ki all the following are core except and one choice was capgras be careful capgras is not a core feature the core features of lewy body are hallucinations rem abnormality fluctuating sensorium that is episodes of delirium and parkinsonism these four things that are underlined are core features of lewy body now you can see capgras syndrome you can see increased sensitivity to antipsychotics you can see autonomic dysfunction all these are there but you know what the mcq is what is not affected in lewy body the answer is memory not affected okay what is not affected memory is not affected that's a repeat question that have been asking in the exam remember like all of us benign forgetfulness can occur here also you give a clue the patient will answer here how, in alzheimer's how much of a clues you give they that will not work but here the patient does does respond to your clue means memory generally is spared now we look at fronto temporal dementia remember this is a restricted zone means frontal and temporal only that is affected what is not affected occipital not affected parietal not affected so fronto temporal area affected remember ftd divided into two it's called behavioral type of ftd and it is called aphasic type of ftd okay behavioral type and aphasic type most common is behavioral type Okay, the most common type of FFD for frontotemporal dementia is behavioral type. The aphasic type is rare. Okay, progressive aphasia can occur in these patients. That's rare. What's common is behavioral type. Now, the hallmark thing that they'll describe in this patient is apathy. What is apathy? Is okay, this person does not have sympathy, love, attraction, empathy, whatever the attachment that is there with his with his uh, family members, with his friends. That's gone. He starts behaving like stranger, and is kind of unconcerned with everybody around him. that's a dominating picture they describe in the earliest feature in patients with fpd okay that is called apathy now they may have um, denial of impairment whatever impairment they have they deny it they feel they are normal the patient start developing new onset obsessive but this obsession is to eating so they develop an obsessive problem but it is generally the obsession to eating disorder okay it's an obsessing eating obsessive eating disorder so that is what is called hyperphagia hypersexuality hyperorality these things can occur but what do they describe in our question they'll talk about somebody having apathy he become distant and cool and aloof to his relatives he does have denial for whatever his defects are he may have an eating uh, you know obsession hypersexuality hyperorality can occur loss of inhibition whatever he thinks he blurts it out he see somebody is fat he says kitna mota hai so that is all features you will see in fkd now the repeat question in our exam is ki what is paired don't forget occipital and the parietal not affected fronto temporal disease occipital parietal spared that's why drawing is is totally normal in this patient they can copy complex diagrams without any problem okay drawing is spared so amygdala actually see we talk about something called chlorobusi syndrome that's a totally different thing some things overlap between chlorobusi and this but this is basically we're talking about strictly related to tem temporal and frontal is a cortical problem okay cortical defect that we are talking about in fkd so repeat about fkd once again behavioral most common aphasic is rare progressive aphasia can occur rare what is the main thing they describe in behavior the patient become distant and you know aloof doesn't have any attachment to family members 
What are the other things they'll describe? Hyperorality, hyperphagia, hypersexuality. And what is sped? I'll ask you. Drawing is sped. Drawing is sped because the patient's parietal and occipital are not affected. That's the reason why drawing is normal. See, CJD, if you see, Crutzville Ekop disease is a prion disease. So, yes, FDD is also called PICS disease, correct. So, CJD is a prion disease. The problem is the cytoplasmic protein PRPC converts to PRPSC. Okay, this PRPC is alpha helical, but PRPSC is beta helical. And the body doesn't know how to cut it and clear it. That accumulates and accumulation of this protein hampers the functioning of the cell. Patho will show spongiform encephalopathy and fibrosis but the important point in patho the mcq is there is no inflammation if there is no inflammation you see fibrosis and you see encephalopathy but the clinical features basically all cortical functions will go okay initially looks like some hyper anxious person with weight loss but slowly behavioral problems hallucination depression all cortical functions will go and the patient will become in a state of stupor we can't call it coma because the patient's eyes are open he is responding to pain we call it stupor and this is called akinetic mutism okay there is a kind of stupor but the hallmark of this condition is myoclonic jerk occurring in more than 90%. The EG is not seen in all patients, but is periodic biphasic waves you see or triphasic waves you see. Um, in generalized means bilateral, periodic is one per second, triphasic waves, that's classically seen, but not seen in all patients, however. But the more important for us is MR. MR will start showing cortical ribboning. There is something called variant CJD. In that variant CGD, you see the palunar sign, which is the palunar nucleus of thalamus becoming bright. In the CSF, you will see the protein 14.3.3 is increased. This is a protein and the cell count is normal. So there's another kind of, um, you know, dissociation you're seeing. Protein is high. Cell count is normal. It's not an infection, don't forget. There's no treatment for CGD, obviously. But they do sometimes give you the main clue, obviously, is the myoclonic jerks. Okay, a patient having some cortical dysfunction, myoclonic jerk are present. That combination should alert you. Patient just jumped out of the chair. Somebody just give a clap and the patient got startled. That That is very classical. This is going towards myoclonic jerks. So these are all the things you should know as far as CJD is concerned. Now moving to ALS. Um, this amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and... Uh, Okay, 14.3, 14.3.3, that's the name of the protein seen in the CSF, okay, in patients with CJD. It's not specific to CJD, it can occur in other cases, but it's one of the clues in the MCQ to go towards CJD. Triphasic waves are not just specific for CJD, they can occur in metabolic, absolutely right. Okay, metabolic encephalopathy also can have periodic triphasic waves, that's why EG is not the main thing that we focus on. Okay, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is also called as log Herrick's disease. Now, this and the GBS sometimes are confused in the exam. GBS is bilateral symmetric. Okay, GBS is bilateral symmetric motor weakness. ALS is asymmetric. Remember this word, asymmetricity. Asymmetric weakness, if you're getting, that is going towards ALS. Okay, somebody nicely asked about NPH. I think NPH is important, so I'll just tell you a few points about NPH. This is normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, this is one of the type of dementia, normal pressure hydrocephalus. The name itself is telling normal pressure hydrocephalus means the CTMR will show enlarged ventricles. The triad that we talk about here is dementia, ataxia, urinary incontinence. Okay, urinary incontinence. So the main way how you diagnose this patient is they come with a peculiar gait called magnetic gait. Okay, don't, they don't freely lift their legs and walk. They drag their feet as if a strong magnet is pulling the legs. It's called magnetic gait. Okay, so magnetic gait, dementia, ataxia, urinary incontinence. Usually the patient is going to be a little older patient. That combination will tell you that this is going towards normal pressure hydrocephalus. What's the treatment? The treatment is uh, repeat CSF taps. Actually, CSF, if you remove the ventricles, come back to normal size. So this is one of the reversible dementias. Okay, this is one of the reversible dementias. Absolutely right. The mnemonic, you remember correctly. This is uh, wacky, wobbly, wet. Okay, that's the mnemonic to remember. You're right. Wacky, wobbly, wet. Okay, wet is incontinence. Wobbly is ataxia. Wacky is dementia. So the treatment is a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. 
the ventricular peritoneal shunt is going to remove the CSF whenever you want it and the dementia gets reversed. So one of the reversible causes of dementia, NPH. So I was telling you ALS Okay, ALS uh, is asymmetric weakness, it's motor weakness, but what are the questions they ask you over here? The questions they'll ask you are extraocular muscles are not. See, the cortex controlling the cranial nerve nuclei and controlling the anterior cells, the cortical neurons itself are dying. So cranial nerve supply also can go and the anterior cell supply also can go. So you can see patients having cranial nerve problems, but it does not affect the cranial nerves that control the eye, meaning the extraocular muscles are spared. Bladder is not affected. Sensory, don't forget, is a motor neuron disease. Sensory system totally normal. The CSF is normal. This patient generally IQ is normal. Don't forget Stephen Hawking um, developing this disease. So intellectual functions are normal, except about 20% of these patients are associated with frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia when is there, then you have you know intellectual problems. But other than that, these people are generally normal. So. What the main clues are, you get both UM and LMN findings in these patients, mixed UM and LMN, so you do see spasticity also, and you also see these patients having uh, fasciculation, wasting, which are LMN findings. So you do see mixed UM and LMN, asymmetric weakness is the main thing, spreading over months. Remember, symmetric weakness over hours to days, that is GBS. Okay, flaccid symmetric weakness within a few hours to days, that is GBS. If you see asymmetrical weakness, that is going towards ALS okay generally it is bilateral but it will be asymmetric in nature and one of the hallmark findings is fasciculations of the tongue this fasciculations they mentioned now there's a major point in our exams to tell you this is going towards motor neuron disease okay this is MND so in patients with MND um, the treatment wise two important drugs you should know one is the riluzole which decreases the glutamate toxicity and the other is either a one Okay, Reluzole and either one, these two important drugs that may slow the progression of patients with ALS. Now, you have a pure LMN problem, lower motor neuron disease, and that is called SMA. It's also sometimes progressing to become spinobulbar muscular atrophy. It may involve the brainstem. In that, you have infantile type and adult type and all that, but um, you should know Wernick Hoffman's disease is important. It's a pure LMN disease. Typically, Wernick Hoffman is um, childhood infantile type. So these children start developing progressive weakness and wasting. Pure LMN, you can see absent reflexes, progressive hypotonia. Important point to remember, IQ not affected. Okay, they don't have any problems in the IQ. Just motor, pure motor, no sensory, nothing else. IQ affected. I mean, um, uh, IQ is normal. Why I'm saying this is one of the exams they said hypotonia with mental retardation. And there they had given SMA, they had also given Down syndrome. The answer there was Downs. Okay, why Downs? Because IQ is affected in Downs, not in patients with MND. MND, you can see SMA can come with hypotonia, but IQ is normal. Correct, floppy baby is what you're looking at. The treatment is uh, nusinorosin, but what's interesting is this gene therapy. And this um, is curative uh, on a Simno gene. Uh, the only problem is, is cost is crossing around 14, 16 crores in India. Uh, it's covered by patent for the next so many years still. So that's the biggest issue. This is the most expensive treatment available in the world right, right now on SMN gene. Uh, but it is curative. Okay, nusinorosin is just going to slow the progression. So gene therapy is the main thing for us and that is on SMN gene. When it comes to spinal cord problems, um, mainly you should see what patterns are there. What is, you know, which area is affected. When looking at a patient with Posterior columns, see posterior columns are conducting joint position, vibration, fine touch. Then you have the lateral spinothalamic tract, which is pain and temperature, which is basically the one tract that is crossed information, it picks up information from the opposite side. So these are some basics which I'm sure you have covered in the anatomy classes. Now what is affected if you see purely posterior columns affected, that is classical of tapes or salis in our MCQs. If you see a patient having posterior column signs plus the patient has corticospinal tract signs, means the patient has got posterior column, joint position, vibration, fine touch, plus the patient has bilateral UMN weakness. That combination is called subacute combined degeneration. Okay, this combined now, this and this together, this subacute combined degeneration. When looking at subacute combined degeneration, motor plus posterior together, 
you're seeing and that is typically either HIV or B12 deficiency, nitrous oxide or copper deficiency. These are your differentials for subacute combined degeneration. Anterior two-third of spinal cord affected the anterior spinal artery infarction. Central cavity that is expanding that is syringomyelia. Okay, central cavity expanding that is syringomyelia. Now syringomyelia is one of the hot favorites. It is most commonly located in the cervical cord. It is going to come with dissociative anesthesia because the syrinx does not compress the posterior column. The posterior columns have thick myelin and they protect. The thick myelin does not allow the compression of them. So it extends anteriorly. So it affects the pain and temperature but touch is normal. Touch and posterior columns are normal. It's called dissociative anesthesia. This typically occurs in a cape-like distribution, nape of the neck, upper part of the body and shoulders. That's where the problem is. So pain and temperature, they come with burns, but you check with cotton, it's normal. Okay, touch is normal. So sometimes this is accompanied by Chiari malformation, syringomyelia. brown Sicard syndrome is half of spinal cord affected. So you know the tracks in the spinal cord that don't cross, posterior columns don't cross, so joint position, vibration gone, same side. Weakness, corticospinal tract don't cross. Remember spinothalamic tract picks up opposite information, so pain and temperature loss occurs contralaterally. Okay, this is brown Sicard syndrome. Some students unnecessarily complicate themselves by finding out what happens at the level of lesion, below lesion. They have not asked that ever till now. Don't, um, you know, um, bother about things that they have not asked up till now. Okay, don't, don't bother about it at all. Beaver sign is something that we look at in patients' anterior spinal artery. This is because anterior spinal artery is um, supplied by many tributaries along the iota. Although anterior spinal artery originates high up, but it's supplied by many branches coming from the iota. The adam kivix artery is typically affected, which results in a lesion somewhere around T10. And uh, when you ask the patient to put their hands and raise their head, the umbilicus should stay where it is. But if it gets pulled up, it indicates that the patient has got a lesion somewhere around T10, T11. And that's what you typically see in anterior spinal artery infarction. Okay, it's a artery of adam kivix. That's where the lesion typically occurs. So if you look at the brainstem, brainstem, you're looking at lateral mildery syndrome. Um, lateral mildery syndrome, basically all the things that are starting with the alphabet S, you're seeing sensory fine tracts mainly. So spinocerebellar, sympathetic, spinothalamic, sensory tract of fifth, they all get affected. Additionally, lateral mildery syndrome, vestibular nuclei, so you'll see vertigo and dysphagia, vertigo and uh, nausea, sorry. Nucleus ambiguous gets affected, so dysphagia, dysarthria. And I have seen some people getting confused because some platforms are giving wrong answer. I don't know where, where the confusion is coming from. Either way, be careful. Vertebral artery definitely is more common than PICA. It's called PICA syndrome. It's called PICA syndrome. But the most common artery without any confusion is vertebral artery is more common than PICA when it comes to lateral mildery syndrome. Middle mildery syndrome is uh, alphabet starting with M, so that makes it easy. It's middle meniscus, MLF, and motor pathways. And again, here also the most common artery is vertebral artery, more than anterior spinal artery. In the pons, we have two major syndromes, Millard, Gubler, and Fovile. Both affect the motor, both affect seventh nerve. Difference is this affects sixth nerve. This is a horizontal center problem resulting in gaze paralysis, meaning you'll, you'll not be abduct one eye and abduct the opposite eye. So the patient will not have diplopia here because he can't move both eyes. Whereas diplopia is a feature of Millard, Gubler. Okay, that's the difference between Millard, Gubler, and Fovile's. So if you look at uh, midbrain, um, I think this is the most important one that they keep asking repeatedly in our exam, midbrain. For that, if you know the midbrain image, I think that makes it easy for you. If you see a cerebral peduncle lesion, then main thing what you see is motor problem. So you'll see the patient having hemiplegia. The patient is going to have third nerve palsy, ipsilateral third nerve palsy, substantia nigra, this substantia nigra affected. So you do see patient having contralateral Parkinsonism. So if you see these features, this is all Weber syndrome. Okay, if the lesion occurs here, you're looking at Weber syndrome. If the lesion occurs in the mid over here, you're talking about Benedict syndrome. Okay, this is Benedict syndrome. Now Benedict syndrome, again third nerve palsy, all these come with third nerve palsy. So third nerve palsy is there, third nerve palsy, red nucleus affected, so patient is going to have movement abnormalities, contralateral movement abnormalities. Okay, medial lemniscus is very commonly affected that will result in proprioception problems contralater contralaterally. So these three main things if we're giving you an MCQ, you're talking about Benedict's. Okay, tegmentum, it's a tegmentum lesion. Remember, brainstem, midbrain is divided posterior to anterior, tectum, tegmentum, and cerebral peduncle. So obviously our legendary doctor uh, 
Ashwini would have covered the anatomy in detail for you for the midbrain. But I'm just summarizing it for you over here. Anterior cerebral peduncle problem that cerebral, remember not cerebellar, cerebral peduncle is basis and that is Weber syndrome. The tegmentum lesions are many. One is Benedict. Benedict is third nerve palsy, red nucleus lesion and um, middle lemniscus. So proprioception problems will be there. A little behind this area, you will see a lesion occurring in this zone and these are fibers that are connecting the cerebellum to the red nucleus and this results in North Nagel syndrome. So just to summarize over here, Weber's is going to be a cerebral peduncle problem, posterior cerebral artery lesion, motor affected, third nerve palsy occurs, substantia nigra, so patient have Parkinsonism, and since corticobulbar tracts are affected, and uh, you know many nerves, cranial nerves have bilateral representation, the ones that don't have get affected, so you do see 12th nerve and 7th nerve getting affected below the lesion. So this is all Weber syndrome. Remember, uh, Weber's Benedict and North Nagel has been asked. Particularly Weber is hot favorite in NEAT, not so much in um, INICT. For some reason, NEAT loves to ask Weber syndrome. Every Almost every alternative year, you will see questions on Weber. So I think this is something that you should not get wrong. In one of the exams, they said instead of cerebral peduncle, they had given cerebellar peduncle. That was wrong. So it's a cerebral peduncle lesion. Benedict is red nucleus. It's a tegmentum lesion. So red nucleus, movement abnormality, third nerve gone, middle lemniscus gone. That's Benedict. North Nagel is third nerve palsy with contralateral cerebellar ataxia. And if you get both North Nagel and Benedict combined features, that's called Claude syndrome. Okay, Claude's is nothing but Benedict and North Nagel combined features. So I think ultimately the topic that we are expecting questions, um, highly anticipating questions this year also is, uh, is uh, stroke. And the reason why stroke is changing is because of so much uh, advances and the new uh, Harrison also has made big modification. So when you see a patient coming with stroke, the first thing that we are going to get a, get done is a non-contrast CT and the blood glucose levels. Okay, get the blood glucose levels done, non-contrast CT. So if I just have to summarize, you have a patient who's coming with stroke, get the non-contrast CT and get the blood glucose checked. Now you do send the blood for other investigations, you don't have to wait for the report. But what we bother about on these two things, CT and blood glucose. Glucose should not be extremes, hypoglycemia, mimic should not be there. And uh, non-contrast CT should rule out hemorrhage for us. It should rule out massive edema. Okay, edema in more than one third of MCA territory is a contraindication for thrombolytics. So edema in more than one third of MCA territory should not be there. Hemorrhage should not be there. This should, thing should be ruled out. The next we focus on is blood pressure. The blood pressure is to be brought down to below 185 by 110. If it's high, you have to give antihypertensives. Only after this, the patient is eligible for thrombolytic therapy. From onset of stroke till thrombolytic therapy, the duration should be less than four and a half hours. Up to three hours, the benefit is supposed to be very high. Between three to four and a half, also they're showing benefit. So up to four and a half hours, that means thrombolytics are allowed. Alteplase was the only one allowed earlier. Now tenecteplase also has been allowed. Okay, so tenecteplase also is okay. Stroke till thrombolytic duration should be. Remember, it's not when patient entered the hospital. It's from onset of stroke till thrombolytic. The duration should be less than four and a half hours. Now, once you have uh, given a thrombolytic therapy, the patient should be immediately rushed to get a CT angio done. And up to six hours, up to six hours from onset of stroke, CT and Joe, if it shows large vessel occlusion, the patient should go for a mechanical thrombectomy. This is you're putting a catheter and pulling the clot out. Okay, large vessel, obviously small branch of a branch of a branch, small branch somewhere inside. You can't put a catheter then pull out the clot. It should be proximal vessel affected. That large vessel occlusion, if it's there, you're doing a mechanical thrombectomy. You're putting a stent and pulling the clot out. If the patient comes after six hours, up to 24 hours, then you have to do not only CT angio but CT perfusion study. You can also do MR angio, MR perfusion study. If you find that it shows a large vessel occlusion, if it shows there is a mismatch between perfused area and infarcted area, both should be present. If both are present, then the patient goes for mechanical thrombectomy. If none of these are there, then you're going to go for conservative management, which includes aspirin and conservative evaluation, anti-edema measures, head elevation at 30 degree position, bowel care, you know, so nasogastric tube, just the care of the patient is what you're focusing on. That's conservative management. So to summarize once again, patient came with stroke, NHS is score more than five, significant stroke that is, non-contrast CT, rules out hemorrhage, massive edema, Blood glucose is not extreme. That is a candidate for thrombolytic. Before giving thrombolytic, check the BP. It should be below 185 by 110. 
get it down by using lebetalol generally that's what we do in our country so get the bp down give thrombolytic therapy after thrombolytic is not the end of the story even despite getting thrombolytic patient should be again going for ct angio so ct angio if it shows large, up to 6 hours ct angio is enough if it shows large vessel occlusion put a stent and pull out the clot don't leave the stent behind stent is only to pull the clot out so that is mechanical thrombectomy if the patient has come after 6 hours between 6 hours and 24 hours not only should you show large vessel occlusion you should show mismatch between perfused and infected zone and then only mechanical thrombectomy should be done the same thing is what i'm showing you here so you can see patient came with stroke if the patient has come within four and a half hours and the patient eligible for thrombolytic go for thrombolytic therapy after thrombolytic go for ct angio if the patient is coming between four and a half hours and 24 hours ct angio has to be done directly and if it shows large vessel occlusion then you have to see if the patient is below six hours mismatch is not required just large vessel occlusion is enough patient is coming after 6 hours between 6 to 24 not only should it be large vessel you should also show that there is a mismatch between infected and perfused area if the patient is eligible for that then only mechanical thrombectomy is done okay patient is coming with hemorrhagic stroke the only thing important thing about hemorrhagic stroke is get the bp down to 140 okay that is the important thing don't forget we don't try to normalize blood pressure in ischemic stroke but in hemorrhagic stroke, the higher the pressure, more blood will lose out. So try to get the BP down and that, that is the main thing that they'll ask you as far as hemorrhagic stroke is concerned. This is Harrison this year. Okay, there's a new addition Harrison that is last year. Um, patient comes with stroke, less than 6 hours. If the CT does not show hemorrhage, patient is eligible for thrombolytic. Remember thrombolytic eligibility, I'll show you in a second. There it is less than 4.5 hours. So if the patient is eligible for thrombolytic, go for thrombolytic. If not, you can do CT angio. CT angio shows proximal vessel blockage, go for mechanical thrombectomy. Patient already coming after 6 hours, then you should not only get CT angio but CT perfusion also done. Favorable perfusion, then only patient should go for mechanical thrombectomy. Now you might see one of the areas that they are asking questions in our exam is what are the indications and contraindications thrombolytic? Now you do have um, stroke diagnosis fine, age should be above 18 fine. Although these are contraindications, that, but they put it over here. Okay, it should be less than four and a half hours year, four and a half hours from onset. The CT should not show hemorrhage, should not show massive edema. So all these things should be fulfilled. Then only you're going to give thrombolytic. Now you might see sustained hypertension, but this is despite treatment. With treatment, you can get it down. That's an indication. Okay, despite treatment, you can't get the BP down. It's a contraindication. So patient has a major bleeding abnormality, or the patient has a um, head injury. Sometimes, you know, patients will have a hemorrhage also along with some, some thrombosis. So that kind of mixed picture, you can't. Patient having some kind of generalized, um, you know, status epilepticus, you can't. Major surgery in last two weeks. Major GI bleeding in last three weeks. Recent MI. You know, recent MI, the problem was, ki recent means how recent. Earlier, we used to say three months, they got it down to one month now. Okay, if one month after MI, up till one month also, uh, I mean, after one month, you can you can give up to one month after MI, you cannot. Because then if you give thrombolytic, it's going to break the fibrous tissue and it can convert it into a tamponade. So these are some of the things that you should know when it comes to stroke. I would I would definitely recommend you to, is there in the PDF that I've given? These are Harrison table and definitely um, they will ask you questions in this in this zone. Okay, permissive hypertension is if you're not planning to give thrombolytic therapy, you can keep the BP high. Don't have to correct the BP unless it crosses 220 by 120. Okay, it's not 110, it's 120. Okay, 220 by 120, that's a, that's a BP. If you're not planning to give thrombolytic, don't correct the blood pressure. Infections vaccine, including COVID vaccine is there now in this list. So, but the most important is influenza vaccine. Um, but even code vaccine is listed. So what are the core features? What are the major features of GBS? Okay, it's not stuck. I can clearly see my you know, output here. So if you're looking at the core features, this is symmetric weakness that starts usually the lower limb. It may not be only lower limb. It can be all four limbs together. It's possible, but it should be symmetric. That's the main thing. If you see asymmetric weakness, you're not looking at GBS. Okay, it should be symmetric weakness. Obviously, it's element, so you will not see reflexes, means DTRs will be absent. Supporting features are 
it should not be a prolonged it's a monophasic disease from few hours to 28 days it should reach the peak it can't be like mnd which are go, goes on occurring over re- months it's not like that okay it is going to touch peak in 4 weeks be careful some students think the patient will recover in 4 weeks gps sometimes takes 1 year 1 and a half years to recover it touches the peak within 4 weeks that's the point that they're trying to tell okay progression is from days to 4 weeks it should be symmetric weak- weakness sensory problems can occur don't forget peripheral nerve demyelination is not only motor sensory also can occur okay so peripheral sensory problems can definitely occur in fact many patients with gbs comes with sensory problem okay i'll start with gbs again gbs remember aidp is the most common this is aman amsan they don't ask in our exam miller fisher is called descending gbs the descending gbs is three things ataxia of thalmoplegia and areflexia which is nothing but element type of weakness areflexia what are the triggers if they ask you it's basically infections campylobacter will come with diarrhea viral infection nowadays are very common vaccines are common vaccines influenza have written but even covid vaccine they are reporting now can trigger gbs what are the main features it is symmetric weakness remember asymmetric weakness over months that's mnd symmetric weakness within hours to few days that is gbs it has to be lmn so it is areflexia yes you can have some because of encephalitis and all there are complications that are there in gps that can present with some human findings but usually gps the one they given our exams will be element type so they'll tell you progressive weakness areflexia the supporting features are that the patient develops maximum weakness within 4 weeks okay it doesn't cross 4 weeks within 4 weeks he'll touch the maximum patient will be relatively symmetric features as i told you many patients will have paresthesias so some students have this wrong idea ki gbs will not have sensory definitely gbs can have sensory findings bilateral seventh nerve palsy is very common okay bilateral seventh nerve palsy is very common you remember in the sensory examination also the tracks that carry joint position vibration are thickly malleated tracks because of the thickly malleated tracks carrying the you know per- uh, the the peripheral nerves reaching the spinal cord they are carrying joint position vibration are thickly malleated myelin is gone so generally you will see posterior column signs are common in this patient meaning joint position vibration can be affected in this patients particularly bilateral seventh nerve palsy is very common and when you have bilateral see one side seventh nerve the mouth gets pulled to one side both seventh nerve gone the patient's mouth will not be deviated so you have to actually see carefully sometimes in the mcq they'll tell you poor smile that's a clue to tell you it's bilateral seventh nerve palsy i don't think there's any problem because even i am seeing through a separate link i mean i think it's working perfectly i don't see any problem in my in my thing here it, otherwise even mine would have stopped okay autonomic dysfunction is uh, definitely a problem so dysautonomy are definitely occurs in this patients okay pain csf will show increase protein but normal cell count Okay, remember the cell count will be less than 50 so increase protein normal cell count and nerve conduction studies will show abnormality depending on what type of gbs it is if the patient has a uh, demyelinating pure demyelinating velocity affected amplitude normal and if the patient has got uh, uh, axon also affected then you'll see amplitude also will be affected now nerve conduction studies are not asked at your level but they are one of the important ways to diagnose gbs the most repeated question is ki in patients with gbs don't use steroids this is the most repeated question they ask in our exam don't use steroids you can use either immunoglobulin or plasma pheresis don't go for both either immunoglobulin or plasma pheresis not both at the same time okay not even in sequence no studies have shown benefit of using one after another definitely no role of steroids because the patient already had pre existing antibodies okay steroids be given can steroids be given definitely not that's the repeat question do not use steroids gbs is a condition where patient comes with pre existing antibodies steroids cannot do anything to the antibody the more time you give more antibodies will attach to myelin more demyelination will cause your only job is to pull out the antibody before they can attach to other myelin and damage them so that's the reason why we remove the antibodies by either neutralizing them by giving antibody against antibody or we remove them by using plasma pheresis steroids cannot do anything to already formed antibodies supportive treatment autonomic dysfunction here to treat dvt prophylaxis one of the main things is you keep checking the single breath count of the patient in one breath the patient can count up to 20 normally if the patient can't count up to 20 in a single breath his lung volumes have decreased 
and the way you confirm is vital capacity if the vital capacity is low that patient is going for ventilator support okay the patient needs mechanical ventilation force vital capacity if it's decreased that patient should be put on a ventilator so one of the things they'll ask in the exam is ki, how do you decide whether patient should be on ventilator or not what parameter is it um, is it a peak expiratory flow rate is it a fev1 what do you look at the answer is force vital capacity if it's low that patient is going on ventilator the screening is done by looking at single breath count Moving to multiple sclerosis, we looked at peripheral demyelination. Now we're looking at okay. Now we're looking at multiple sclerosis. So if you're looking at multiple sclerosis, this is a demyelination of the central nervous system. Okay, we saw patient having demyelination of peripheral nervous system (GPS). Now we're looking at central nervous system demyelination. McDonald's criteria is disseminated in space and disseminated in time. Okay, this is disseminated in space means multiple areas are affected. In cortical or juxtacortical, periventricular, spinal cord, and infratentorial area, out of four, at least two areas should be affected. Now, I have not seen the components of McDonald's last at your level, but simple idea you should know, ki you should have at least two areas separately affected across the brain and the spinal cord if you have to make a diagnosis of MS. Need not be, both should be manifest clinically. Let's say a patient comes with spinal cord signs, but the patient's MRI will show periventricular bands of sclerosis. That combination will tell you, okay, the patient has got multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis name itself is telling its multiple areas should be affected. You're right, Dawson finger sign is very, very common in patients in imaging. And that's very classical. It's bands of sclerosis perpendicular to ventricle, lateral ventricle. And that is a very much suggestive sign. That is what is called Dawson's finger sign. Okay, I'm sure Dr. Rajat would have shown that and would have, you know, discussed that. Uh, disseminated in time is different presentation, different times. So what are the main features of patients with MS? Remember that MS is between 20 and 50 years typically. If the MCQ is even less than 20, especially less than 15, though you can rule out MS. It should be between 20 and 50 years usually. Okay, above 50 unlikely, below 20 is unlikely. Main thing, these patients come with blurring of vision. Pain can occur. Fatigue can occur. Sensory findings, without sensory, don't diagnose MS. Okay, sensory generally will dominate the picture. So pins and needles sensation, paresthesias, Joint position, vibration can be affected. Patient can have MS hug. Hug is belt-like, band-like, squeezing sensation around the uh, waist as if the MS came and gave a tight hug. Hermit sign, Lermit sign is flexion of the neck will cause shock-like sensation. There's no insulation on the nerves. Remember, when they touch each other, they'll they'll short-circuit and that's why you're seeing shock-like sensation going on the spine. What else you'll see? A lot of ocular problems, obviously. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia is very much suggestive. MLF is thickly myelinated. So internuclear ophthalmoplegia can occur, trigeminal neuralgia can occur. Typically, you know how they'll give you MCQ, they'll tell you a patient now came with trigeminal neuralgia. Last year, the patient had weakness, which he recovered after some time. Now that is multiple areas affected that makes it multiple sclerosis. Okay, that makes it multiple sclerosis. Remember all the dementia features, cortical functions are affected, but they are last. They are not the dominating feature. Okay, you can have cortical problems, but they are last. Now, what are the poor prognostic markers of MS? Poor prognostic markers of MS are male gender. This was asked, I think, uh, one or two years back in INICT. I think not, not neat, but it was asked. So, male gender is poor prognosis. If the patient is old, means, you know, MS can occur between 20 and 50. But older the person, close to 50, let's say 35, 40 years, above 40, typically prognosis is more poor. Infratentorial involvement, cerebellum brainstem, poor prognosis, and early relapse is also poor. All these are bad prognostic markers. Now, acute treatment is steroids. Don't answer prophylactic treatment for acute. Acute management is steroids, not interferon or glitterum or something. Acute is steroids for the current problem. But before you give steroids, you should rule out Otoff's phenomena. What is Otoff's phenomena is, whenever the patient is exposed to warm temperature, the patient will worsen. That is a pre-existing old lesion. Old lesion, which is already demyelinated. That patient, whenever he got exposed to warm temperature, he will worsen. That is called Otoff's. So before you give steroids, it should not be an old lesion. Current new lesion, steroids will work. Okay, fresh demyelination, steroids will work. So give steroids. The rest of the treatment is preventive. Prevention, not current management, prevention. For prevention, you can give injections and oral drugs. Interferon beta, glatrimer. Okay, this is glatrimer acetate. Mitoxantrone, natalizumab. These are all injections. Fingolimod, siponimod. Dimethylfumarate, teriflunamide, okay, teriflunamide. 
okay teriflunamide all these are oral drugs now the new drugs that are there important ones are oselizumab anti cd20 alemtuzumab anti cd52 now why this um oselizumab is very important is we used to have a type of ms called primary progressive see the most common type of ms is lapsing remitting this primary progressive ms was very difficult to treat finally we have a breakthrough and that is oselizumab this oselizumab is showing very good response in primary progressive ms okay earlier we used to use interferon beta we can still use but oselizumab is very important drug in primary progressive ms okay this was asked in the exam already now relapsing remitting type of ms the typical ms that we see relapsing remitting type how do you start treatment typically in most patients we use dimethylfumarate unless the patient has got very mild disease and we don't want to use a strong drug safest drug we use in mild patients the safest drug is glatrimer okay monthly injections glatrimer is what we use for very mild disease most patients use dimethylfumarate if any patient despite treatment is still developing other episodes then the strong drug that we have is natlizumab highest efficacy is natlizumab problem with natlizumab is a dangerous complication called pml okay this is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy very classically described in natlizumab could occur in other drugs also but is very classically described in natlizumab okay pml and this is because of a virus called jc virus okay a jc virus that is supposed to be causing this dangerous complication finally you should know about neuromyelitis optica now neuromyelitis optica does have optic neuritis and can confuse you with ms but the difference is typically this is going to be bilateral but is usually you will find that um, ms comes with a unilateral optic neuritis is bilateral acute myelitis transverse myelitis is quite common involving more than 3 segments okay more than 3 segments generally uh, the spinal cord involvement is very small one segment or something in patients with ms here more than 3 segments will be affected area post trauma is affected and hiccups is a major clue that you will see in the mcq vomiting and hiccups if they tell you very much suggestive of neuromyelitis the patient could have narcolepsy they could have uh, you know other uh, mri findings and the most important is you might find antibodies against aquaporin 4 okay aquaporin 4 antibodies if they are there they are highly suggestive of patient neuromyelitis optica there is also something called uh, neuromyelitis optica without aquaporin 4 antibodies again that is got criteria but they don't ask in our exam what you should know in this is it mimics like ms differences are it's bilateral optic neuritis not unilateral myelitis in the spinal cord affects more than three segments hiccups if they mention very much suggestive area post trauma findings very much suggestive of neuromyelitis optica okay those are the main thing that you should remember when it comes to neuromyelitis optica so this is all the important thing that you should know as far as neurology is concerned so what we need to start now is um cardiomat okay myopathy is a congenital problem myositis is inflammation of muscle because of an autoimmune disease okay that is the difference between myositis and myopathy Okay, myopathy is generally a congenital covered in pediatrics. Myositis is polymyositis, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis. Difference is dermatomyositis will have skin problem. Inclusion body myositis differs by involving distal muscles along with proximal. That's the difference between inclusion body myositis and the other two. Okay, not much that I think that I have asked in the exam on that. Main point is that you should know you get antibodies in myositis. Okay, and CK levels are high, ESR is high. So if you're looking at the JVP, um, JVP basically you have the A wave that reflects the atrial contraction. When the atria contracts, you get the A wave. C wave is tricuspid bulge. But the question they asked in the exam was, "Ki C wave occurs when it occurs during isovolumetric contraction." Remember, ventricular systole starts over here, right? From here, from here, almost where not very clearly color pictured here. So I start from here actually, ventricular systole. and goes all the way till here this is all ventricular systole so when the ventricle goes into systole the initial part where you getting the c wave is isovolumetric contraction so they asked in the exam at what point does c wave occur it occurs during isovolumetric contraction v wave is venous filling of the blood of the ventricle okay venous collection of the blood in ventricle that is v wave x descent is atrial relaxation 
x dash is this x dash part you're getting is ventricular contraction pulling the atrial wall down and y descent is nothing but uh, tricuspid valve opening emptying of the atria this is early passive filling this diastole remember atria is also relaxing ventricle also relaxing this early diastolic filling of the ventricle which is passive filling as the tricuspid valve opens and the atria empties the blood in the ventricle the pressure will drop in the atria and that is the y descent so what they ask in an exam is causes of giant a wave and in all these you know all these things people learn but you know what they're asking only one pulmonary hypertension i don't know for some reason pulmonary hypertension students answer giant v wave so please be careful pulmonary hypertension is giant a wave okay, it has been repeatedly asked in the exam some reason why the people don't make mistake in ps and ms uh, ts but pulmonary hypertension i don't know why they get confused and answer giant v be careful it is giant a wave okay for pulmonary hypertension can a wave occurs when whenever atrial and ventricle are contracting simultaneously and that can happen in complete heart block vt and ectopic there is what we call av dissociation okay av dissociation they are the atrial and ventricle are beating independent of each other cv waves are nothing but the c wave merging with the v without an x dash in between and that happens in tricuspid regurgitation okay when ventricle contracts the atrial wall should be pulled down actually you should get x descent but instead of blood regurgitating in the atria you get cv waves so just remember tricuspid regurgitation in fact for giant waves also you can remember tricuspid regurgitation v wave is nothing but collection of blood in the atria if the blood came from the ventricle that is tr if the blood came from lung anomalous pulmonary vein then that is also going to cause giant v wave tricuspid regurgitation all these are asd all these can cause giant v waves rapid x and rapid y just remember the mnemonic pay tax pay tax means pay pericarditis comes with rapid y descent tamponade comes with rapid x descent okay constrictive pericarditis y descent and tamponade comes with x at this point you should understand that constrictive pericarditis actually will have a normal x descent and a deep y descent okay they'll have a normal x and a deep y this kind of looks like an alphabet m that's pericarditis but tamponade has a nice x descent but a subtle or absent y descent okay x descent is good but the y descent is almost gone that is cardiac tamponade so again to repeat tamponade comes with x descent rapid x descent pericarditis does come with rapid y but because x is normal it makes it look like an alphabet m okay that's the mnemonic pay tax so if you look at the ecg now important point is many students have the wrong idea they think p wave indicates the atrial contraction no p is current spreading in the atria the pr interval roughly indicates atrial contraction from the onset of qrs until the end of t this is ventricular systole roughly the qt interval reflects the ventricular systole in ventricular systole as we discussed the main feature you will see is x descent important point to remember is the v peaking the v peaks only after the t wave ends okay the peaking of the v wave remember should be after the t wave ends because v peaks in when the ventricular systole is over okay ventricular systole is over this is isovolumetric relaxation this isovolumetric relaxation phase the v continues to peak because the tricuspid valve is not yet opened it continues to receive the blood in the atria and the v continues to peak important point remember v peaks after the t wave finishes and when the ventricular is in diastole the y descent occur okay y descent is when atria and ventricle both are relaxing that's the time you get y descent during ventricular systole what do you get then during ventricular systole you should get x descent during ventricular diastole relaxation you should get a y descent this is the correlation between the ecg and the jvp if you get a rapid x descent hardly any y descent that's tamponade but if you get a normal x but a deep y descent making it look if you start from here you know it looks like an m if you start from here it looks like a w so it depends on where you start but m pattern or w pattern graph if you're getting that is constrictive pericarditis x descent is also there but the y descent is becoming very sharp normally the y descent is subtle x descent is the normal x this is this is not this much lesser what you can see in constrictive pericarditis the y became much more deeper normal x still there but this kind of looks like an alphabet m now okay that is constrictive pericarditis now hypertension they have asked in the exam for some reason i don't know why many platforms are answering hypertension questions based on the european guidelines or the international society guidelines in our exams whether it's inict or neat i would recommend answer based on indian guidelines so indian guidelines for hypertension are what we are following 
the indian guidelines suggest that stage 1 is 140 2 is 160 3 is 180 okay the stages of hypertension that indian guidelines are recommending okay 140 160 180 very easy 90 100 110 so either 140 or 90 remember it's not and or either this is more or this is more it comes classifies under that stage now what do the indian guidelines recommend the threshold for starting treatment is 140-90 in our, in our country. Okay, don't follow American. They follow very low level. Europeans follow very high level. We have to follow Indian guidelines. If the patient has coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease there, or heart failure is there, the cutoff is 130-80. Above this, you have to start treatment. Okay, to repeat once again, if the patient has got no heart ischemic heart disease or heart failure, 140-90. If ischemic heart disease heart failure is there, then 130-80 above this you have to start treatment. Antihypertensive drugs you have to start. Now, will you do lifestyle? Will you give, um, you know, uh, salt restriction? The answer is yes. Okay, salt restriction has to be done. Diet has to be done. That is there. But apart from the drugs, when you start is MCQ. And this is what we follow. Indian guidelines also recommend that below 60, go for AC inhibitors and ARBs. Above 60, calcium channel blockers and diuretics. Okay, above 60, CCBs and below 60 go for AC inhibitors and ARBs. Hypertensive crisis is 180, 120 but if the patient has got um, hypertensive urgency if you just say this patient is asymptomatic. An asymptomatic patient who is just having high BP the daily treatment is adjusted and the patient's BP comes down slowly over the next few days. Nothing that you have to do daily oral drugs but if the patient is on one drug you may add the other drug but that's all that you do for urgency. Hypertensive emergency patient has end organ damage and when endogen damage is there, depending on the problem, you're going to choose the drug. Now, this table is from current medical diagnosis and treatment. Very important, I would say, because when you have myocardial problem, the logic here is you can use drugs that are accompanied with beta blocker. You have to protect the heart, remember. And in a patient with ischemia, ST, STT changes in the ECG and hypertension. That's how they'll give you. Then make sure beta blocker is there to protect the heart. And you can use nitroglycerin, which is very good for the heart. It's a basic nitrate plus beta blocker combination, which is very good. You can also consider nicotapine, but these are what you want to use. But you would not want to use rapid arterial dilators that can cause reflex tachycardia and worsen the ischemia. So what drugs you don't use and what you use are MCQ. Just remember the rapid arterial dilators, not allowed. Arterial venous dilators, venous dilators, okay. But don't want to use these drugs in a patient with ischemic heart disease. In dissection of iota, remember, beta blocker is essential drug. Esmolol plus, esmolol plus, labetalol, esmolol, beta blocker is more important than nitroposide. That's an important point to remember. So, beta blocker plus nitroposide or calcium channel blocker is what you want to use. But beta blocker between all these is more important than anything else in dissection. Okay, again here we avoid the rapid arterial dilators like hydrolysine and all that. If the patient has acute pulmonary edema, only thing you have to add is beta blocker. Remember in heart failure, all heart failure patients, we use beta blockers. But in acute heart failure, acute decongested patient, that patient with acute pulmonary edema, we don't want to use beta blocker. We rather want the heart to pump the blood out and decongest the lung. We don't want the pulmonary edema to stay. If you slow the heart, the pulmonary edema will worsen. So don't use beta blocker in an acute heart failure. But other than that, in a chronic heart failure, remember, we'll always use beta blocker. Okay, but not in an acute patient with LV dysfunction. So what do you use in this patient then? Calcium channel blocker, nit nitrates, calcium channel blockers with diuretics to reduce pulmonary edema. But nit nitroglycerin generally is used along with one of the drugs. This is what we use in acute pulmonary edema. Any neuro problem, any neuro problem, don't use drugs starting with the word nitro. Nitroprusside, nitroglycerin not allowed because it will increase intracranial pressure. Okay, nitroprusside, nitroglycerin not allowed. They don't ask methyl dopa in our exam, clonidine they don't ask, but these nitro drugs are contraindicated in any neuro problem, okay, because they increase intracranial pressure. Okay, drug of choice for urgency, no, there's no drug of choice. You have to use whatever the daily oral drug patient is taking, continue that. If the patient is not compliant, make the patient compliant. If the patient is on one drug, you can add another drug. If he is on AC inhibitor, you can add calcium channel blocker. Okay, so you can add one or you can add two drugs. That's the basic thing, urgency, Oral drugs, normal daily drugs, nothing to be done. Patient need not be admitted. It's outpatient treatment. Okay, that's the point to remember for urgency. Moving to ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease can be stable or acute coronary syndrome. Okay, it can be stable or acute coronary syndrome. Stable ischemic heart disease is... Most important point to remember is chest pain is on exertion. 
Acute coronary syndrome and stable ischemic heart disease. One big difference is this patient is getting chest pain at rest. Okay, this is chest pain at rest. It's a major defining feature for us. Here the patient is getting chest pain only on exertion. And most of the time what happens is the moment he gets pain, he takes evasive action, he takes rest. And he takes rest, the pain comes down. That's the reason why it doesn't last for a long time. That's the main feature of stable ischemic heart disease, also called as angina pectoris. So patients with angina pectoris who are getting exertional pain, what do you do in the treatment? We use nitrates, we use beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, renalazine. Remember renalazine not allowed in acute coronary syndrome. Renalazine is never first drug, it's always add-on drug. Okay, but uh, nitrates, beta blocker, generally the mo most important drug for us is beta blocker because it will protect the heart from ischemic heart disease. Okay, it will protect the heart from ischemic heart disease. Imobradine is just an additional drug. It is going to reduce the heart rate. It acts on IF channels. And obviously, up till now, in, in patients with stable ischemic heart disease, plaque is not ruptured. It just become narrow. The lumen has become narrow. Okay, the lumen has become narrow. But platelets are not involved, clotting system not involved, just the lumen is narrow, on exertion, patient getting pain. That is what you're getting in stable ischemic heart disease. So in patients with stable ischemic heart disease, although the plaque is not ruptured as of now, but doesn't mean it can't rupture. It can rupture. So aspirin, risk reduction, statins, that's the main thing. Okay, Aspirin anywhere between 75 to 150 milligrams you can use. They're saying 81 is a tipping point where side effects are and the benefit is kind of, you know, benefit is more than the side effects. So, but then anything between 75 to 150 milligram per, per day is what we use. 150 is supposed to be better results than 75. Risk reduction, all risk factors should be reduced. Statins also can be given. So these are the things to remember for stable ischemic heart disease. Remember at this point, the plaque is not ruptured. The lumen has become narrow. If he exerts, the blood flow can't increase. That's why he's getting pain on exertion. That's the thing about stable ischemic heart disease. When we're looking at acute coronary syndrome, the plaque has ruptured. The platelets are getting stuck. The clotting system are in involved. So platelets are also involved. And the clotting system also got activated here. If it's a partial blockage that results in unstable angina and enstemy. And this scenario ends up with ST depression in the ECG. Both of them, unstable angina and enstemy, both will come with ST depression. But you might say ST depression can occur in stable ischemic heart disease also. The difference is this chest pain on exertion, this chest pain at rest. Okay, this is persistent chest pain at rest. If you get a troponin positive, that's enstemy, because infarction troponin will come out. If just unstable angina, troponin is negative. Either way, we don't wait for the troponin report. The moment the patient comes, we start the patient on this unstable angina and enstemy management is same. For both, the problem is clot that is forming. If the clot is forming, you stop it from forming. If it's formed STEMI, STEMI is complete occlusion of the vessel. In STEMI, complete occlusion, it's a formed clot. Formed, not forming, it's formed. The only thing now, break it. But when it is forming, you just have to stop it from forming. So how do you can how can you stop it from forming? You can use anticoagulation and antiplatelet. Some students wrongly told the most important treatment in unstable angina and enstemi is nitrates. No. The main thing is stop the clot from forming. How do you stop it from forming? Start anticoagulant, antiplatelet combination. So give anticoagulant drugs, give antiplatelet drugs. Antiplatelet, you can't use single antiplatelet. You use aspirin plus P2Y12 inhibitor. In the P2Y12 inhibitor, the best drug is ticagrel or prasugrel. Then comes the clopidogrel. Clopidogrel generally, um, you have to give loading dose and all. It doesn't work that fast, so we don't use it generally. Ticagrel or is the preferred one. Prasugrel is also good. Only problem is intracranial bleeding risk is higher in prasugrel. But these are the general preferred options. So what are the things that you do in a patient with unstable angina and enstemi? Both of them, same treatment. Don't have to wait for troponin. Just start the treatment immediately. Anticoagulant, antiplatelet, stop the clot from forming. Stop it from forming first. Cangrelor is later. Ticagrelor, prasugrel, you can put cangrelor in between. Then comes clopidogrel in the order that we choose in most of our patients. Okay, Generally, ticagrelor is the most preferred one. Then comes the role of nitrates, beta blockers, oxygen, statins, all these also we can use. But the priority is stop the clot from forming. You can have many scores are there, Timmy score, Gray score, Pursuit score, that will help us decide patient should go for procedure or not. In most of our patients nowadays, we are taking them for procedure. Only difference is how fast we take them for procedure. That's the only difference, early invasive or late invasive. Procedure generally is the answer. 
However, TME score we calculate and if it's more than three, patient should go for angio and it should go for a procedure. So this is the way how we manage unstable angina and anastomy. Remember, the primary treatment is stop the clot from forming. This is partial, partial blockage. That's the reason why it's ST depressed. So clot is forming and the body is trying to block it. It's tra trying to stop it, but you just have to support the body and stop it from forming. So it is forming, just stop it from forming. The body will open it up. Just most important thing, in a patient who's got ST depression, remember unstable angina and STEMI comes ST depression in the ECG, do not give thrombolytic therapy here. I'm repeating, unless ST segment elevation MI is there, do not give thrombolytic therapy in the exam. Okay, this is not a patient getting thrombolytic. Once you have a patient with STEMI, ST segment elevation will be there, troponin will be increased. This patient has got a transmural infarction. What do you do in the management? Most important thing is rest in aspirin. Aspirin you have to give 325 milligrams. Okay, in all these acute patients, remember unstable angina, NSTEMI and STEMI, aspirin is 325 milligram. Morphine is used, oxygen is used. The new guidelines suggest that in patients who have got normal saturation, giving oxygen might cause more free radical formation. So don't automatically answer oxygen for everybody. Generally, the benefit starts becoming manifest below 90, below 92% also we can give oxygen. Nitrates are used, beta blockers, generally oral beta blocker are used, not IV because it can precipitate heart failure or rather it can precipitate shock. Statins and heparin also, other options you can consider. But the most important if they ask you, the answer is rest and aspirin. Remember, nitrates will reduce the pain, symptomatic benefit, but they have not shown mortality benefit. Okay, the one that are really most important actually are rest and aspirin. Others also what we use in the treatment. Once the patient comes to us with STEMI, We've got two major options in the management. One is thrombolytic therapy and the other is primary PCI. Primary PCI is basically you are putting a catheter and putting a stent, you're opening the blockage and you're putting a stent. The default treatment in all patients is primary PCI. Okay, put a cath, put a stent, that's the default treatment. In what majburi will you do thrombolytic therapy? If you cannot do PCI, this is from the time the patient entered your hospital time starts, not like stroke where it starts from onset of stroke. When the patient comes to your hospital, if you think you cannot do PCI within two hours, that patient should get thrombolytic therapy. So that's the only limited group of patients who are getting thrombolytic. Our default treatment for everybody is primary PCI. If anticipated time, you think you can do PCI within two hours, they are going for PCI, that's superior treatment. Okay, they are going to go for PCI. This Harrison table, STEMI 2013 guidelines, Harrison is still putting the same table. When a patient with STEMI comes to a PCI capable hospital, and if you think you can do PCI within two hours, then the patient should go for primary PCI. If the patient came to a PCI non-capable hospital, can you transfer the patient to a PCI-capable hospital? If you can transfer, transfer the patient, and if they can the other hospital, if they can do the process within two hours, then that patient also should go for PCI. But when you're transferring the patient, let's say yours is a OBG setup, you have pharmacy, you have thrombolytic. Okay, see, most hospitals will have, even small nursing home will have pharmacies, and most pharmacies will have thrombolytic. What you don't have is catalyst facilities. So when the patient comes, your door in door out time should be less than 30 minutes. Your transfer time and the time spent in your hospital the whole time until they do PCI in the next hospital should be less than two hours. If that's the case, then the patient should go for PCI. If you think it will cross more than two hours to so transfer the patient to get a PCI in the other hospital, that patient should get thrombolytic therapy. Okay, that patient should get thrombolytic therapy. When you give thrombolytic, if the patient is not showing improvement, urgently transfer to PCI capable hospital and try to give thrombolytic, you know, PCI over there, try to do thromb PCI over there. What do you mean by improvement? Chest pain should come down, ECD should start normalizing. If that doesn't happen, this is a failed PCI, failed thrombolytic, urgent transfer should be done. If you give thrombolytic and patient improves, ECG is becoming better, pain is coming down, even then the recommending patient should be transferred to PCI capable hospital. NGO should be done between 3 to 24 hours. So I remember in one exam they said a patient had come to a hospital, thrombolytics were given. At the, after 16 hours after thrombolytics were given, patient came to your hospital, you have the tertiary setup, what you should do? The answer is the patient should go for PCI. Okay, the patient should go for NGO. So NGO has to be done. Based on NGO, we decide PCI to be done or not. So that means almost all patients are going to get an NGO by these guidelines. Okay, to repeat once again, patient came to PCI capable hospital, straight do a PCI. Patient came to non-capable non hospital, you can't transfer within two hours, go for thrombolytic. After thrombolytic, no improvement, urgent transfer. Improvement, 
transfer, but make sure PCI or NGO is done between 3 to 24 hours. So this is how we manage a patient with STEMI. Now, when it comes to the localization of what am I, so what thrombolytic is preferred, the, the, you know, the third, second generation, third generation ones are preferred. That means alter place is very important, telector place is very important. Telector place particularly, you can give very rapidly and generally is one of the, you know, best ones. The other ones like streptokinase and all, we tend to avoid because of the allergic problems. Okay, when looking at the um, ST elevation, remember that ST elevation, whenever it's concaving up like this, okay, like this, or if you're getting, all these are suggestive of myocardial infarction, okay, my muscle injury is what we're talking about. But if you're seeing an ST elevation that is coming like this, this is what we call concaving upwards. Whenever it's concaving upwards, or if it is concaving like this, and you can see, and it's starting from the baseline itself, and it's going up like this, this, don't be confused, this is early repolarization, benign early repolarization we talk about. Or if you see a smiley face, as some, some of you are correctly saying, if you can see a smiley face concaving upward, that is pericarditis. But if you see a sad face, that is basically myocardial infarction, it's concaving down, it's sad because they're leaving the world, but if they're concaving up, it's pericarditis is happy because you're not MI still. So, so this difference is, and the way we localize is, if you see ST elevation in 2-3 AVF, it's inferior wall MI. Anterior leads for us are V2-2, V4, that is anterior wall MI. The arteries are not asked so much in our exam, but you should know the localization. If V1-2, V4 is involved, then V1, V2 are septal, V3, V4 are anterior, so V1-2, V4 is anteroseptal. Lead 1 AVL, V5, V6 are lateral wall MI. Okay, any left bundle branch block is generally anterior, associated anterior wall because left bundle branch block typically supplied by the same blood cell LAD. Okay, remember that the SA node, AB node supply comes from right coronary, but the bundles are coming from left coronary. Okay, remember that SA node, AV node, right coronary, but the bundles are getting supply from the left coronary artery. LAD particularly is very important for the bundles. So V4 are right ventricle and uh, if you are doing the V9, V10, that, that is posterior wall MI or V1, V2 should show ST depression, that is all going posterior wall MI. So based on this, if you see, uh, here you can clearly make out that lead 2, 3 and AVF are showing ST elevation. The opposite leads are showing reciprocal ST depression, which is highly suggestive of inferior wall MI for us. You do have some lateral involvement, subtle lateral wall ST elevations also I can see. So some inferior lateral type of MI, inferior for sure is definitely there in this patient. Okay, this inferior wall MI. Inferior lateral if choice, that also you can answer. But if you're seeing the patient having um, lead 1, AVL having ST elevation, lead 3 showing a reciprocal ST depression, anterior leads V2, V3, V4 are showing ST elevation, lateral leads are also showing ST elevation, that makes it anterolateral wall MI. So anterior leads are there, V5, V6 are lateral leads. So lateral leads, anterior leads, both are involved. This is anterolateral wall MI. Okay, this ECG is nothing but anterolateral wall MI. Whereas what we saw here, this is classical inferior wall MI. They don't make it very complex for your level. They give basic, um, you know, simple myocardial infarction that are very straightforward. However, whenever you see uh, a positive deflection like this, this is what we call saddle shape estilivation. This is very much reassuring for us that this is nothing but pericarditis. Okay, so if you see ST elevations with this kind of a positive hook just before the ST elevation occurs, this is going against MI, this is basically pericarditis. Pericarditis, you'll also see the PR segment depression. You'll see this kind of concaving upward ST elevation. Reciprocal ST depressions, you'll not see except for AVR. And AVA, I would recommend not to bother about AVR because AVR is a kind of opposite lead for us but you don't see reciprocal ST depressions, you don't see, so what you see in pericarditis is, okay, in patients with pericarditis is, you'll see concaving upward ST elevations, no reciprocal ST depressions, except for AVR. You'll see PR segment depression, Okay, you'll see downsloping TP segment. 
all these are features that will tell you that you're dealing with pericarditis but the most important sometimes you know before you look at the ecg i remember that uh, one or two years back they asked a question in the exam and uh, that question was ki patient had chest pain and the patient's pain reduced on bending forward means the patient was sitting bent forward posture which is very classical for pericarditis the more you stress the pericardium the more the pain he arches back pain occur he bends forward the the pericardium relaxes the pain comes down so patient usually sits bent forward that given that in the in the history then they gave the ecg ecg was pericarditis but many students told me sir we felt very sad that that you know um they had given in the history itself bending forward pain decreases because if it was just ecg most of them would have got it wrong sometimes you know when you get a question correct in the mcq you get both happy and sad happy because you got it correct sad because everybody knows the answer okay you're not the only one and if i had just given ecg fine they made it easy by telling pain decreases meaning my point is when you see image based questions make sure you read the history because sometimes the history itself will make it easy for you as to what the diagnosis is Okay, moving to heart failure. This is another topic that they ask uh, in our exams. Now, heart failure ejection fraction less than forty percent is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Heart failure with more than fifty percent is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Some students have wrong idea. They think heart failure means ejection fraction must be low. You can get any ejection fraction, and based on that, we can classify reduced ejection fraction, mid preserved, mid range ejection fraction. Heart failure can occur with all three. Now, when you see a patient coming with left heart failure. any left heart failure pulmonary edema will be there when you have pulmonary edema the main features you will see dyspnea pnd orthopnea fatigue all these things can indicate to you patient has got left heart failure right heart failure when you get the patient will have raised jvp tender hepatomegaly pedal edema all these are right heart failure features so a combination of the two is what is listed here and all these features will tell you that the patient might be having heart failure so third heart sound is important this raised jvp um uh, in a patient who's got subtle um heart failure very initially you can see hepatic jugular reflux this reflux not reflex reflux is positive which is also called abdominal jugular reflux so all these are ways how you diagnose heart failure now they have not asked about heart failure diagnosis they most of the time give an x ray which makes it easy for you you will see the pulmonary edema and the large heart heart failure is not an issue where they ask you questions is how do you treat now the way we classify is stage a b c and d stage a only risk factors are there stage b structural disease there echo showing but patient is asymptomatic b is asymptomatic it's the c that we see in our hospital this patient has symptoms and the echo is showing structural abnormality d is refractory heart failure so what we see in the hospitals are these okay, usually most questions are on stage c heart failure particularly heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now what we use in this patients is one most important is arni arni is what it's nothing but valsartan angiotensin receptor blocker neprolysin inhibitor which is acubitral important problem to remember is acubitral can't be used with ac inhibitor okay both can cause angioedema so valsartan acubitral combination is what we use if you don't plan to use acubitral you can use ac inhibitor and beta blocker remember diuretic will reduce pulmonary edema but they have only symptomatic benefit no mortality benefit okay no mortality benefit was asked in one of the exams diuretics no mortality benefit they only reduce symptoms Hydrolysine nitrates do not work in Caucasians. White population doesn't work. Indians it works. Blacks it works. So hydrolysine sorbitrate combination we can use. Spironolactone is used only if the patient has a potassium less than five, creatinine less than two point five. Okay, so serum creat should be less than two point five, potassium should be less than five. Then we can use spironolactone. If a bradyne is an add-on drug, despite beta blocker, if heart rate is above seventy, we can use. What is the addition this year is they have added SGLT2 inhibitor regardless of diabetes. Even if diabetes is not there, SGLT2 inhibitor is now incorporated in the treatment for heart failure. Okay, they have potential MCQ. They can ask this. Okay, to repeat once again, the main drugs are Arni, SGLT2 inhibitors, spironolactone. In this order of efficacy, then comes the hydrolysine nitrate and the evaporidine. in the order of efficacy i'm telling you first arni is very very important beta blocker is very very important beta blocker has to be used for all patients okay except for acute heart failure decompensated patient so arni is used beta blocker is used then spironolactone is used these three are what we call level 1 recommendation sglt2 inhibitors have been added now to that level 1 recommendation so all these are level 1 recommendation doubt there's no doubt about their efficacy they're really working 
Then we add hydrolysine nitrate, this level 2 recommendation, means it shows some benefit. Diuretics are just symptomatic benefit, no mortality benefit. Now you don't have to remember the high, these things that I'm telling you, which is level 1 and level 2, not required for you. But what they'll ask, I'll tell you. Sacubitril can't be used with AC inhibitor. Both can cause injury edema. SGLT2 inhibitor they're giving you, even if the patient is not diabetic, make sure you answer for heart failure with reduced radiation fraction. Spironolactone, if you're choosing, make sure patient does not have risk of hyperkalemia. Potassium less than 5, creatinine less than 2.5. And don't forget, the single most important drug that increases survival of the patient is beta blocker. Okay, single most important drug that makes the patient live longer in heart failure is beta blocker. So these are the things that you should remember when it comes to heart failure. Do SGL22 inhibitor have good renal outcome also? Yes, absolutely. Renal and cardiac for both, they are highly beneficial. Okay, SGL22 inhibitor shown benefit for both. So if you look at the arrhythmias, um, just the classical ones you should know. One is um, atrial fibrillation. Whenever you see a narrow QRS, QRS is less than half of large box. That means the ventricles are fine. The problem is above ventricle. So it is an atrial arrhythmia. And you're seeing wavy baseline, fluctuating RR interval, fluctuating RR interval, wavy baseline, that is nothing but atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, mainly they'll ask you about treatment, control the rate, and try to act on the rhythm. In the rate control, you can use beta blocker, diltiazem, verapamil, and digoxin. What you should not use, repeat question in our exam, is do not use adenosin. It works only for a few seconds, and that will have no benefit whatsoever. So you have to give parental that to adenosin. So don't use adenosin for AFib patients. Rhythm reversion, ibutilide you can use for recent. Persistent AFib is actually somebody having AFib for more than 7 days. Okay, that's called persistent AFib. So persistent, we go for the bigger drugs like amiodarone, prokinamide and all. For short, recent, generally ibutilide is a preferred drug. Anticoagulation is required in anybody with AFib because they'll have risk of thrombosis, stroke risk is there. So in patients with anticoagulation, generally DOACs are preferred. Exception is in patients with mitral stenosis and patients with prosthetic valves with AFib. In these two, only warfarin is allowed. Okay, in MS and prosthetic valves, only warfarin allowed. All the others, you can use direct oral antico anticoagulant agents. Okay, apixaban, rivaroxaban, those can be used. Except for MS and prosthetic valve. Flutter is going to be having this kind of flutter waves which are called sawtooth appearance. Okay, this kind of continuous flutter waves will be there. And this kind of flutter waves if you are seeing in a patient with a narrow QRS like this, then that is highly suggestive of atrial flutter. Atrial flutter also should be suspected in anybody who's got a pulse rate of 150. Okay, because 3 to 1 blockade is very common in these patients. Anybody having heart rate, pulse rate exactly 150, think about possibility of atrial flutter. Treatment is similar to atrial fibrillation. Okay, flutter fibrillation treatment is same. Cardioversion, when we do, any patient is unstable, you have to go for cardioversion. Even if stable patient, patient does not want to have the side effects of drugs, then also you can do cardioversion. So it's not a contraindication, it is indication. And in fact, in, card in the guidelines, you'll see it's level 1 recommendation. Cardioversion can be done in people who are not unstable, who are stable also you can do cardioversion. Only problem is cardioversion should be done under you know, sedation. You can't do it in a person. He'll uh, obviously he'll. You are shocking a conscious person. You'll have problem. So under sedation, you can do in patients who are stable also. But in unstable, generally is the main thing. So in all unstable patients, systolic blood pressure below eighty. Patient has loss of consciousness. These are indications for you to go for shock. In the shock that we give, you got two things. One is cardioversion. And the other is defibrillation. Almost all patients we do cardioversion, which is synchronized shock. Okay, there's nothing but synchronized. The shock is synchronized with R wave. Okay, they synchronize. Defibrillation is non synchronized shock. You don't synchro synchronize anything, it is non synchronized. Almost all patients who are unstable, you have to go for unstable means systolic BP less than 80 or loss of consciousness. Such patients, almost everywhere, the answer is cardioversion. Only two exceptions for defibrillation. One is pulseless VT. Remember, if VT is slow rate and pulse is there, you can't use defibrillation. So it's pulseless VT and ventricular fibrillation. The only two conditions where defibrillation is your answer is pulseless VT and ventricular fibrillation. These are only two places where we use defib shock. 
everywhere else the answer is synchronized shock which is called as cardio version okay pulseless ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation we're going to go for defib if you look at supraventricular tachycardia this is either avnrt or avrt the ecg will show narrow qrs usually and the patient's ventricular rate will be above 150 okay regular pulse rate generally unlike flutter and fibrillation you don't see fluctuating rr here although flutter also can be regular be careful so what you see here is the narrow QRS. You can see that the gap is around two boxes. So the rate is around 150 or, you know, um, uh, obviously the way we calculate the rate is 300 divided by number of large boxes. Okay, or 1,500 uh, divided by number of small boxes. So this is how we calculate the rate. Now, once you see narrow QRS, ventricular problems are ruled out. Once you see equal RR interval, fibrillation is ruled out. Once you see a baseline like this without any continuous, see continuous flutter wave should occur for flutter. Once you see a baseline like this, this kind of a baseline, flat line in between, this is not flutter. So the, the choices they give in our exam, when they give you this kind of ECG are flutter, fibrillation, VT and SVT. So it can't be fibrillation, no fluctuating RR. It can't be VT because that would have come with broad QRS, this is narrow QRS. It's not having continuous sawtooth appearance without any baseline in between. If you see continuous flutter waves, that is flutter. So you're not seeing all that. You're seeing a clear baseline over here. This is nothing but SVT. SVT does come with retro inverted P waves. Some people are not co confident of recognizing those retro inverted P waves. This is what we call the RP interval is shorter than PR interval. Doesn't matter. My point is you can't, you can eliminate the other options. You can rule out flutter, no continuous flutter waves. You can rule out VT, that's broad QRS. You can rule out fibrillation, atrial fibrillation will have fluctuating RR. So those choices you can easily eliminate. How do you treat SVT? SVT comes in paroxysms and the patients would have found a vagal technique to stop the arrhythmia on their own. Um, they'll tell you, okay, this is what I do, then I stop feeling the ghabrat, okay, I feel better after that. So, but if you are using the treatment, you can use carotid massage, you can ask the patient to blow in a syringe. Um, those are all vagal techniques, cold water, raising the legs, all these are going to activate the vagus. Okay, Valsalva, all these can activate vagus. So we activate the vagus to block the re-entries. Carotid massage first, most patients, doesn't work, go for adenosine. If 6 milligram doesn't work, you can try 12 milligrams IV also. If that doesn't work, then we go for IV beta blockers. So the way Harrison table is, ki narrow complex techie, hemodynamic instability is there or not there. If a patient is unstable, then you go for cardioversion. The patient is stable, then go for carotid massage, adenosine. That's ineffective, then go for either diltiazem erapamil or beta blocker. If that is also ineffective, then we go for higher drug. Most of the time, these work. Okay, this is how we are managing patients with SVT Harrison's table. If patient has WPW, then what you're seeing is short PR interval, broad QRS and delta wave. So what you will see in the ECG is the PR interval is short. PR interval actually includes P plus flat line. There's no flat line here. So PR interval becomes equal to P wave. Because the flat line is replaced by delta wave, the QRS becomes broad. This QRS now became broad. So broad QRS, short PR interval and a delta wave, the combination of these is nothing but WPW. Two types, accessory pathway can be on the left side or right side. Left side is more common. This is type A, more common. Type B is not that common. Right-sided accessory pathways are less. Left side is more common. The treatment is class 1A, class 1C or class 3 antirhythmics. Finally, any MCQ telling you a patient had uh, developed a dangerous uh, arrhythmia where he had, uh, had a syncope or he fell down or he had some resuscitation needed at one time, any of the bad history in the MCQ with WPW, straight answer is radiofrequency ablation. You ablate the accessory pathway and destroy it. And if you see this patient has got a P wave and the flat line is not there. After the P, there should be no flat line. If you see a flat line that is going against WPW. So moment the P got over, the delta wave is there and you can see that the patient clearly you can make out there's no flat line, right? You can see the P and then the delta wave and then the QRS. So QRS is becoming broad because of that and there's no flat line in between. So this is what you see. This is WPW syndrome. Now we're looking at a VT, okay, ventricular tachycardia. 
this is clear broad qrs more than 30 seconds is called sustained less than 30 seconds is called non sustained so you can make out generally you know they'll give you a single lead also you can make out this monomorphic vt it's clear broad qrs the qrs is occupying more than a large box almost a entire large box so clearly broad qrs any qrs broader than half of large box is broad for us is ventricular problem so this is a broad qrs you can see the rate is quite high it's uh, more than 150 uh, because less than two large boxes are there so this is monomorphic vt okay monomorphic same morphology ventricular tachycardia so in a patient with monomorphic vt the drugs that we use in the treatment are amiodarone and procainamide and obviously cardioversion can be done in patients who are stable also you can do cardioversion but it should be done under sedation unstable patient uh, if the patient is pulseless the answer is defib if pulse is there the answer is cardioversion okay be careful vt can have both depending on whether the patient has a pulse or not polymorphic vt is is triggered by long qt people who have normal ecg i mean people who have long qt in their ecg are going to develop polymorphic vt so the long qt ecgs are always bad problem for us because uh, sometimes you know they give the ecg and they ask you what the patient is at risk of so when you see a long qt then you are worried the patient can develop polymorphic vt okay more than 0.44 seconds or more than 0.46 seconds in the ecg qt interval corrected qt interval more than 0.44 roughly is prolonged qt for us so it can be congenital long qt or it can be acquired that is torsades so polymorphic vt can occur acquired also congenital also acquired is mainly drugs okay acquired is mainly drugs for us hypokalemia alcohol hypomagnesemia also can cause but drugs are main and congenital causes and this patient develops polymorphic vt polymorphic vt has got a very classical pattern where you see a cyclical variation in amplitude where you see small amplitude large amplitude small amplitude pattern whenever it is there it can't be ventricular fibrillation remember that okay you're seeing a clear pattern small amplitude large amplitude small amplitude all these are going to tell you that this is basically a patient having polymorphic vt this is what we call torsades in patients who have got torsades acute treatment is mag back self magnesium sulfate and the patient is unstable most of the time you have to shock the patient okay you have to go for shock mag self shock that is generally then now these two are basically to prevent the next episode of vt we don't want right now patient only has long qt in the ecg but we don't want the next polymorphic vt episode to occur how do you prevent congenital long qt best answer is beta blocker don't answer pacemaker main answer is beta blocker acquired long qt remove the offending drug and correct the electrolytes stop alcohol correct the electrolytes hypokalemia hypomagnesemia important correct them finally ventricular fibrillation is just a random you know without any pattern wavy baseline this patient first step is defibrillatory shock the faster you give it the better each minute delay 10% decrease survival of the patient so you have to shock the patient as fast as you can and obviously chest compression has to be given cpr has to be given along with shock shock is the thing that you that will really work because it converts the reentries back to homogeneous so shock is essential in the treatment of ventricular fibrillation so cardiac asystole is a flat line when you have a flat line then most important point to remember is not a shockable rhythm shock only works in a patient who's got a, a reentry inside and if reentries are not there then shock will not work so in a patient with cardiac asystole don't go for shock okay i remember in one question that said patient had uh, digoxin toxicity and he had got bradycardia and he got unstable patient was unstable because the patient was hemodynamically unstable some students answered shock be careful shock only works for reentry tract associated arrhythmias tachy arrhythmias not bradycardy tachy arrhythmias where reentries are there their shock will block somebody is just having bradycardia or bundle branch block because of that if, if the av node block it is a complete heart block is there shocking that person is useless let me repeat what i'm saying when will shock work when you have a tachy arrhythmia and that patient has reentry tracts inside that plays shock patient has digoxin toxicity bradycardia because of that what will shock do shock will not stimulate the sa node or av node remember that so do not shock in such patients you are right atropine is a good treatment digoxin toxicity digoxin antibodies are important but just because unstable patient hemodynamically unstable i'll shock the patient no that's not the way okay shock works in tachyarrhythmias so flat line don't shock 
treatment is obviously chest compression, ventilation, uh, the basic cardiopulmonary resuscitation is covered in anesthesia. But the main thing, just to summarize once again, 30 is to 2 is the ratio. Remember chest compression, the first thing you start, not ventilation. Rate, you try to give chest compression, rate is 100 to 120. And the depth of chest compression you do is 2 to 2.4 inches or 5 to 7 centimeters. These are repeatedly asked in the exam. Now when you look at heart blocks, type 1 heart block is prolonged PR interval. Type 2 is divided into Mobitz 1 and 2. Both QRS will not come. Difference is changing PR interval in Mobitz 1, fixed PR interval in Mobitz 2. Type 3 heart block is complete heart block where there is no relationship between the P and the QRS. But the RR interval and the PP interval should be equal. Okay, important point to remember is RR interval should be equal then only you answer complete heart block. Okay, otherwise don't answer complete heart block. So you can see the starting of the P to the starting of the QRS more than one large box that is prolonged PR interval. Okay, starting of P to starting of QRS more than one box. One box is 0 0.20 seconds more than that that is prolonged PR interval. If you see in between one of the R waves not occurring but you notice the PR became longer and each subsequent PR becoming longer and longer then P is there no QRS that's Mobitz 1. But here also you see missed QRS but the PR interval is fixed. A fixed PR interval with absent QRS in between, that is Mobitz 2. Most important thing for type 3 block is remember that the RR interval must be equal. If the RR interval is fluctuating, rule out complete heart block from the answer list. Okay, RR interval should be exactly equal. The P wave is not having any relationship. Look at the PR interval is constantly changing. Here in fact you can see the P buried inside the QRS. Very close. No relationship between the PR PR interval is going all over the place. P is walking through the QRS we say. You can see it is a P wave, P wave, P wave. All these are P waves. And the P waves, the atria is beating at a separate rate, ventricle is beating at a separate rate. And don't, there is no relationship between the two. And this is what we call P walking through the QRS. It's occurring before the QRS, occurring within the QRS, it's occurring after the QRS. So this is what we say, no relationship between the two and this is complete heart block. In patients who have got Mobids 2 and type 3 heart block, make sure you answer pacemaker, atropine will not work. Okay, for these two, pacemaker should be done. For symptomatic Mobids 1, atropine is the treatment. Okay, symptomatic Mobids 1, atropine. If it's not symptomatic, we don't care. Let the Mobids 1 be there, that's his lifestyle, he'll enjoy. But if it's Mobids 2 and complete heart block, pacemaker has to be considered. Okay, these two are dangerous. Finally, card cardiomyopathy in our exam, two cardiomyopathies they love to ask questions on. One is Takatsubo, the other is HOCM. Takatsubo is generally in the MCQ, they'll tell you a female, generally postmenopausal, who has got uh, intense argument with somebody and then she starts developing chest pain. Many times when you see that intense argument and chest pain, as I told you, know, you get that mixed feeling again, happy and sad. Happy that you got the answer, sad that everybody will know now. So this is Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, also called as sympathetic heart. This is... Um, extreme emotions and stress that trigger catecholamine. Catecholamine squeeze the base of the heart just below the iota, it will squeeze it. And because the base of the iota, the base of the heart, this part of the ventricle just got squeezed, the rest of the, the rest of the ventricle, see this narrowed, became spastic. The rest of the ventricle stretches out and get damaged. All these muscle gets damaged because of that. By the time the patient comes, the spasm is relieved. Now the only thing that is contracting the echo is this area. This is what we call basal hyperkinesia, but the mid and the apex, the mid and the apex has got poor contraction. All this wall will not contract, but the basal part of the thing will contract. Okay, this is nicely contracting, but the rest of the myocardium, okay, all this area will have poor contraction. Okay, this part in the echo not contracting, basal hyperkinesia, that's the main clue for us. The problem is the these patients will come with um, chest pain. The ECG will show ST elevation, although it can show ST depressions also, ST, any ST changes can occur. But ST elevation is, is the thing they'll give in our exam to confuse you with MI. Okay, it looks like a STEMI. Troponin is also increased. Now, although more sure you think it's a STEMI, but the important point is angio will show normal. In a STEMI, we expect 100% occlusion, complete occlusion of coronary artery. Sometimes you know the patient might have got a 20% blockage. Anyway, 20% coronary blockage does not cause a STEMI. So mild atherosclerosis or normal angio goes against MI, STEMI. This is nothing but Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. What you need to do in this patient is, and this is why it's called Takatsubo. This is the ventriculogram. You put a contrast in the ventricle. The shape is looking like the instrument they used to catch octopus. Okay, that's how the name Takatsubo came. Because it's a Japanese earthquake. 
um, it caused intense fear and catecholamine increase. And that's how many patients ended up with chest pain and many of them had this problem. That's how the name Takatsubo came. So what do you do in the treatment? Just AC inhibitors and beta blocker. That's all. Generally, prognosis is quite good. HOCM is hot. Why it is hot, I'll tell you. It is hot because it's in charcha. What do you mean by in charcha? Everybody is talking about. Why everybody is talking? There's a major breakthrough new drug that's come. That's why all journals, imagine the Buddha is making questions for you. He opens, he's going to see this drug coming in the mind. HOCM is playing in his mind. Because of that, HOCM is in charcha. Good chance of coming. May not be for, may be for need, but INICT, I can tell you, you're going to see questions on HOCM. It is autosomal dominant. Usually, beta myosin defects, um, the routine thing, I'm sure you all know. The most important clue is ECO will show thickened septum, everybody knows, but show something called SAM. What is SAM is systolic anterior motion of mitral valve. Okay, systolic anterior motion of mitral valve. And because the mitral valve gets sucked open in ventricular systole, normally in systole, aortic valve should be open, mitral valve should be closed. But because of a low pressure below the aortic iota, it will suck the mitral valve open. That's called SAM. Because the mitral valve got opened, the blood, blood will regurgitate in the atria, that's MR will occur. So SAM and MR are accompanying features of HOCM. But the patho will show muscle fiber dysarray and fibrosis. Patients have high risk of sudden cardiac death because of ventricular fibrillation. You know, last year, I think, last last year, I think, they gave an image, septum, thickened septum. It's an autopsy image. Thickened septum was clearly seen. Everybody thought it is HOCM, knew it is HOCM. Okay, there's no denying that. They asked, why did the patient die? Many people answered the septum blocking LV outflow, LV outflow tract obstruction killed the patient. Many of them answered that. Be careful, death in HOCM occurs because of ventricular fibrillation. Okay, death in HOCM is arrhythmias, not a septum blocking and decreasing blood flow to brain. No, death occurs because of arrhythmias. So what's the murmur? Any scenario where less blood in the ventricle, murmur is increased. Okay, valsalva, standing, nitrate, all decreased blood in the left ventricle, murmur is increased. Anything that increases blood in the left ventricle, murmur decreases. Okay, normally more blood, more murmur. This is opposite, that's why it's imp important for our exam. Be careful, more the blood collected, septum is pushed away, the inner the diameter, the more the inner diameter, septum is pushed away, the murmur comes down. So in all these conditions, more blood in the left ventricle, it will push the septum out of the obstruction zone. That's why the murmur decreases. The treatment, if you see, the treatment is beta blockers, uh, main drug is beta blocker, because it will protect against arrhythmias also. Disopyramide, calcium channel blocker, you inject alcohol to make the septum thin. Septal myectomy can be done and you can consider putting a ICD in this patient because they are at risk of arrhythmia. Now what's the new drug? This is the drug. Okay, Lancet first reported this drug, then other studies started coming, Mavacamptin. And this is hot in Charcha now. What they found in, in patients with normal, normal sacromere has got normal contractility, normal relaxation of the myocardium. But in HOCM, you'll see that they have hypercontractility, impaired relaxation, and uh, myocardial energies are you know not properly utilized. So that's how the problems occur in these patients. So we have now come across a drug that solves this problem. So what does Mavacamptin do? It's a targeted inhibitor of cardiac myosin. And that reduces the number of actin myosin bridges and decreases the hypercontractile state. So this is the benefit and by doing this they have studied, they have shown that left ventricular alpha tract obstruction decreases and they are showing lot of benefit in the, the hemodynamics of the patient. And as I told you, this is in charcha, everybody's, all journals, all conference, everybody's talking about it. It's going to play in their mind, HOCM, HOCM, HOCM. Questions may not be on this because it's too recent to ask for students, it's not there in textbooks. But they'll ask questions on HOCM. Okay, and this is a new drug. This is basically a targeted inhibitor of cardiac myosin, decreases myosin actin bridges, and it thereby increases decreases the LVOT obstruction, left ventricular output drug obstruction. So, what the most important thing in cardio I've covered for you, the rest of it, all the valvular disease and all, to some extent is covered, I think, in PEDS. So, either way, it's more of UG, not for entrance exams. Moving to rheumatology, if you look at vasculitis, okay, if you look at vasculitis, you have large vessel vasculitis that is Takayasu temporal, medium sized vessel vasculitis, Pan and Kawasaki, and small vessel vasculitis that is all these MPA, Vaginus, Henoch Shonlin, Shirk Strauss, Cryo. 
So all these are the major vasculitis. Now I'm, you need to understand this idea just based on what type of vessel it involves. You'll have a rough idea what it can manifest with. For example, if it's large vessel, it'll involve iota in its branches, right? So carotid, subclavian, renal. So you can see TIA, claudication, hypertension. These things are common, large vessel. Medium sized vessel, digital arteries, gangrene is very common. Then mesenteric artery, bowel ischemia is very common. Epineural, mononeuritis multiplex, foot drop and all that will give you very common. Pan, particularly medium cell vessel, classical example is polyarthritis nodosa. Small vessel will affect the skin, it will affect the kidney, lung. Now see in a large vessel, you unless the capillaries near the alveoli are involved, you can't have pulmonary hemorrhage or hemoptysis and all. You can't have glomerulonephritis when you have large vessel. A small vessel can come with glomerulonephritis, can involve pulmonary alveolar zone causing pulmonary hemorrhage. So a rough idea of just the vessel it involves also will give you an idea ki what it will manifest with. But if you see Takayasu for example, this is generally a female below the age of 40 years. Okay, Remember the female to male ratio is very skewed. It's almost 8 times more common in female. So it will be a female, it will be less than 40 years. Um, arm claudication, asymmetric pulses claudication problems in one of the arm or both arms difference in BP in the two upper limbs these are major clues this is all Takayasu but just to tell you the major areas affected are summarized in Harrison what all are the main things affected in Takayasu so what you see subclavian because of that arm claudication Renault can occur carotid because of that TIA syncope can occur abdominal celiac what you know all these can be affected so bowel ischemia can occur renal artery, hypertension, renal failure can occur. Now generally questions are asked in the first 3-4 features that are common in patients with Takayasu. Young female, asymmetric pulses, claudication in one of the arms, some minor TIA, visual changes might be there, bowel ischemia, hypertension, is typically the features. Now you may give you IIR but percentage drops significantly in these. So these are some of the things you will see in the patients. Not, notice the big gap, 93% subclavian involvement. So the difference in pulse and the asymmetric pulses are very classical in this condition. When you look at temporal arthritis, this also is common, but the ratio is 2 is to 1, female to male. How they'll describe is a patient who is more than 50 years. Remember, more than 50 is must. If the patient has got new onset headache above 50, not a headache he's got from past 20 years migraine, no. New onset headache above 50, jaw claudication and high ESR. The moment they give you these four fine points, they are basically telling you the answer, this is nothing but temporal arthritis, also called as giant cell arthritis. In patients with giant cell arthritis, what is special? It can be accompanied by polymyalgia rheumatica, proximal muscle pain and stiffness, but the CK levels are normal. Okay, proximal muscle pain and stiffness, CK levels are normal. These patients are high risk of developing anti ischemic optic neuropathy. The moment you get these four features, above 50, headache, patient high ESR, next step they'll ask you, your big worry is this dangerous complication. To prevent this, what do you need to do? Start the patient on steroids. Now, immediate steroids you have to start. Don't delay, but you plan for elective temporal artery biopsy later. Steroids will not change your temporal artery biopsy findings. Don't worry, start steroids immediately. Once the temporal artery biopsy confirms that his granulomatous inflammation is there, then continue steroids. Tocilizumab also is used. Both these now are becoming major treatment in patients with temporal arthritis. Polyarthritis nodosa is medium sized vessel vasculitis. AION is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. AION is anterior, any vascular cause of eye problem, sudden painless loss of vision will occur okay, with altitudinal defect. This is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Okay, it's a vascular cause for that is temporal arthritis. Sudden onset blindness can occur. This is the reason why I repeat question in the exam. Elderly person with headache, high ESR, what do you want to do next? Next is steroids. Next is start steroids. Okay, donut sign or vada sign, whatever you want to call, that is also there in the Doppler. Okay, polyarthritis nodosa, clinical features are asked in the exam. Before I tell you what is not affected, 
they repeatedly ask what is what is paired okay what what is affected we'll see what is paired they'll ask in exam i already explained the concept to you that pulmonary manifestations can't occur because this is not a small vessel vasculitis okay glomerulonephritis will not occur although renal artery branches are involved glomerulonephritis will not occur and there's no anca many people think about p anca here no anca association in pan okay anca is coming with microscopic pulmonitis not in pan what's classical in this condition is mononeuritis multiplex very very common so you'll see foot drop you'll see uh, wrist drop radial nerve palsy uh, common peritoneal nerve palsy is because the blood supply to those nerves are gone randomly here in the nerve will go it is associated with hepatitis b and the treatment is steroids as a, like any any vasculitis but what are the main features harrison is listing out renal not renal artery per se but renal artery branches are involved so you will see renal failure hypertension can occur peripheral nervous system so you will see mononeuritis multiplex okay arthralgia can occur in any vasculitis so what is mononeuritis multiplex bowel ischemia can occur so abdominal pain nausea or diarrhea or that can occur skin you can see levator reticularis rash so generally in our exams you know they give a combination of these and ask you about polyarthritis nodosa and uh, don't forget digital gangrene is very classical in this condition okay gangrene of the digits so all these points will tell you that this is nothing but polyarthritis nodosa if you do a uh, arteriogram you will see sometimes aneurysms in the branches of medium sized vessel whether it is mesenteric artery branches or renal artery branches or hepatic artery branches you will see a small aneurysms in them that also will tell you that this is going towards polyarthritis nodosa now anca associated vasculitis you have mpa wegener's and schuckstrauss okay wegener's is called gpa all these are pulmonary renal syndromes the difference is ki wegener's will have upper respiratory tract involvement with sinusitis is a major finding which you don't generally see in microscopic pulmonitis in any gpa um, in upper respiratory tract wegener's is classical but schuckstrauss sometimes can come with allergic nasal polyps so be careful of that so in general ent findings if you see you are looking at wegener's okay ocular findings ent findings are highly suggestive of wegener's renal musculoskeletal can be involved in all in the lung be careful if they mention cavities it's unique to wegener's because this is necrotizing power is there sometimes in the mcq they'll try to confuse you wegener's with tb because tb also can come with cavities in the lung but if they tell you about sept the uh, nasal septum getting affected and the patient has got a um, saddle nose deformity that generally is a rare in tb that is more likely to go towards wegener plus renal involvement is again very rare in tb so that also in combination with these findings is suggestive of wegener so look at all these things to tell you that this is wegener not tb now one problem is sometimes because of this necrotizing condition you can see some caseation in the granuloma that doesn't go against wegener so be careful of that wegener's that means is upper respiratory tract lower respiratory tract and renal involvement okay combination of these you get microscopic pulmonitis typically comes with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage hemoptysis obviously renal involvement occurs here also many of these conditions are sometimes having equal you know thing in males and females generally autoimmune conditions more common in female but these these are exceptions uh, all these three the the female male ratio is variable most of the times given equal in many books then you have chuck straws which comes with asthma eosinophilia the thing about chuck straws is it might have lot of features that pan will have means what mononeuritis multiplex bowel ischemia skin problem the same thing that we saw in pan can occur here difference is pan does not have lung involvement here it occurs pan does not have eosinophilia here it occurs okay that's a way to differentiate pan from chuck straws all of them can have anca although c anca is more classical for wegener and p anca can occur in all three of them treatment is steroids rituximab steroid cyclophosphamide is now become second line methotrexate is usually for maintenance mepolizumab is used wherever eosinophils are high so it is used for schuckstrauss now you should know one new drug again is come and is again in charcha this uh, this drug called avocapan now this drug is um, showing very good benefit in patients with anca associated vasculitis this actually is working on c5a receptor Okay, C5 receptor. I'll not show new drugs that are kind of plus or minus. You know, I'm showing drugs that are making an impact. Means they are now coming in recommendations. They are they are important. Among the three, Wegener, Chuck Straws, MPA. Wegener will have granuloma and Chuck Straws will have granuloma. MPA will not have any granuloma. 
Hennox online purpura is um, IgOS colitis. Tetrad is palpable purpura arthralgia, particularly uh, the knee joint and ankle joint are involved. Bowel ischemia and only about 30 to 50% can have kidney involvement. Whenever you see this description, they'll ask you what's the next step. Make sure the answer is skin biopsy because you want to see IgA deposits in immunofluorescence. Okay, the treatment is again steroids in most of them may not need immunosuppressants. Most of them steroids are enough. Kawasaki's vasculitis is seen only in children. It is never seen in adult, remember that. Okay, only, only children, never above 15 years. Coronary artery aneurysms is a problem. Anti-endothelial antibodies already preformed in the blood are there. They cause coronary artery aneurysm. So your only treatment is pull out the antibody. This is another condition where steroids will not work. Okay, because already preformed antibodies are there. The criteria is patient will have fever for more than five days. They'll have mucosal problems like strawberry tongue, cracked lips. They'll have conjunctivitis, cervical lymphadenopathy, at least one of them should be more than 1.5 cm, rash in the trunk and in the palms and soles, either swelling can occur or desquamation can occur. So this is the criteria of which essential criteria is fever. Okay, small children below 5 years typically coming with fever with 4 out of these 5 present, that is Kawasaki for us. Now what do you want to do in the treatment? We use aspirin because coronary artery aneurysms would have formed already. We don't want them to block, so aspirin. And preformed antibodies are there, anti-endothelial antibody. Remember, in small children, plasmapheresis is not an option. So in children, we are going to go for immunoglobulins. Now, I have seen students ask, will steroids never be used? Yes, typically in our MCQ, steroids are not used. But in practice, what we see is, is if you have a patient who's got fever beyond three to four weeks, that means ongoing inflammation is there. Once preformed antibodies, fine. But ongoing inflammation, steroids become important. We only consider steroids in the rare exceptional case where the child is having a fever for more than, you know, three weeks. Other than that, steroids have no role. Okay, other typical MCQ, remember, no steroids. No steroids for, because this is a condition has got preformed antibodies, steroids can't do anything to that. Give aspirin, remove the circulating antibody, neutralize the circulating antibodies by using IV immunoglobulin. Now the connective tissue disease, just two or three, you should know about systemic lupus. Okay, you should know about systemic lupus. In the systemic lupus, the main criteria, skin is involved in which you have acute, subacute and chronic. Okay, it's covered in dermat, I think, malar rash, psoriasiform rash, and you have scar formation, discoid rash, that is chronic. Ulcers can occur. The question they ask you about ulcers is, unlike besets, these ulcers are generally painless, can be painful, usually they are painless. You can have alopecia, which is non-scarring. Scarring can occur if discoid rash is there. The question about arthritis is, it's non-erosive. Okay, be careful, it's non-erosive arthritis. Serous membranes can be involved, so pleuritis, pericarditis can occur. Neuro problems can occur. Then blood abnormalities can occur. Lab criteria are commonly asked in the exam. ANA is most sensitive. Double standard DNA, only antibody that correlates to disease severity. Anti-Smith is the most specific. Okay, some students have answered double standard DNA more specific wrong. Anti-Smith is more specific. Okay, Anti-phospholipid antibody increase risk of arterial venous thrombosis, decrease complement, and positive Coombs test. All these are criteria of all these four should be positive. But if the patient has renal biopsy suggestive of SLE, single criteria is enough. This one asked in the exam, which single criteria, if alone, if it's there, is enough to make SLE diagnosis? The answer is renal biopsy. If it's suggestive of SLE, it is SLE. Now, what do you want to do in the treatment? Essential treatment for all patient SLE is HCQ. Okay, all patients should be on HCQ. Apart from HCQ, if the patient has life-threatening disease, they should be on steroids and immunosuppressants. The only new drug they might ask in the exam is anifrolumab. This anifrolumab is anti-interferon drug. Okay, it's an anti-interferon drug. It is the only drug that has been added in the last 10 years. Okay, anifrolumab. So mild disease, you can use low-dose steroids, belumumab and anifrolumab. So these are the drugs that we use for SLE. We're looking at scleroderma. This is a patient who has got sclero means skin fibrosis of the skin. Two major subtypes in this limited and systemic, diffuse systemic sclerosis. Both are systemic sclerosis, be careful. The antibody is anti-centromere. Here you get anti-SEL70 and RNA polymerase 3. Another major difference between the two is interstitial lung disease occurs here. Here interstitial lung disease is mild or minimal, but pulmonary hypertension occurs, making it primary pulmonary hypertension. Okay, pulmonary hypertension can occur here also, here also. 
but here pulmonary hypertension is not accompanied by interstitial disease making it a kind of primary pulmonary hypertension so what do you want to do i mean how do you differentiate between the two conditions if they ask you antibodies one then the skin involvement is a major differentiator for us if the disease is restricted to the distal areas acral areas that is going towards crest if it starts involving above the knee above the elbow below the thing so trunk involvement actually makes it diffuse type so if you see trunk involvement the answer is diffuse type if it involving only distal areas it is crest sometimes you know crest can come with raynaud's raynaud's is very early in crest at this time patient has come only with raynaud's okay raynaud's is late or comes with skin problem in systemic diffuse type raynaud's is very early in crest now you know you are in the opd seeing a patient coming only with raynaud's at this point he doesn't have any other feature your worry is he can develop crest in the future they asked in the exam what investigation will you do when somebody comes with raynaud you want to predict he can develop crest in the future what will you do the answer is nail fold capillaroscopy typically it is examined under this magnification and normally the capillaries at the nail bed should be hairpin like this but they get distorted and you get periangual telangiectasia if you can see the telangiectasia this normal but you do see distorted telangiectasia telangiectasia can occur so if you see telangiectasia at the nail bed that's called periangual telangiectasia okay this periangual telangiectasia can occur in diffuse type also late but we see it very early in crest syndrome and this becomes a major clue for us to tell that this patient is going to develop crest in the future okay periangual telangiectasia Okay, just below the nail bed, the patient will develop disruption in the capillaries. So finally, there are some GI symptoms. One, you can see this patient coming with dysphagia. They can have reflux problems. They can have something called GAVE. This is gastric anterior vascular ectasia. This is what we call watermelon stomach. These blood vessels will bleed and they cause chronic malina, causing anemia in these patients. Diverticulosis can occur. Incontinence can occur. and um, what do you do in the treatment they'll ask you renards we give treatment mainly calcium channel blockers all these are not that important first drug we try is calcium channel blockers the main cause of death in this patients is pulmonary okay most common cause of death especially in diffuse systemic sclerosis so what we do in the treatment in pulmonary is steroids immunosuppressants and to this we add nintedanib and very recently now they have they have also saying tocilizumab in the pulmonary disease particularly in patients with systemic sclerosis okay so nintedanib tocilizumab other immunosuppressants mycophenolate particularly steroids are used in pulmonary involvement one major point to remember is we don't seem to have a good drug in the management of skin problem the skin fibrosis when the patient is coming none of the drugs are showing benefit we use methotrexate but it is plus or minus okay it is plus or minus so those are the things to remember main point is don't be in a hurry to use steroids in scleroderma if you use steroids in scleroderma then that patient is going to develop renal scleroderma crisis okay there is something called renal scleroderma crisis those patients will develop that complications we don't use steroids in this patients finally if you look at jogren syndrome jogren is um, again 9 is to 1 more mainly seen in females usually it's idiopathic or primary secondary when it's accompanied with sle and rheumatoid arthritis the others are not that important sicka problems are main thing dry eye dry mouth glands are affected but extra glandula most common problem is asked in one exam and that is arthralgia arthritis but lot of other problems can occur lymphoma cytopenias cryoglobulinemia renaud neuropathy but the important mcq they've been asking is type 1 rta okay type 1 rta can occur sometimes isolated in jogrens okay so you should be aware of it the antibodies are ssa ssb rola but their sensitivity is especially not that great so almost all patients end up on getting a biopsy of the inner lip and what we looking at minor salivary gland and if you see lymphocytes with cd4 infiltration that is jogrens for us but in one exam they started the question by telling male patient with sicka and the lymphocytes were cd8 type that question was hiv the very nature of the thing you see it's 9 is to 1 when they started a question with male patient coming with dry eye dry mouth itself gave a clue to students that this can't be jogrens okay so you know that when you have a 9 is to 1 ratio maybe in practice some male might have jogrens mcq should not have okay so male plus the fact that it was cd8 inflammation 
not CD4, all suggested it was HIV. HIV differential diagnosis can come with a Sika problem. So what's the treatment here? Just supportive. Whatever the problem, dry eye, treat that. Raynaud, give calcium channel blocker. Lymphoma, Archop regimen. So just supportive care. That's all that you need to do. What will be the treatment in scleroderma because you wrote steroids? Yeah, steroids are in scleroderma used only in pulmonary. This is the only place where you use steroids. There is some ben benefit of using in myositis, but the only place where you use steroids is pulmonary. Problem is when you start using steroids, there is a risk of renal scleroderma crisis. So as far as possible, we tend to avoid steroids in, in patients with scleroderma. But when pulmonary starts occurring, then the mortality can go up. So we use steroids in this exceptional case. In general, in our exam, for skin problem at least, don't answer steroids. Okay, patient has scleroderma skin involved. What do you do? Many students just say steroids first. So be careful. Steroids is only used in pulmonary. Other places in scleroderma, no steroids. So these are all the things that, um, that they'll ask you as far as So I think we've covered uh, most of the things. If you're all up to it, I don't have any problem in continuing. The PDF I've already given. Just one or two points I'm adding. Um, so it's already there. The PDF is already there. Right? So I think we'll continue. But just give me two minutes. Okay, we'll, we'll start the class in two minutes. Okay, so I'm sure you can hear me now. 
so so starting mac with the pulmonary part <coughs> so if you look at the pulmonary um, mainly you should know about the uh, airway diseases first airway diseases asthma and a major difference between asthma and copd is asthma is an episodic disease it's not going to be patient has fluctuating spasms episodic spasms in between the spasm patient might be totally normal the patient will have airway hyper responsiveness and there is inflammation of the airway now how do we prove that it's episodic <coughs> we ask the patient to buy a peak flow meter and that will show a lot of variation means spasm occurs in between patient is normal airway hyper responsiveness patient will have a obstructive pattern if you will be decreased but when you give a bronchodilator if you will increase by 12% or by 200 ml <coughs> okay increase by 12% or 200 ml if that happens that tells us that the muscle is thick remember copd muscle is not the airway muscle is not thick it's the mucus gland that increase here the muscle goes into spasm so by giving albitrol you can relax the muscle and the patient if you will improve if the patient comes with normal don't forget this episodic disease sometimes you know when the patient comes and you check the spirometer it is normal if it's normal then we use methacholine challenge test in the methacholine challenge at what concentration if you want decrease by 20% we see less than 8.8 mg per ml concentration methacholine if you want decreases then that is got asthma finally if you see inflammation of the airways like nitric oxide because nitric oxide in the exhaled nitric oxide level if it's there it indicates patient has lot of eosinophilic inflammation remember eosinophils form nitric oxide and all these are the major clues to tell you that this asthma is not copd apart from that you will see these patients are going to have the kirschman spirals the charcot leiden crystals so all those also features that will tell you that this is going towards asthma now how do you classify asthma intermittent is less than 2 days and less than 2 episodes in a night okay just remember one thing moderate is daily attacks okay moderate is daily attacks everything else is fill in the blanks okay less than 2 per week and less than 2 per month that's intermittent daily attacks is moderate throughout the day if the patient is getting severe in between that if you getting that is between 3 to okay more than 2 is actually 3 so 3 to 6 attacks because this is daily okay this daily means 7 attacks in a week so 3 to 7 6 attacks per week if the patient is getting that is mild now what you need to understand is if the patient has intermittent don't have to give daily treatment this remember the treatment i'm telling you may differ from pediatric because this for adult patients not for pediatric adult patients the gina guidelines recommend that the patient should be on prorenata means as and when required the patient should take inhaled corticosteroid and formitol combination this is what we call reliever okay this inhaled corticosteroid formitol has replaced short acting beta to agonist still in children we use saba but in adult this is a recommendation after 12 years inhaled corticosteroid and formitol combination is used as a reliever okay when no as the attack occurs only the time patient should take not daily when the patient has persistent the word persistent they should be on inhaled corticosteroid okay they should be on daily inhaled corticosteroid so all of them will be on daily inhaled corticosteroid the treatment of uh, intermittent is what we call step 1 the treatment of mild is called step 2 the treatment of moderate is called step 3 the severe is divided into two two steps that is step 4 and 5 okay severe is divided into step 4 and step 5 only thing they asked in our exam is moderate daily attack what do you do that's the only question i've seen till now in the exam and the answer is it is step 3 right so it is inhale corticosteroid daily plus long acting beta to agonist inhalation daily Okay, so inhale steroid plus laba daily. That's the daily treatment you give for moderate. They have not asked any of the others till now. They may ask because the GINA guidelines changed. What is changed? As I told you, in adults, we use inhale steroid for metrol instead of short acting beta to agonist. This is the the GINA guidelines. This is low dose inhale steroid for metrol combination. Daily inhale steroid step two for mild intermittent. For moderate persistent, sorry, mild mild persistent. This is moderate persistent. Is inhale steroid laba for severe condition divided into step 4 and step 5 we increase the dose and in step 5 we add specialized treatments what the specialized treatments are that if the patient has high ige we use omalizumab if the patient has high eosinophilia we use mepolizumab and rosalizumab the patient has got steroid dependent asthma we use dupilumab and if the patient has non eosinophilic asthma we use tezoplumab now these drugs are kind of like step 5 okay so in step 5 apart from the routine treatment 
based on individual thing for that particular patient tailor made treatment is given okay why was it replaced because there was a landmark study large study that showed that compared to saba inhaled steroid prevented the next episode okay it may not work for a current but it prevented the next episode from occurring so overall episodes of intermittent attacks decreased by using combination so that is the reason why it is replaced okay but in children still still saba does not change below 12 years the guidelines remain so when you look at copd it's two things emphysema and uh, bronchitis emphysema is a la loss of elastic recall of the alveoli bronchitis is mucosal gland inflammation this is what we call red index this mucous gland proliferate and they are causing the blockage so it's a combined problem of alveoli and the airway what you see is hyperinflated chest with flattened diaphragm vertical heart this is what we call tubular heart and the normal uh, chest that should be having the transverse diameter more than the ap diameter that changes into barrel shaped where you find that the the diameter has become similar okay this is what we call barrel shaped okay so barrel shaped chest starts occurring in this patient because of the hyperinflated lung now the classification of copd is very complex that's why i have not seen any questions and i don't think the last cut post mvp level you are looking at exacerbations you're looking at the mmrc scoring cat scoring based on all these we classify into abcd they'll not ask all this for you at the exam because how will they ask modified medical research council copd assessment test scoring nobody can remember those things so they'll not ask in exam so what you should know is ki inhaled steroid generally are not the main treatment for copd that concept at least you should know okay inhaled steroid are effective for asthma not that effective for copd copd they are used in last stage that too as a combination okay just as a combination we use and sometimes you know copd asthma overlap is there there it will work but otherwise generally inhaled steroid is not a primary treatment second major difference concept to remember is that in asthma never use long acting beta agonist alone without inhaled steroid never use laba alone if you use laba alone in asthma then that patient's beta 2 receptors will come down next time when he gets an attack nothing will work but you have to use it with steroid but unlike that in copd you can use laba or lama alone allowed not allowed in asthma that's a second major difference that they ask in our exam so these are the drugs now you don't have to remember the whole thing just remember the backbone of treatment in copd is anti muscarinic agent the backbone of treatment in asthma is inhaled steroid just a broad concept if you remember that should be good enough what they have asked over is ki when will you do lung volume reduction surgery uh, this is important now the lungs are so hyperinflated that the normal alveoli are not getting chance to you know deflate and expand because the the defect the, the defective alveoli are expanded and they are they're not allowing normal lung to function so we can resect part of the lung but this only works if the patient has upper lobe emphysema if lower lobe has also got significant disease this will not work if patient has pure upper lobe significant upper lobe minimal or non existing lower lobe disease then you can consider it otherwise you can't use lung volume reduction surgery they have also asked about long term oxygen therapy whom it will give this showing mortality benefit that means is very good but when will you use it if the po2 saturation is 5588 these numbers are important 5588 okay and one exam you know they gave saturation 90% and they asked will you use long term oxygen therapy the answer is no Okay, so be careful. Fifty-five eighty-eight number should be fulfilled. Below this, you can use long-term oxygen therapy. This low flow, low dose oxygen that we give in these patients. Okay, low flow oxygen that we give in these patients. Finally, if you look at bronchiectasis, this is ectasia. Ectasia means you're talking about dilated airway. Bronchi is dilated, and you get something called signet ring appearance, where the dilated airway with with the blood vessel that is there. This blood vessel is acting like the the diamond. and this is what is called a signet signet ring appearance so you can see the dilated um, you know airways so the causes of bronchiectasis sometimes are asked in the exam the most common cause in india is tb in the world is cystic fibrosis but what they ask are the rare conditions like cartagenous syndrome you get bronchiectasis sinusitis situs inversus and immotile spasms now trap in the mcq they'll instead of giving you immotile spasms you know they'll give you azospermia azospermia is seen in young syndrome not in primary ciliary dyskinesia not in cartagena syndrome william campbell is the 4 to 6 division in cartilage is defective yellow nail syndrome is lymphatic problem so you see lymphedema yellow nails chylus effusion and uh, tracheobronchomegaly if you see that is munier cohn what is this young syndrome is telling you is bronchiectasis plus azospermia plus pancreatitis that is young syndrome 
ओके द यंग सिंड्रोम इस बार ब्रॉन्कियाटिस प्लस पैनक्रेटाइटिस प्लस एजोस्परमिया so all these are some rare conditions that are that are there that can also cause the patient to have bronchiectasis now bronchiectasis is basically the ciliary function is gone so sputum will accumulate lot of sputum and that is the main problem copious sputum sometimes they have uh, hemoptysis sometimes they have complications of bronchiectasis so examination you will see crepitations and clubbing investigation is sometimes patient comes with lot of sputum and infection so you have to get a gram stain look at the ct pulmonary function test main treatment in patient coming to hospital is antibiotics but the main way how you can prevent the progression of the disease is to make the airways dry now how can you make the airways dry we use mucolytics and we use lot of physiotherapy flutter valves vibrators to dry the airway the airway becomes dry the mucus that is there that acts like a culture media that is not there once the culture media is not there infections will stop that's the whole goal so that's the thing that they they'll ask you and one major question they'll ask in the exam is ki does bronchiectasis is it pre malignant does it go to cancer the answer is no okay so be careful bronchiectasis is not a pre malignant bronchitis is smoking related cancer can occur bronchiectasis no cancer remember that that's an mcq that they ask in our exam okay infertility is not part of triad yes it is not it is not so idiopathic this interstitial lung disease we are talking about in the interstitial lung disease you have all these interstitial lung diseases the most important one is ipf that you should know um and cop these two i think are important rest don't worry only thing they have asked about this uh, rbild and dip is is linked with smoking sometimes they ask in the exam what is the interstitial lung disease linked with smoking people answer copd okay be careful interstitial lung disease linked with smoking the answer is these two okay rbild and discomitive interstitial pneumonia now idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is some old person in the question 75 year old person in the mcq typically and progressive dyspnea with dry cough that's how they'll describe okay some old person is coming with dry cough and progressive breathlessness it should be basal lower lung involved you get a very classical crepitation called velcro crepitations and we get clubbing in this condition obviously it will come with a obstructive pattern pulmonary function test and the ct will show honeycombing ground glass appearance generally is not seen very if it's seen it's transient hallmark finding is honeycombing appearance usually in the subpleural area okay lower lobes and subpleural area management of bronchiectasis is simply antibiotics and dry the airway okay that's the management of bronchiectasis okay all the conditions that are connective tissue diseases will come with nsip all connective tissue disease come with nsip exception is rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis is one that will come with ipf all the others are going to come with nsip okay scleroderma patients nsip sle is nsip most of the others are nsip remember rheumatoid is an exception comes more with uip pattern that is ipf okay you are right somebody is putting correctly the patho over here will show ipf uip pattern okay what the patho will be it will show usual interstitial pneumonitis now one of the repeat questions that are asking recently is ki what you should not do in ipf don't do lung biopsy we don't need lung biopsy now in the diagnosis ct is enough so what do you do in the ct the hr ct will show basilar subpleural area affected honeycombing traction bronchiectasis because fibrous tissue will pull the airway apart these are the features what do you do in the treatment give oxygen perfinidone nintedanib is the main thing gur treatment has not shown that much benefit in the recent studies and ultimately this is the second most common cause for lung transplant most common cause for lung transplant is copd remember the second most common cause reason for lung transplant in the world so the new main thing is perfinidone and nintedanib so to summarize once again what they ask in ipf some you know they'll tell all are true about ipf they'll tell you upper lobe involved wrong it mainly involves the lower lobe and last to involve upper lobe cryptogenic organizing pneumonia looks like a typical pneumonia only difference is it can be caused by connective tissue diseases myositis also can cause it it comes with a subacute unlike ipf which is chronic slow presentation in insidious onset is subacute this patient comes like a acute subacute pneumonia the difference is they'll have a dry cough instead of having so much sputum so the patho i mean the the diagnosis comes in x ray it look like a consolidation with air bronchograms ct also will be showing it but what you see is some in contrast ct you will see something called the reverse halo sign or atoll sign 
this reverse halo sign or atoll sign is highly suggestive of COP. This condition does not respond to antibiotics, not a pneumonia, infective pneumonia, it's, it's autoimmune problem, it's steroids are going to work over here. Okay, so the treatment in COP is steroid is one of the conditions that will improve among the interstitial lung disease. Okay, it will improve by using steroids. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, it comes with asthma, central bronchiectasis, eosinophilia and raised IG. Now you don't have to remember the whole thing, just remember A, B, C and that is asthma, central bronchiectasis, D is the derma problem that is cutaneous reactivity to aspergillin and E is eosinophilia Ig. Now you don't have to remember all these criteria, what they'll give you is this kind of an image, this shows bronchiectasis in the central perihilar area. So central bronchiectasis with eosinophilia, that's a major clue for you to tell that this is nothing but ABPA. The treatment of ABPA is steroids and itraconazole. Okay, steroids and itraconazole. Okay, can bronchiectasis occur by middle lobe syndrome? Yes, it can. Okay, particularly lymph nodes or TB involvement, yes. That can cause middle lobe syndrome. That can also cause bronchiectasis. So when you look at hypersensitivity pneumonitis, when you look at hypersensitivity pneumonitis, this is a type 3, type 4 hypersensitivity, but in that also I remember uh, they had asked in one of the exams, you should be cautious here. If it's a acute hypersensitivity, it is type 3. If it's a chronic hypersensitivity, it's type 4. Okay, people just remember 3, 4 and they get confused. Sir, 3 answer kare or 4? Carefully see in the question. If it's acute, 3. If it's chronic granuloma occurs, it is type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. It is exposure to organic dust that causes this problem generally commonly seen in farmers. So what happens is the patient develops dyspnea, cyanosis on exposure within a few hours, within a few hours, okay, around four to eight hours of exposure, they start developing all these features. And they are recurring problems. Chest X-ray will show ground glass appearance. This is a major clue in our exam. The CT is the main thing. CT is going to show what is known as mosaic pattern. Okay, this mosaic pattern is also called as the head cheese appearance. This ground glass appearance only, but it's patchy, patchy, patchy ground glass. Okay, that kind of pattern if you're getting in the CT, mosaic pattern ground glass, that is highly suggestive of possibility of uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So what do you want to do in the, I mean, one of the things also they'll give you is bronchial lavage. You'll see lymphocytes and the lymphocytes are CD8 more than CD4 in the BAL. Remember if it's CD4 more than CD8, think about possibility of sarcoid. The CD8 lymphocytes are more than CD4. So what do you want to do in the treatment? Avoid the allergic source. That's the only thing. Avoid the allergy. You can also consider giving steroids if you cannot avoid the allergic source. Okay, tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is going to have migratory, um, um, you know, involvement in the thing, miliary uh, involvement in the in the chest X-ray. The ground glass pattern that you're seeing with mosaic pattern is one major clue for you to tell that this is going towards hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Plus, obviously, the blood eosinophilia and bronchial lava showing eosinophils, those are also clues to tell you that you're dealing with a eosinophilic problem. But here, the the BAL will show marked lymphocytes. And one of the questions they'll ask you in the exam in the lab is that these patients will have no eosinophilia. Okay, hypersensitivity pneumonitis will not have eosinophilia. Plural diseases, sometimes they'll ask you transudate, exudate, how to differentiate and they'll ask you LIGHTS criteria includes all except the answer typically is glucose. Okay, you have plural fluid protein to serum more than 50%, LDH ratio more than 60% and the LDH is more than two-third of upper limit. Main thing is glucose is not there in this list. Okay, protein is there, LDH is there, glucose is not there, be careful of that. Finally, if you look at ARDS, the PF ratio, which is called PO2 to FiO2 ratio, should be less than 300. Okay, it is less than 300. It should be bilateral disease. It should be acute onset within one week. And it should have pulmonary edema not due to cardiac cause. Means you should try to somehow rule out cardiac. If those four things are fulfilled, this is ARDS. This is known as Berlin's criteria. Okay, it is what we refer to as the Berlin's criteria for diagnosing ARDS. Okay, remember the PF ratio should be less than 300. Should be bilateral acute onset and the edema is not due to cardiac. Mainly ARDS what they ask in our exam is about the treatment. All ARDS patients except for the COVID ones 
generally are on invasive ventilation. So the ventilator support is a must. And when you put the patient on ventilator, we generally go for volume cycle in most of our patients. We fix the volume, tidal volume between 4 to 8 milli, 4 to ml, 8 ml per kg, of which generally most patients we start at 6 ml per kg. We give a positive and expiratory pressure in progressive increasing until saturation is maintained. But as you increase P, plateau pressure will keep increasing. Make sure the plateau pressure does not cross 30. If the plateau pressure crosses 30, it will cause trauma to the normal alveoli. Okay, so plateau pressure should be kept below 30 centimeter of water. Neuromuscular blockade early we use yes, but earlier you know we used to use continuous neuromuscular blockade. Now we are seeing intermittent intermittent neuromuscular blockade is generally superior, better. Okay, we use neuromuscular blockade, but it should be used intermittently. Prone position ventilation, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation also used. But what you should not use is an MCQ. Don't give surfactant. Don't use steroid except for COVID ARDS. Don't use high frequency oscillatory ventilation and don't use nitric oxide. None of these have shown benefit in studies. Okay, don't use surfactant. Don't use steroids except for COVID ARDS. Don't use high frequency oscillatory ventilation and don't use nitric oxide. Okay, all the questions they'll ask in the exam are on these four choices only, four points only. All are all are true about ARDS except one choice will tell about one of these. That's what you need to remove. When look at primary pulmonary hypertension, I think this can come in the exam because the guideline has changed now. Earlier pulmonary hypertension used to be defined as more than 25. Now they are saying it is more than 20. Okay, so this is important. It's not 25 anymore, it is 20. The clinical presentation is going to be of a young female, that is the primary pulmonary hypertension we're talking about, pulmonary arterial hypertension. There'll come young female usually, that is 30s, 40s, coming with progressive dyspnea, chest pain, syncope can occur. Right heart failure features can occur. So all these are right heart failure features, raised JVP, RV heave and all that. And what these patients are having is pulmonary arterial pressure increasing because the blood vessels in the lung are getting affected. Lung is otherwise normal. L left heart is totally normal. Heart is totally normal. It's the pulmonary vasculature that is getting the disease over here. So in these patients, you will see the chest X-ray will be normal because the lung, lung is okay. The only problem you'll see in the x-ray is the pruning of the vessel. It means pulmonary artery will be large, but the rest of the vessels you can't see. So whenever you're suspecting a patient with pulmonary hypertension, your first job is to rule out cardiac cause. You should rule out lung cause. So HRCT, lung, parenchyma, normal. Cardiac is normal. Now you're left with only this patient has got pulmonary hypertension, not due to cardiac cause, not due to lung cause. This is vascular pathology in the lung. To confirm that we take the patient to the cath lab and check the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure this left atrial pressure if left atrial pressure is normal then this confirmed for us that this is primary pulmonary hypertension or primary arterial pulmonary arterial hypertension so this primary pulmonary hypertension once you confirmed then the next step is vasoreactive test if the vasoreactive test is positive the treatment is calcium channel blocker if it's negative we give nitric oxide and see is there any improvement or not if there is improvement CCV, no improvement, then this is considered non-reactive. Non-reactive, we use initially oral combinations. Now, what are the oral combinations we use? Endothelin receptor blockers and phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. So usually what we use is uh, bosantin or mesitantin with tadalafil. That's the first combination that we use. And they have asked this in the exam. If a patient vasoreactive test was negative, pulmonary hypertension, what will you do? Initial, generally oral combination we try. If it's high risk or this is not working, then you have to give IV drugs. And IV, we use prostacycline analogs. Okay, so the various drugs that are there are all this. This is all the various drugs in pulmonary arterial hypertension. You have drugs acting on endothelin pathway, bosantin, mesitantin, prostacycline pathway are all these. Problem with these prostacyclines is IV. And nitric oxide pathway, you have oral drugs, tadalafil, sildenafil. Riosigot is potential MCQ, the soluble GC stimulator. Okay, guanylate cyclate stimulator. So all these drugs are there, but what they've already asked in the exam, patient came, pulmonary hypertension confirmed, primary arterial pulmonary hypertension confirmed, vasoreactive test negative, what's the first thing you want to do? And that answer was oral combination, because most of the patients we start with this. If this is not working, then we go for combination. Or patient is already high risk or significant disease there, we go for combination plus process cycle and log. So these are all the things they'll ask you as far as the primary pulmonary hypertension is concerned. Sarcoid is um, not a connective tissue disease. Be careful of that. The main ways how it will present is Lofgren's and hair foods. What is Lofgren is? Typically, it's a female, hilar lymphadopathy, 
they'll have erythematous nodular lesions in the lower limb they'll have fewer and arthritis usually arthritis in the ankle or sometimes in the knee the question they asked in our exam was they said it's a female comes with fever and arthritis erythematous lesion lower limb what's the next investigation you want to do the answer they expected was chest x-ray because chest x-ray if it shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy your diagnosis done this is sarcoid okay patient has these three things what's the next investigation the answer is chest x-ray so another major important thing lovgren's is something that may resolve on its own just supportive care no need to give steroids okay lovgren's is generally mild disease we don't use steroids okay chest x-ray cxr is chest x-ray so lung involvement is quite common in patients with sarcoid and i'll tell you the stages over there they ask here for this is basically uveo parotitis with plus or minus 7th nerve palsy hepatomegaly splenomegaly so organomegaly lymphadenopathy can occur in these patients and most of the places biopsy will show non casating granulomas okay non casating well defined granulomas you'll see in sarcoid cardiac problems heart blocks and arrhythmias are more common than cardiomyopathy but cardiomyopathy can occur arrhythmias and heart blocks heart blocks are actually very very common in these patients skin problems we saw erythema and odosum but one thing you know they given they give you lupus perneo many people fall for the trap and answer sle lupus perneo be careful is sarcoid okay lupus perneo is not sle it is sarcoid dermatitis can occur so these are some of the skin problems now the lung is important now be careful this is not like a progressive like it stage 1 will convert to stage 2 no patients fit into one of these if it is only hilar lymph node 1 lymphadenopathy plus lung interstitial disease 2 only interstitial disease no lymph node hilar lymph node that is 3 and any kind of fibrosis with lung collapse and all that that is going towards stage 4 so this is how we classify important point to remember is for stage 1 no need to use steroids for stage 2 plus or minus to use steroids stage 3 4 surely you should use steroids okay most important thing stage 1 remember lofgren's stage 1 only hilar lymphadenopathy no need no need to use steroids what are the other things you can get in this patients renal stones can occur why renal stones can occur is i already told you sarcoid granuloma contains 1 alpha hydroxylase that increases vitamin d that will cause high calcium and that high calcium will spill out in the urine that's the reason why renal stones can occur neuro problems can occur in this patients psychiatric problems thalamic pain aseptic meningitis sometimes can occur these are all neuro problems that can occur in sarcoid so what's the treatment treatment is steroids methotrexate azathioprine anti tnf drugs okay all these are the various drugs but as i told you main main problem is that in stage 1 where you just have hilar lymphadenopathy don't use steroids erythema nodosum is painful just give and nsaids it will resolve so few points in gi i think uh, hepatitis b is hot in our exam uh, hepatitis b and c they keep asking remember hepatitis b is a dna virus and uh, the two modes of how it can come vertical from the mother or it can be horizontal transsexual needle stick uh, iv drug abuse and all that whenever it comes from the mother the immune system of the baby will not recognize it so it will generally become chronic so chronicity is the rule almost 90% chance chronicity but whenever it comes horizontal in an adult it came through transsexual or see most common route of spread horizontal is transsexual when it comes in that then almost most of them will get one episode of hepatitis and they'll recover that is 95% recovery is there only 5% will become chronic okay that means the immune system is quite adept at clearing the virus in an adult problem is vertical transfer becomes chronic so in acute hepatitis b which is what we get in most uh, adult patients okay this is acute hepatitis b the first marker you will see is surface antigen the first antibody is igm anti hbcg remember this antibody is not protective the protective antibody is only this antibody against surface antigen don't forget more than 90% will recover this antibody is reassuring for us whenever it comes the patient is going to recover sometimes in between surface antigen and antibody against surface antigen both will be absent and the only this called window period is also called core window period and the only antibody you will see here is igm anti hbcg now this zone at this point the patient can still be potentially infective okay this is still potentially infective person this is called core window period 
Now, they sometimes give you this kind of serology and ask you, like if you see antibody against surface antigen, what happens? Only that is there in the patient. What is that? that that's vaccinated. All of us, I'm sure, have got vaccines. This is what we'll have in our blood, antibody against surface antigen. Remember, any time you see antibody against surface antigen, that patient is recovered or protected. That's the major thing. They'll not get the infection. If surface antigen is there with IgM, this acute hepatitis B, remember the idea that without surface antigen, do not answer hepatitis B. Whenever surface antigen is there in the blood, virus is there inside the liver. So surface antigen with IgM acute. If the patient has surface antigen with IgG, that is chronic. The point that means is surface antigen will always be there in acute or chronic. When the virus is there inside, surface antigen will come out. If it's coming with IgM, it's acute. If it's coming with IgG, it's chronic. If the patient has antibody against surface antigen, I told you, time to rejoice. This patient has cleared the virus. With IgG, he's recovered. This patient is recovered. If the patient has no ant surface antigen, no antibody surface antigen, IgM is present. I told you this core window, period. If patient has no surface antigen, no antibody against surface antigen, IgG anti HBCAG is positive. IgG anti HBCAG was positive. In one exam, they asked this. Now, I told you, unless surface antigen is there, you can't say infection. Because once the infection is there, surface antigen comes out in the blood. There's no surface antigen, no antibody against surface antigen. Actually, this is a patient who's recovered. Now, after recovery, what happens? Patient had an infection some many years back, 10, 15 years back. Once he recovers, you know, two antibodies will be there in the blood. One is antibody against surface antigen. And the other is the IgG anti HBCAG. Okay, IgG anti HBCAG. And antibody against surface antigen. This is what you see in people who have recovered from hepatitis B. Okay, antibody against surface antigen and anti IgG anti HBCAG. After many years, you know, the titers of these will come down. Sometimes the antibody against surface antigen titers go below detection level. There's the only antibody you'll see in the blood indicating patient doesn't have the virus. He's recovered. Very old infection. That's what it means. So they do give the serology um, and you should know how to interpret it. Okay, you should know how to interpret this serology. Now the treatment is, remember that Harrison says that no study has shown combination treatment as beneficial in hepatitis B. It's always monotherapy. Whenever hepatitis B treatment is asked, and if you see any choice saying you in combination, kick it out. It's always monotherapy for hepatitis B. Hep C, C for combination. Hepatitis C is always combination. B is always monotherapy. Okay, some question asked, surface antigen is present and HB antigen is present. How to interpret? Remember, whenever you see surface antigen, means virus is there inside. If it comes with IgM or IgE, anti HBCAG, confirm now virus is there inside. Let's say this is acute hepatitis. You are now telling HBE antigen is present. E antigen only indicates patient has got a highly replicative phase. Means the viral load is very high. So it is still acute hepatitis B. It's a still acute hepatitis B, but because E antigen is positive, this patient has got high viral load. Okay, this is a replicative phase. If you see IgG instead of that, then you're going to change now. You're going to say this chronic hepatitis B with replicative phase because again E antigen is positive, viral load is very high. So that's the only thing, E antigen simply indicates infectivity as well as viral load. Okay, higher the E antigen positivity, higher chance of spreadability because viral number is higher. Treatment wise, you can use either pegylated interferon alpha or nucleoside analog. Among the nucleoside analog, the only thing you should remember is tenofovir alafenamide. The others we don't use nowadays. This is now become the drug of choice. Okay, tenofovir alafenamide. This is better than the routine tenofovir because it is a pro-drug that converts into tenofovir in the liver reducing all the systemic side effects we used to see earlier. In one exam, they said, if patient has HIV and hepatitis B, what will you use? The answer was emtricitabine. Although tenofovir and lamudine also work for both HIV and hepatitis B, that exam they had asked, emtricitabine. Okay, so you should know about this. Just because you got vaccinated doesn't mean you're protected. Sometimes, you know, before joining PG, we always recommend our PGs to get the antibody titers done once. If they check the antibody titer and the antibody titer is more than 10, then they don't have to worry about hepatitis B. Okay, if this antibody titer is more than 10 milli international units per ml, then we don't have to worry. But if the titer is less than 10, then we ask them to repeat the vaccination by a different company. If they take an um, Engrix, we ask them to get Recombivax. And not just one booster, but repeat the whole vaccine, uh, you know, the proper schedule again. If their titers are less than 10, these are what we call non-responders. Problem is, most of our PGs, you know, don't take our advice. They come after they get a needle stick injury. They didn't check the antibody before they got the needle stick injury. 
the patient is not traceable now we don't know he's got hepatitis b or what now you check the antibody now the titer more than 10 again hepatitis b not to be worried but if the titer is less than 10 then now you got exposed so vaccine will work later you have to give hepatitis b immunoglobulin and repeat the vaccine okay by a different company so in one exam they said okay patient got needle stick injury hepatitis antibody titers were more than 10 what to do the answer is nothing more don't have to worry about hepatitis b at least now how do you treat if the patient has e antigen positive then we generally use nucleoside analog we continue to use it until the patient develops antibody against hb antigen and after one year we stop the treatment but if the patient is hb antigen negative and the hb with dna copies are more than 2000 whenever the viral copies are more than 2000 per ml e antigen should become positive okay whenever viral load is high e antigen should be positive if the viral load is high and e antigen is negative it indicates a patient has got a precore mutant Precore mutant risk of cancer and cirrhosis is very high, so these patients end up on lifelong treatment. Okay, we don't stop the treatment for hepatitis B. We continue. Don't forget, our drugs only suppress the virus. They generally don't cure. The cure possibility is about three uh, percent. In that is documented over ten years. Sometimes patient has got around one to three percent chance of getting a cure, but most of them will not have a cure. You can just suppress the virus and prevent cirrhosis from occurring. Finally, hepatitis C is important because finally we've got a cure for this the problem is hepatitis c quietly converts from acute to chronic so there are a lot of cases we thought hepatitis c because of our amazing treatment now um, it will get completely eradicated but the problem is because it's detected only on investigation most of the time and the patient has very subtle manifestation they start developing cirrhosis and only then late we come to know they've got hepatitis c so now it's becoming important that for most things before surgery pregnancy we check anti-hcv antibodies HCV important thing they've asked in our exam is extra hepatic manifestation. And the question they'll ask, see all this is there. Ultimately, you know, I'm telling you laser guided. This is what they'll ask man. Know this and your job is done. So those who are staying up and listening to me, <laughs> this is laser guided, you know, this is what they're asking. They ask what will not occur? Psoriasis will not occur. Lichen planus is there. Porphyria catenata is there. Cryoglobulin is there. See so many skin problems, but no psoriasis. That was the question that they asked in our exam. No psoriasis in patients with hepatitis c so but lymphoma can occur thyroid disease can occur type 1 diabetes you know only relationship association is there we have not proven causation still all these blue things relationship is there association is there um the causation part of it is still not proven so they are all possibilities with hepatitis c so the treatment is the main thing they'll ask you now how much we used to struggle about the treatment for hepatitis c now everything has changed we have got direct acting agents now and that's transformed everything just three months all oral drugs relatively safe drugs well tolerated just three months we are going to declare a cure imagine we used to give 48 weeks treatment at one time just three months your job is done what do you use now protease inhibitors they all end with evir evir ns5b polymerase inhibitors they end with buvir buvir and ns5a inhibitors they all end with asvir Okay, Aswir, Aswir, Aswir. Okay, there's a spelling mistake. There's Aswir. So all these ending with Aswir is NSY inhibitors. Now you might wonder, yaar, who will remember all this? I'm already getting vomiting sensation. You don't have to. You know what they did in our exam? They said which of the following combination is used in the treatment. And they gave two, two drugs from same class. Imagine if they give semiprevir and peritoprevir. You just need to have proper English. Means you saw two drugs ending with EVIR. Kick the choice out don't use from same same combination same thing you're using two drugs not allowed but what is the best combination if you ask me the answer is sophis beaver plus well patasver this is the best combination oral drugs within 12 weeks you get a cure a job is done this is the best combination. It works for all the, uh, you know, genotypes. This is the best. Sophisbeer will pass well. The problem with Sophisbeer is you can't use it in renal disease. If patient has renal disease, then make sure you don't use Sophisbeer. Then your answer becomes Elbasver. Elbasver and Grezoprever. Okay, this is in patients who have got increased creatinine in the question. Anytime they say increased creatinine, Elbasver, Grezoprever. Soft Elbox treatment is nothing but Sophius Bever, Velpatasver, Voxilaprever. One one drug from each class we're using. We use this in resistant cases. 
okay this is called soft well wax treatment soft well wax treatment this is used that is one one from each class we are taking surface wear well potassium wear voxel prever soft well wax treatment that is in resistant cases so those are all the questions they'll ask you for hepsi that's it hepsi your job is done nothing more that you need to know alcoholic hepatitis c alcohol can cause fatty liver non alcoholic fatty liver also can occur alcoholic acute alcoholic hepatitis is excess intake of alcohol over many years but last two months patient has taken too much and alcohol is a toxin taken acutely body can't adapt so the patient comes with jaundice fever anorexia tender hepatomegaly he comes looking very sick the liver enzymes will be high but they'll never be more than 400 okay 300 is there but rarely it can go up to 400 never above 400 the important point is ast lt ratio should be more than 1.5 Okay, it should be more than one point five AST to LT ratio. AST should be more than ALT, and none of them should be more than four hundred. So be careful of that. Once you have that, and you have an alcohol acute alcoholic history in the patient, means patient has taken excessive alcohol, then the treatment in that patient is you calculate the discriminant function. Discriminant function formula is important. I asked in the exam. This is four point six into difference in PT, that is prothrombin time minus control PT plus total bilirubin. Okay, four point six into patient's prothrombin time minus control PT, which I'll give in the M MCQ plus total bilirubin. If the number totals to more than thirty-two, discriminant function more than thirty-two, that patient should be started on steroids. Okay, that patient should be started on steroids. Earlier we used to use something called MELD. Okay, MELD uses bilirubin, INR, serum creatinine. to this now they added sodium okay but this is what was meld score to this they added sodium also now but instead of this now we go for the madres discriminant function this is supposed to be better and apart from that we also use something called lily score now the other scores and all they don't have they have not asked in the exams so you don't have to worry but this definitely is important this formula is important remember it for the exam now non alcoholic fatty liver disease increasing these obese people diabetic people who are developing fatty liver and in people who have got fatty liver non alcoholic people who are developing this fatty liver what do you want to do the treatment in this patients is weight loss the most important treatment is weight loss remember now semaglutide is hot in charcha because this drug is is really showing amazing benefit in reducing weight so much so that people who are non diabetic also are considering using semaglutide some of these hollywood actors started using semaglutide and they have lost weight lost weight so this drug is really amazing semaglutide is showing very good weight loss now there are other studies showing pyglitazone as one of the drugs sariglitazar pyglitazone these also can be used but uh, what was what was thing is uh, metformin metformin large study was a flop show did not show any benefit but most important thing that you need to do in these patients is weight loss okay weight loss fatty liver comes down and it kind of reverses i think semaglutide might come in the exam remember it's an oral drug now oral semaglutide is also available injections also available it is showing weight loss fda approved its treatment in patients for weight loss alone so in diabetes this becoming now very important drug okay semaglutide so finally you have hemochromatosis Okay, please please add the heading whenever you see the PDF hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis, um, the patient will come with um, excess iron deposition in the liver and various places. The patient will have liver dysfunction, fatigue will occur, pigmentation. This is because of melanin as well as iron. This called slate grey color called brown skin. Diabetes can occur. Arthralgia, arthritis can occur, particularly metacarpophalangeal joints, second and third. Remember, osteoarthritis does not involve the metacarpophalangeal joints, but you see osteoarthritic changes, that is, osteophyte formation in this area. This is pathognomonic of hemochromatosis. Okay, in these metacarpophalangeal joints, if you see osteophytes, this is highly suggestive of hemochromatosis. Hypogonadism can occur, but remember, the gonads are not affected. It is secondary hypogonadism. Pituitary is getting affected. cardiomyopathy thyroid disease and all infections all this can occur now what they last in the exam i'll tell you is what's the screening investigation that's the main question they asked in the exam hemochromatosis the screening investigation initial investigation is transferrin saturation after that you consider ferritin in the option okay transferrin saturation should be more than 
ferritin should be increased then only we think about possibility of hemochromatosis okay then we look at the other investigation one of the new things coming up is mr mri is now um, kind of replacing biopsy to do how much iron is there in the liver mri is also able to quantitate for us how much iron is there in the heart and in the liver so mr is becoming a new thing again in the investigation for hemochromatosis what the treatment is don't answer chelators phlebotomy is good enough here if you do phlebotomy the side effect of chelation is avoided thalassemia you can't do phlebotomy because it's an anemia you have to give iron chelators in thalassemia here phlebotomy you can use not only that this blood is transfusable not like polycythemia vera which is premalignant that blood has to be discarded this can be transfused to other people so phlebotomy you do until you get the ferritin down definite benefit you will see in cirrhosis testicular atrophy sorry um, definite benefit you see in most of the conditions where fibrosis obviously reversal will not occur testicular atrophy reversal will not occur arthropathy may not reverse but rest of the things fatigue everything else will come down wilson's disease is um, copper metabolism problem autosomal recessive atp 7b defect it is the excretion of copper from the liver is defective that's a problem usually it comes with three major areas affected liver neuro problems and joints and blood obviously young people more hepatic problem older people come more with neuropsychiatric problem in the neuro you will see basal ganglia so they'll come with what is called uh, mm, this is wing beating tremor okay it is called wing beating tremor so a classical wing beating tremor frontal lobe they get personality problems brain stem can be involved these are common areas in the neuro that are affected so all these are neuro problems you can see in these patients parkinsonism features can occur basal ganglia obviously in the eye remember whenever you have neuro involvement case of fracturing will be seen more than 80% of them will have but if no neuro only liver that is young people don't expect everybody to have case of fracture only 30 to 40 50% will have so the case of fracture ring may not form a full ring it will affect the upper and lower pole first the rest of the ring this areas might be affected much later the full ring may form much later so decimates membrane you will see copper deposition type 2 renal tubular acidosis is very common in this condition bone involvement can occur blood you get a coombs negative hemolytic anemia copper itself is toxic to the rbcs now what do you do in the investigation obviously you check for case of fracture ring the serum copper the serum ceruloplasmin are all important but the most important investigation i would say is urine copper the urine copper if it's more than 100 micrograms in a 24 hour urine that is the main main way how you diagnose if you suspecting wilson's and the urine copper is less than 100 then you give penicillamine challenge test normally penicillamine increases excretion of copper in the urine after giving penicillamine if it crosses 100 then also your answer is wilson's last investigation you want to consider is liver biopsy okay dry weight of copper in the liver you can check but that's the last one you can you do biopsy yes you can is it the initial investigation never okay it is one of the confirmatory investigations if you have plus or minus other investigations main point to remember is ki serum copper will be low many people think you know copper high in the brain high everywhere how come serum it's low it's low because the binding protein is low what is the binding protein ceruloplasmin is low that's why serum copper is low be careful however free copper levels can be high main investigation of all is urine copper other than liver biopsy which is invasive urine copper is the preferred investigation in most patients more than 100 got your diagnosis 100 microgram in 24 hour urine that is less than 100 do penicillamine challenge test what's the treatment main drug is penicillamine tetrathymalibrate you will do in neuro problems triantin is used in patients who got decompensated liver disease zinc is mainly for maintenance it doesn't help much zinc prevents future future problems doesn't cure the current problems so main drug in general is penicillamine when you see ascites they'll ask you about sarg more than 1.1 less than 1.1 remember sarg does not differentiate transferred exudate it differentiates the cause for ascites sarg more than 1.1 is portal hypertension and all these ascites is occurring because of high hydrostatic pressure in the vessel that's how the water is coming out in the peritoneum in all these portal pressures are very high but if the sag is less than 1.1 this is not portal hypertension it's either low oncotic pressure because of low albumin okay the albumin in the serum is too too low that is how it is occurring or the peritoneal membrane is leaking imagine if the peritoneal membrane is damaged it leak not only water it will also leak protein out even albumin will come out 
So all this TB, peritoneal carcinoma, malignancy, pancreatic ascites, all these are going to come with SAG less than 1.1. Remember, the reason why ascite is occurring here is not portal hypertension. All conditions over here, they should have portal hypertension. High hydrostatic pressure, water comes out. So on simple way, that means is SAG more than 1.1, ascetic protein very low, cirrhosis. Protein high, it's right heart failure or butchiari. If SAG is less than 1.1, Nephrotic syndrome, ascetic protein is low, ascetic protein high, it's malignancy or TB. Few points about H. pylori. This is a gram-negative bacteria that is coming with um, the peptic ulcer disease. The CAGA strain is now becoming the dominant strain because rest of them antibiotics are cleared, is resistant. So more risk of uh, CAGA wherever is there, adenocarcinoma, mild lymphoma risk is higher. So all these things can occur. What's interesting is ITP. Okay, immune thrombocytopenic purpura is linked with H. pylori. Okay, whenever you see ITP patients, we always work up for H. pylori. Now, the way we investigate, you look at the question carefully. If the patient is older than 50 years and has got some dyspepsia and indigestion and thing, your major worry is cancer. Anything above 50, make sure you do endoscopy. Biopsy urus test is the investigation of choice, above 50 years. Below 50 years, they recommend no need to do endoscopy. Non-invasive investigation is enough either urea blood test or stool antigen. Serology is not that good. We use serology, some, some places we use serology first. Once the antibodies are positive, if the antibodies are negative, we don't work up for H. pylori, it's sensitive. The antibodies are positive, antibodies are positive, then we do either urea blood test or stool antigen, whichever the patient is comfortable, both are equally good. Let me repeat again. The patient does not have, young patient below 50 years, not much worried about cancer, Start with antibody. Antibody H. pylori is negative, not H. pylori. Antibody is positive, then go for either urea bread test or stool antigen. One of these two you do, confirm the diagnosis, start treatment. Above 50, you are not bothered about H. pylori, you are more worried about cancer. Endoscopy has to be done. Simultaneously take the biopsy and get the biopsy ureus test. Once you make the diagnosis, the treatment is a problem. The traditional treatment we used to use in our country for many years was PCMA. What is PCMA? Proton pump inhibitor, clarithromycin, metronidazole, amoxicillin. This proton pump inhibitor, clarithromycin, metronidazole amox is not working nowadays in most patients. Resistance is rampant now. For this reason now, most places have shifted for bismuth treatment. This bismuth quadruple regimen is PPI, bismuth, tetracycline, metro. Patients don't tolerate this treatment well. But unfortunately, we don't have much alternatives. Rifibutin based regimen, this is CMDT 2023 now. This year CMDT, these guidelines are. And we used to give for 7 days, now they are recommending 14 day treatment. This rifabutin treatment now is pantoprazole or omeprazole, whatever, rifabutin and amoxicillin combination. That is also one of the options. But both these are um, the current regimens. PCMA is gone now, more or less. What is PCMA? Proton pump inhibitor, clarithro, metronidazole, amox. This used to be main treatment, now we don't use it. Now mainly bismuth is the main regimen that we are using. However, the future is promising. There's a new drug coming up uh, called Vonoplazan, which is a PCAB inhibitor. This PCAB inhibitor, I think, is important. Um, it, it is still under studies, but I think that is going to be one of the futures in the management of patients with H. pylori. Okay, this is in place of PPI, we use PCAB inhibitors. Inflammatory bowel disease, um, basically ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. You know, ulcerative colitis mainly involves the rectum and it ascends up, it's a continuous inflammation, rectum and then it involves the colon. So continuous inflammation, mucosa, -mucos mucosa area only, pseudopolyps are there, ulceration can occur, whereas Crohn's is mouth to anus, skip lesions, rectum generally not involved, it's transmural because it involves the outer serosa, the entire wall is involved, so outer serosa is involved, that's how it spreads into the adjacent bowel, it also attaches to the peritoneum causing adhesions, fistulas, so fistulas, adhesions and all for that, the reason culprit is the serosa is getting involved because it is transmural. So fissures can occur, cobblestone pattern, creeping fat, all these are points more likely in favor of Crohn's. Because rectum is involved, these patients will have clinically, okay, rectum is commonly involved, these patients are clinically going to have something called tenesmus. They'll have feeling of passing stool. When they pass stool, they pass a lot of blood and mucus. Okay. This is generally not seen in patients with uh, Crohn's because Crohn's rectum is not involved. It generally involves ileocecal junction. 
for that reason they mainly come with abdominal pain and sometimes you can see in the right lower quadrant uh, some mass might be there or pain might be there so this mass right upper quadrant uh, lower quadrant pain all these are more likely to go to crohn's whereas rectal disease coming with tenesmus they feel like passing stool the rectum sensors are there and they pass blood and mucus after coming out of passing stool they feel still feel like passing stool again and that's how you'll see ulcerative colitis bloody diarrhea in general favors more ulcerative colitis than crohn's crohn's more likely to come with pain and mass remember anal involvement of perianal disease classical for crohn's many people think rectum is involved so anal canal also involved no anal canal is more likely to be crohn's what do you do in the treatment is what they'll ask you the rest of them are not important what do you do in the treatment in the treatment in the treatment i would say just follow the mild to moderate that's what they ask in our exam the severe they don't ask we use 5 asa in ulcerative colitis be careful many students they recognize the question as crohn's and they answer 5 minus salicylates for crohn's amino salicylates will not work unless large bowel is involved which is less likely mainly it involves alveolar junction so make sure when you are answering crohn's the first drug you use budesonide generally in our exam i have not seen a full thing they only ask the first the first drug what do you start with we start with budesonide that doesn't work sulfur salicylate then we use steroids and other higher drugs but for ulcerative colitis amino salicylates mesalamine osalamine works beautifully budesonide then you can use the other higher drugs so just the mild moderate is what they ask in our exam don't have to remember the whole thing it will confuse you okay just remember the mild moderate treatment another major question is extra intestinal manifestation now some of them are independent of bowel disease some are associated with bowel disease the ones that respond to underlying bowel treatment are all these the ones that are independent of underlying bowel disease for sure for sure are axial arthritis and to some extent after that is primary sclerosing cholangitis pyoderma gangliosidosis and uveitis is plus or minus okay pyoderma gangliosidosis and uveitis plus or minus axial arthritis independent of bowel disease means even if you take care of the bowel you do the bowel resection this axial arthritis will not go away another problem is psc primary sclerosing cholangitis pyoderma and uveitis plus or minus it may or may not parallel with underlying bowel disease okay but these no all these three you remove the bowel or you, you give treatment to the underlying bowel these will come down okay they are paralleling underlying bowel disease so all these are the extra intestinal manifestation so i think this is um, what i had in mind about covering the the major areas in what they asking in medicine obviously medicine you can't cover in just a few hours what i've done is just summarize for you just the main things like you know as i told you know laser guided just this is what they're asking man so good and it's amazing to see so many of you are um, still awake and um, watching so more than 500 people that's that's really nice so um this is it from my side my best wishes to all of you and i hope all of you um, push in last few days ultimately are the main and if you can really give a proper punch and um, you know last few days proper revision surely you can do uh, wonders in the exam so my best wishes to all of you and um, thank you all for staying up so late and uh, still listening to my lecture so good luck and all the best